Welcome, fellow Canadian International Council members and our many friends. I'm John Tennant, member of the Executive Committee of the Waterloo Branch of the Canadian International Council. We would like to begin by acknowledging that uh, in the Waterloo region, we are located on the Haldeman Track, traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe uh, Haudenosaunee peoples. This land is part of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples, which symbolizes the agreement to share, protect our resources, and not to engage in conflict. We must additionally acknowledge the recently announced discovery of residential school graves, a revelation which has significantly escalated public awareness and deepened concern over the many years of mistreatment, injustices, and inequalities suffered by our Indigenous people. This underlines the imperative to reflect deeply and sincerely and to commit to redoubling our personal and organizational resolve to achieve just, meaningful, prompt, and lasting reconciliation. I'm pleased to be able to welcome you to our special two-day virtual roundtable, addressing inequality in Canada and around the world. Income inequality, the concentration of wealth, technological change. We welcome participants and viewers from across Canada and internationally. The roundtable is a pivotal component of a two-year Canadian International Council project on income and wealth inequality. Inequality of income and wealth is a central consideration associated with a host of deep set, often systemic imbalances in the world, touching workers, the middle class, indigenous people, and those identified by race, color, gender, and disabilities. And of course, COVID-19 has further exposed and further emphasized many of these. An objective of the roundtable is to stimulate informed discussion among CIC members and others about the troubling inequities associated with income and wealth inequality. A further dimension of the project has been the selection of a CIC fellow whose insights, research, writing, and speaking will uh, further foster debate and the search for remedies. The CIC fellow, Dr. Elizabeth Vallée, is a panelist on uh, the second topic. The project is being generously supported by the Savis Chamberlain Family Foundation, about which you can learn more in the program materials. We are very honored to have Dr. Savis Chamberlain with us to share some introductory remarks. Sabas, please. Thank you very much, uh, John. I also like I wish I also wish to extend a warm welcome to all the conference participants of Canada and around the world. Let me quickly tell you how this project uh, started. John uh, Tennant, the organizer of this conference, about two and a half years ago he found out that I was interested in these subjects. We talked extensively on the phone and he later gave me a thorough conference proposal, which was finally approved uh, by the Canadian International Council. I shall keep my introductory remarks uh, brief, but quickly I shall tell you why we are interested in addressing these subjects, which are all interrelated. It is to all our advantage to be concerned. I shall not give you references since uh, John gave us an extensive bibliography which can be found on the CSC website. One may ask, why did our family foundation sponsor, sponsor this conference? We like to initiate debates in our society, hoping that such debates will influence the policies of our Canadian government and the policies of the governments of other developed countries. First, let us talk about inequality. Over the past 30 years, the income inequality in Canada and in the developed countries 
kept on getting wider. They are the privileged class, the working class, the middle class, all lost ground, all lost ground in having a share in the country's gross domestic product growth. As the GDP of the country grows, which is mainly through technological advancements, it reflects an improvement of our standard of living. Approximately pre-1980, all levels of our society benefited from such growth, even though the share was not completely equitable. However, unfortunately, in the last uh, 30 years, more than 90% of the GDP growth benefit went to the top 1% of the developed country societies. Wealth generation keeps on concentrating to the top 1% of our society. Income inequality not only persists, but the gap between the rich and the poor increases. We are all stakeholders in the country. The growth of the GDP involves infrastructure resources to which we all contributed for their establishment. Our speakers and panel will address and elaborate on these issues. Let us now talk briefly on technological developments. Technological developments and their economic benefits accrued to the top 1% of our societies. Why and how did this situation develop? one may ask. Well, it is related to the cost of computing, in my opinion. Since 1970, due to the rapid silicon semiconductor chip development, the cost of computing started decreasing exponentially and continues to decrease at a lower rate even today. That's Moore's law. In the early 1980s, the personal com computer was introduced. Since then, technological advancements in all areas continued to develop very quickly. Rapid and significant technological developments resulted, resulted in fields such as food production, medicine, energy, information technology, and multimedia. Let us now talk briefly on the relationship of these technological developments in our societies, and of course, income inequality. The technological adv advancements have been coming fast and our societies are no longer able to debate the benefits of each technological development. Governments used to take their lead from the society's debates, but not anymore. Now the governments of the developed, developed world are not able to provide constructive leadership so that the, bene the benefits of these technological developments are spread to all segments of our societies. This is my view. We need debates in all our societies to crystallize constructive strategies and influence their adoption by our governments. We hope such policies will accrue benefits for all segments of our societies. Now, let me, let me now talk about uh, this conference. Why do we need a conference like this? Well, the continued expansion of social media and multimedia enables the proliferation of conspiracies and fake news to have a louder voice in our society. We need ourselves now a louder voice to propagate the truth and voice our views for better and just societies. As we can see from evidence of 2008, of the 2008 financial crisis, Part of the investment risk, which was borne by the individual capital holders and financial organizations, they now manage to shift this investment risk to be borne by the governments, essentially at our expense. This enhances the increase of inequality. Now, let us uh, now briefly talk about COVID-19 and its effect on our societies. Nobody's safe until everybody's safe. We have the science and the vaccine. We need the political will now. It is an economic and health problem. 
families with low and moderate income and disadvantaged uh, uh, people suffer the most, not only economically, but also losing opportunities of, advance, of advance, advancement. The rich are coping better with the lockdowns. According to The Economist in April, 2021, the unemployment in the OECD countries averaged 6.9%. Much of the jobless is concentrated among, among the poor. It is estimated that disadvantaged people form more than 90% of this figure. Pandemics are bad for all, of, for all of our societies. However, something good came out of the COVID-19 pandemic, again, in my opinion. Our societies are now realizing that the poor and the so-called visible minorities are essential workers, are first line workers, they are key workers, called the key workers. We realize that we all need these workers to provide the production and distribution of food and provide health services for all of us. We need to take full advantage of this sentiment, cooperate internationally and propose programs for the underprivileged to help them in their in the areas of education, elementary, high school, accessible and affordable university education, affordable housing, helping in, in nutrition, easy access to affordable, affordable medical care, easy access to internet, and of, co of course, find ways to lift them economically. Finally, now let us talk about the expectations of this conference. This conference will address these issues during a period which the societies of the world are in turmoil, dealing with problems such as populism, conspiracies, fake news, climate change, xenophobia, and assaults on our democracies. I hope that with this uh, conference, we shall become louder in our ability to expose inequality uh, in our societies. Otherwise, by doing nothing, uh, the negative effects of increase in equality will gradually become more pronounced and will affect our quality of life and that of our children and grandchildren in the future. Now, before I, 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 uh, I finish, I'd like to acknowledge uh, some people. I wish to thank and acknowledge the hard work of John Tennant of the CIC Waterloo branch, who organized this uh, conference during such difficult period. I wish to also acknowledge the help of uh, John Appleyard and Nicolas Rouleau, who are on the board of CIC. And finally, Ben Roswell, the executive director of CIC. Lastly, please note that you can find this introduction, my introduction, these two pages on the conference website. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the uh, first session of the day. Uh, the recent trends in income inequality in Canada and the world. Uh, and this session consists of uh, two speakers and a panel. It'll run to about three o'clock. Um, the uh, speakers, uh, the first two speakers have been asked to uh, keep their remarks to about 20 minutes. So we have about 10 minutes in questions uh, at the end. Uh, please, if you have questions, uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the Q&A icon put your questions into the Q&A and I will read them uh, to, the, uh, to the speakers uh, when they're done speaking. And so let me kick it off with uh, our first speaker who is uh, Dr. Michael Veal, a professor of economics at McMaster University in, in Hamilton. And I refer you to the chat for a link to the, uh, to the speaker's bios and to the program. Michael. All right. So I'd like to uh, thank research assistants who helped me on this. Uh, Svez Devaro, Sarah Kamala Anaraki, Anthony Hong, Daniel Tinkshu, uh, Shirk, because they provided funding. That's the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, Citizens Canada for Data, and uh, also Brian Murphy, my long term collaborator who worked for Statistics Canada. Uh, all opinions are mine. And I would like to point out that I uh, we'll do most of my speaking about Canada, which is where I have most of my knowledge, but I will say some things about the world more broadly as well. Um, just as a starting point, I think it's important to think about the types of inequality you can think about. 
Uh, so one is, is that I'm going to be talking about income inequality. That's different than wealth inequality. Income is obviously the, the flow of uh, purchasing power that comes to you during a year, say. Uh, wealth is the stock. That's uh, the money you have in banks and, and financial assets and things like that and other types of assets. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about income. The next speaker is going to be talking about wealth. Uh, I will uh, also ask you to consider the following income distribution. So suppose instead of our income distribution, we had one in which about half the people received $70,000 per year and half received $30,000 per year. That's about the same average as Canada. It's actually a lot less unequal. And some people might like that better. Some people might not. The actual measurement of inequality in such cases is not actually all that simple, but it's a different income distribution. So you might think about it that way. But then what if all the high incomes went to men and all the low incomes went to women? We think about that distribution much differently, right? Or if it's instead of men and women, it's people of different races, uh, people of, of different backgrounds. And so the type of income distribution I'm gonna be talking about is more just based on income, the, uh, the people who are affluent versus the people who are less affluent. Uh, but underlying this, we should always, always remember that there's different ways to think about even the most fundamental question of inequality. Um, this is a picture of Kawhi Leonard, who is a basketball player. And he used to play for the Toronto Raptors and in fact, uh, got the Toronto Raptors a world championship. And then he was a free agent and he wanted to leave Toronto. And you would have found quite a lot of people in Toronto who wanted to pay him the $35 million a year. That was the, the most actually he could earn wherever he went. Um, $35 million a year is a really high salary. And in the end, he elected to go somewhere else to take his $35 million uh, and he plays for the Clippers now. But the point is, is that income distribution, people look at it different ways. And in certain sports channels, you could have found lots of people who were saying, I don't care about the income distribution. I just want Kawhi Leonard on my side. And they would have uh, gladly endorsed that kind of payment. And this is across society as a, whole, as a whole. And it's not just sports heroes. In fact, it's all sorts of people that we could imagine yes, that person contributes so much to society that we don't mind them getting more income. And so we should always think that when we think about the income distribution, uh, we also have to think about the talents that people have and that uh, people at the higher end of the income distribution uh, often have made extraordinary contributions to society. Here are the main points I'm gonna make though. Uh, first, I'm going to make the point that the, the rise in measured Canadian income inequality is a top end phenomenon. That is, it occurs just at the very top, almost nowhere else in the distribution. And it occurred during the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, but there is no evidence right now that it's continuing. It's not that it undid itself and got better to where it was back in the 1980s, uh, but in Canada, at least, there's not much evidence that it, it's continuing. On the other hand, as you will see, the evidence is kind of spotty one way or the other. Uh, it is a male phenomenon, uh, but it's somewhat less male than it used to be. Uh, there are important regional differences, and I think we'll talk a little bit about the cause. And when I get to world issues, it, there's differences across countries, but it's not clear whether world income inequality is falling or rising at the moment. Uh, but what is clear is the income inequality is large, as you all know. So why do I emphasize the top end, the top 1%? So here's a, uh, a graph that shows uh, what we call the income distribution by decile. So the top decile that I've marked there, that's the share of income that goes to the top 10% of earners. And so you can see back in 1982, that was about 22%. And you can see it's risen over, over the period. So now 23, 24, 25%. There's different ways uh, to look at that. All right, so just looking at the same graph, but let's look at the bottom just to fix ideas. You can see that the lowest decile, that's the lowest 10% of the population, gets 3% of income. And they had 1982, and that's more or less what they get now. And similarly, if you look at the lower nine deciles, that is the bottom nine, 90% of the population, you can see their share of income is more or less a constant. It's gone down a little, if, if you, but not very much. And, Anything that's happened has happened in the top decile, which you can see where they have got slightly more income, but not a lot more income. But there's that increase. And you can see when it occurred and sort of, I put a circle around in the, mostly in the nineties and the early two thousands, 
Although you could argue that it happened a little before then too. Now here are some actual numbers, and it's too many numbers, but I'll just go to the very right, and you can see, say, the bottom right corner, uh, that's before tax and capital gains. Uh, if you're in the top 1% in 2018, which is the last data we have for all of Canada from Citizens Canada, you made $503,000 on average. So that's that bottom right-hand corner, or that's 11.5% of all the income. So the top 1% were getting 11.5% of all income. So the top 1% really gets a lot. And then the rest of the chart is we go up different definitions. So we could, instead of uh, taking out capital gains, we could put capital gains back in, and that increases the number uh, somewhat. Or we can go after tax and transfer. That is, we take out the taxes that people pay, and that makes the number go down somewhat. But you see those numbers on the right um, for 2018. Now, right, I don't want to bother going through the earlier numbers, but the first thing, if you looked at them, you would notice is that the 2007 numbers are actually a little bigger than the 2018 numbers. So in fact, since 2007, income inequality at the top end between 2007, 2018 has pretty much stayed the same. In fact, perhaps gone down some. But then at the extreme left of this table, the 1993 numbers, they're a lot lower. So there was a big jump from 1993 to 2007. And since then, not so much. People sometimes like to put it in current context. So here's a few more numbers about right, what's going on right now. The top 1% uh, is pre-tax incomes. Uh, you could see $250,000 is the threshold. So that's what puts you into the top 1%. Uh, if you're at 250,000, you're just barely in the top 1%. And then as the average is around $500,000. And then you can also think about the top 0.1%. That's instead of the top one in 100, that's the top one in 1,000. And you can see the incomes are a lot higher. And the top 0.01%, that's the top one, one in 10,000. And you can see the incomes go up to an average of 5.7 million. And compare that to median income in Canada, which is about 36,000. That is half the people earn more than 36,000, half less, an average income of 50,000. So here's a longer term um, graph. And this one, because we are doing it longer term, we have to do it pre-tax and, and without transfers income because you just can't do this long period. And you can see that back in 1920, 1940, this graph is at the top income share of the top 1%. You can see it was really high. And then starting around the beginning of World War II, it started to decline and continued to decline until the late 70s. And then it's since the late 70s that it's gone up. And then you can see it sort of went up and then recent indications are that it's gone, gone down a bit. And here you can see that rise. That's the period we're mostly talking about. And again, here's the period where it was going down. 20, uh, after the peaks in the 20s and 30s. So you might ask, you know, that was a pretty big jump I showed you in that graph between the late 70s and early 2000s. Uh, did, did Canadians notice this? And yes, as we all know, we did notice it. So this is from uh, the Occupy protests in 2011, I guess. And these are just pictures of the Occupy protests across Canada. This is people camping out in Kingston, Ontario. These people camping out in Edmonton, on uh, Alberta. This is Victoria. And then we also, around that time, I guess it was 2010, there were protests in Toronto associated with the G20. You can see the emphasis on inequality there in that one sign. There's a police car being burnt in, in Toronto. This is Quebec in 2018, the G7 protests there. Again, some violence. So all those pictures just gave you a real quick idea that obviously Canadians did notice. And then one of the things we have to think about is, even though I personally, if you'd asked me at the time, I would have said uh, that those protests, particularly around um, the Occupy movement and, and the, the G20 didn't seem to be very effectual events to me. I didn't know that they'd have a lot of impact. Uh, and of course, it, they may not have been causal at all, but we noticed that since that period, at least in Canada, uh, income inequality has stayed about the same. It has plateaued, at least as far as our data can show. Although, as you'll notice, there's lots of bouncing around. And when series are bouncing around a lot, it's hard to know exactly what's going on with them. 
But I will tell you that I believe these top 1% results to be robust. In other words, if I do it all sorts of different ways that you could imagine, uh, adjusting for families, doing it instead of just for one year, doing it for five-year averages, uh, doing it all sorts of other ways, you're getting the same answer. During that period from roughly uh, 1980 to 2007, top 1% and top 0.1% and top 0.01% shares of income went a lot up where nothing else much happened in the rest of the income distribution. However, it has changed a little bit. You can see that now there's more uh, members of the top 1% who are women. Uh, the median age of the top 1% hasn't changed that much. It's a little bit higher, but not very much. Um, it is a regional phenomenon. So for example, there has been a lot more rise in the top 1% share in Calgary and in the greater Toronto area than there have been in other places in Canada. So in other words, uh, it varies, it matters where you are. And Ontario is one of the places where it has mattered a lot. So again, lots of numbers and lots of lines, but that brown line that's more or less horizontal, what that tells you is that median income in Canada during that period, 1980 to pretty much now, is, has stayed pretty constant, hasn't changed very much. In fact, if anything, it's probably down a little bit. So the average person, the median person, uh, not doing terribly great with the growth. And as was noted earlier, the growth has accrued to those in the top. Um, and, and their incomes have gone up a lot. So those are the various shares in there. And that's Ontario. But, you know, is this somehow a rule that it should happen everywhere? No, there's Newfoundland and Labrador. You can see uh, there you can only do the top 1%. You can't do the, the more refined groups. But the top 1% there, they, they did better. They got 50% more income going from 1980 to 2016 for this graph. Uh, but also the median income went a lot too. Median income went up as well, right? So obviously it had to do with the resource boom, but nonetheless, it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you have a, a rise in the top share that everybody else has to be left behind. Still, mostly for Canada, that's why the numbers look for Canada this way as a whole, median income increases uh, and it's not, I won't show you what the numbers, but it doesn't keep up with productivity increases. So productivity increases have been better uh, median income increases have not been so great. And there's variation across provinces. And I'll tell you in a bit about countries. Um, it does make it hard to specify a, a single cause. I won't say much about cause, but we'll talk a little bit. But, but there's variation. It's not the same everywhere. Um, there are some data shortcomings. Uh, of course, if people are avoiding taxes or using tax havens, then that, since the, these fundamental source of these data is tax information, that's an issue. Uh, one of the things that I've done is I've done some work with uh, Michael Wolfson and other authors on uh, Canadian controlled private corporations. And you find there that um, a lot more people are using Canadian uh, controlled private corporations at the top end of the income distribution. And perhaps that has consequences, if not actual tax avoidance consequences, at least has consequences for how we measure this because uh, I am using personal income tax uh, information. And I just want to caution everybody or, or tell everybody when I uh, develop these statistics using personal income tax uh, data, it's all aggregates. I never, I'm, I'm, there's a firewall that prevents me from seeing anybody's information or even in groups as small as a thousand. So I'm only seeing averages of, of people. So that information is kept very confidential and I've never seen it at any more detail than that. Um, anyway, so there, that's enough on that, I think. Um, I didn't talk about this last little wiggle on the, on the graph. Um, and I'm going to update these numbers in a minute. But just, just to focus, we're looking at what happened in 2015, 2016. So people in Canada would probably figure this out pretty quickly. In 2015, a liberal government was elected in Canada. And it said that it was going to raise taxes at the top end. And so in 2015, before that yet it occurred, but everyone knew it was going to happen, a lot of high income people, particularly using the vehicle of their private corporations, advanced their income and took income at that point before the high rates clicked in. And then the wiggle down is because that's after the high tax rates and people are holding back their income because people with their, their own private corporations do have some timing. And I think it's always important to remember that uh, uh, behavior affects both the data here and of and of course, uh, the tax revenues the government receives. 
other types of inequality besides income inequality. Well, I'm not going to talk about wealth inequality because uh, Jim Davies is, is a world expert on that, and he's about to speak. Um, uh, longevity. Uh, that's a really important one. I think it's worth taking a minute. The paper by uh, Kevin Milligan and Tammy Sherla. And they find that uh, men in higher incomes uh, live eight years longer than men with lower incomes. The difference is smaller for women. Uh, so that's an important type of inequality in Canada. But the difference has been stable over time. So it doesn't appear to be getting worse or getting better. Uh, but we should remember certain groups. So there's some numbers that point out how much higher uh, infant mortality is uh, among areas, say, with Inuit uh, concentration and areas with First Nations con uh, concentration. Much higher infant mortality, much shorter lifespans. Also, I was going to leave inequality of opportunity, but I think it's, it's important uh, to note. Uh, we may get into this discussion later. Uh, Canada actually has pretty good equality of opportunity by international standards when we try to measure it best as we can, more or less comparable to the Scandinavian countries. Uh, but uh, it is something that, of course, depends very much on the continued viability of the education system and the health system. Okay, I'm going to say a little bit about international. So this spaghetti is the top 1% income share graph that I've been talking about. In other words, the share of all income that goes to the top 1% that's done for our, uh, the other G7 uh, uh, countries, except not Germany, which I won't go into. We, we leave Germany out. Uh, and if you look at the extreme left, where it's only Japan, you can see that meant that back in 1885, the top 1% of Japanese received something like 20%, 21% of all income. And then you can see the graph goes over in, in this spaghetti fashion. So why did I show you all this? Well, let's break out a little bit. There's just Canada and this Canada graph is now updated. And you can see that right at the end, that little wiggle down and then there's sort of been a bounce back. But you can see, if you look at the last numbers from sort of 2005 over, you can see there's not much evidence of the top 1% share increasing in Canada. If anything, maybe it's decreased a bit. But there's still that big period from uh, the trough in there on this graph looks like about 1975 up to 2007, where there's this big increase. Here's the United States. So you can see the United States, it looks like it's kept increasing in the United States. So there's starting to be a, a, a divergence in the last 10 years it's, that's bigger than it used to be between Canada and the United States. Then I've thrown in the United Kingdom. You can see the United Kingdom looks more like us, more, it looks more like Canada. So those three countries. Canada, UK, US. Now here's France, Italy, and Japan. If you look at those numbers, the idea is you look at them uh, to see that actually looks pretty flat. So again, it's not some sort of immutable international law, even among developed economies, that somehow everybody should have this big increase in top end income. Other countries didn't have it. Some did, some didn't. Just to re repeat, there's Canada, United Kingdom, the US, and you can see how much it went up. All right. So I'm going to just tell you some related pieces without being, I'm pretty much out of time. I don't want to, uh, I want to hear lots of questions if we can. So the World Inequality Database is, is it estimates the top 1% share of the United States from 1980 to, to uh, it doesn't say here, but I think it's from 2018, uh, went from 11% to 20%. So in other words, the top 1% increased a lot, just as we just show you. Well, the bottom 50% share fell from 21% to 13%. So it's really clear in the United States, it looks like one group is really benefiting strongly uh, relative to the other. But in Europe, nothing like that happened, right? In Europe, the shares were pretty stable. Uh, they point out that the top 10% share, which is the best you can do in some of these data, is, is highest in the Mideast and in India, lowest in Europe and China, but there've been rapid increases in China, huge increases in India, huge increases in Russia. So the income distribution in those countries has been uh, getting more unequal. Uh, but if you just take it worldwide, there's a lot of things going on, a modest overall ri rise in the 1% share, that's still twice the income share of the bottom 50%. So that is worldwide, the top 1% earn twice as much as the bottom 50%. Uh, World, our world of data, different source, 
wouldn't find it quite so extreme and largely because it emphasizes in the drop in equality between countries. Uh, the Great Escape, a book by Angus Deaton talks a lot about this, about the increase in uh, equality that comes, from, for example, from uh, better technological advances that have made disease uh, less uh, tragic in, in developing economies. A, a quick number, in the last 60 years, the lifespan in Mali went from less than 30 years to about 60 years. So a 60 year average lifespan is still a lot less than ours in Canada, but a huge increase over what it was 60 years ago. Um, but difference in methods, but I think the important thing is that both groups agree that inequality is large across the world as we would all understand. Thanks very much for your time. Thanks, Michael. If you have any questions, please put them into the, uh, into the Q and A. We've got a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, maybe I'll start, Michael, I mean, you looked at in the Canadian context, it looks like income inequality has been pretty stable over a fairly long period of time. Uh, and yet during this time, there's been a lot of social change. The industrial landscape has changed. Uh, there's strong educational opportunities in this country, uh, fair amount of social mobility. Why has it been so stubborn, do you think? You mean, why doesn't it, haven't we, haven't we done better? Yeah. So uh, worldwide, uh, the argument is that some combination of cultural and technological change between the 80s and roughly 2000 led to this increase and Canada went along for the ride, uh, heavily influenced by the United States. Uh, that may have been demonstration. In other words, our institutions like our corporate boards copied corporate boards in the United States, for example, or it may have been the technology. Uh, it may also have been that people in Canada had opportunities to go to the United States because the United States in a sense was paying top talent so much more and that tended to bid up their salaries in Canada. All those things uh, could have happened. I think there's some evidence for all of them. Uh, what's happened though since 2010, as I showed you, is that it continues to, uh, income inequality and continues to increase in the United States, uh, but not so much in Canada. And that may have to do with the tax measures and some of the other measures that you're talking about. But maybe, I'm putting it very loosely, maybe the best we can do is kind of hold the line when income inequality is increasing rapidly in the United States. Maybe it's hard for our institutions to do much better than more or less keep it even. We have one question from a participant. Why is Germany left out of the chart of the G7 countries? Uh, the reason I left it out is that there are two data sources. Uh, and they say different things. And so I'm, I'm, I'm not, I didn't want to pick sides, but I, I believe the one that says it's getting more unequal. Thank you. Uh, I'll take one more. If we've got one more question, then we'll move on. Uh, no, I'm sorry, that's the same question. Michael, thank you very much. I'm sure there'll be more questions as we go on. So I hope you'll stay around with us for a bit. And, uh, so I'll move to our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. James Davies, Professor Emeritus of the Department of Ep Economics at Western University in London, Ontario. James, over to you. Um, yeah, so today I'm gonna to talk about recent trends in wealth inequality, both in Canada and the world. Um, and where this comes from is about 15 years ago, um, I started uh, doing research with, uh, mainly with uh, Tony Shorox, but with uh, other people. Um, Tony at that time was the director of the UN's World Institute for Development Economics Research in Helsinki, known as WIDER. And at that time, uh, a number of people had been uh, estimating the world distribution of income, most notably uh, perhaps uh, uh, um, Franco Milanovic at the World Bank. And, uh, but uh, Tony thought that uh, uh, probably there was enough data to uh, begin to estimate the world distribution of wealth. And uh, we did that as part of a, um, a project uh, called Personal Wealth from a Global Perspective. Uh, a book came out and we had a chapter in there and we had the first estimate of the world distribution of wealth and it was for the year 2000. An improved version of that came out in the Economic Journal in 2011. Um, then the uh, Credit Suisse Research Institute contacted us and um, a number of the large international banks uh, put out annual um, global wealth studies. 
but uh, the Credit Suisse Institute wanted to do something that was academically based and would include all the wealth of all the people, not just the investable assets, which is what the other banks were concentrating on. So to make a long story short, we have a, been putting out an annual report and a data book that is more in detail since uh, 2010. And uh, there's an article um, going into the methodology more in the review of income and wealth in 2017. Um, I'm not gonna talk about results from the last thing on this slide. I just wanted to mention that if people are interested in long run uh, trends in Canadian wealth distribution, uh, together with Livio DiMatteo, who's an economic historian at Lakehead, um, we have a recent article in the Review of Income and Wealth that uh, looks at the uh, oh, last 120 years of uh, evolution of uh, Canadian wealth distribution. Uh, so what we're doing in our global study is, is we're using the UN System of National Accounts definition of wealth, uh, which of course includes real assets, financial assets, and uh, minus debts. Um, it's important to note that this includes the value of employer-based pensions uh, but it doesn't uh, look at the value of social security, uh, what we, of course, in Canada, this we uh, CPP, QPP, uh, that's not included. And uh, so let me go ahead and uh, say a bit about our methods, uh, just so we know what's going on here. Um, uh, there are two bits. Uh, we have to estimate country wealth levels. Uh, there are official household balance sheets. Uh, for 50 countries, 61% of the world population is covered by them. We estimate 94% of world wealth. Uh, so there are a um, fair number of uh, countries that don't have this data. They are uh, tend to be smaller, poorer countries. China and India do have this data, although I should say uh, it's not strictly official household balance sheet in those data in those cases. Uh, it's been done by academic research teams using official data. Um, the second piece is uh, estimating the wealth distribution within countries. Um, there are 35 countries that have um, pretty reliable uh, household wealth surveys now. Um, there's a little bit less representation around the world. Um, with the missing countries, uh, we mainly uh, infer their wealth distribution from the income distribution. That doesn't mean that we assume the wealth distribution is the same as the income distribution. Uh, for the countries where there is data, we look at what the relationship is, for example, between the share of the top 1% of wealth and the share of one top 1% of income is a ratio there. And then um, we classify that by regions and then we apply it to the uh, countries whose uh, data is missing. Uh, an important aspect of this is that we make the upper tail in these household surveys consistent with the Forbes World Billionaires list, which is really important. For example, in Canada, I think the richest person that's ever been found in the Statistics Canada survey had it was something like 25 to $30 million. And uh, there are well over 100 uh, Canadian uh, individuals and families who have more wealth than that. Um, here is the uh, uh, world map of uh, wealth per adult in 2019. The darkest color, um, which shows up in uh, North America, Western Europe, Japan, Korea, Australia, and New Zealand is for countries that have more than $100,000 uh, per adult. And then you get to the uh, second uh, highest group, uh, 25,000 to 100,000. This includes, for example, uh, Brazil, Mexico, um, Saudi Arabia, uh, Turkey. Uh, and below that, with between five and 25,000, we have uh, countries like uh, um, Argentina, Colombia, uh, North African countries, South Africa, Botswana, Kenya, and so on, and India, very importantly. And finally, you have the uh, countries whose uh, wealth per adult is less than $5,000. Uh, there are a lot of uh, such countries in Africa. We, uh, we believe, uh, based on our estimates, although perhaps I should say that the wealth data is, uh, is not very good in uh, most countries in Africa. Okay, so um, I wanna look at trends. Uh, this table, uh, we've got four rich countries and three emerging market countries. And if you look at the June 2020 column, you can see Switzerland's the richest country with $620,000 uh, per adult. Then you get the USA, Canada, Japan, of course, a lot of other countries in between there. Um, but there's a big gap between those kind of numbers and then the numbers you see in Brazil and India. China has been rapidly increasing its uh, wealth per adult. That's at 74,000, was it 74,000 in 2019? We believe that within the next five years, we'll hit the $100,000 mark. 
the last column shows the average annual uh, percent increase in wealth from 2007, which was the last sort of normal year before the global financial crisis and 2020. And um, I think the most striking thing is that the uh, rates of growth for the emerging market countries are all higher than for these uh, rich countries. Uh, you'll notice that uh, this is all using the US dollar official exchange rates. Uh, on that basis, Canada had a 1.7% growth rate, which is much less than the 3.9% in uh, Switzerland and less than the 2.8% in the USA. But if you are measuring Canadian dollars, um, that we actually were growing at 3.9% per year. Um, at the bottom of the table, uh, we've got uh, statistics for the world as a whole. Notice that in the middle column, world mean is $77,000 per adult, but the median is only 8,000. So the average person has $8,000. Um, on the other hand, the final column, which shows the growth rate, show that the median grew more than twice as fast as the mean in this 13-year uh, period. Um, so this is an indication that um, overall uh, wealth distribution around the world uh, has been uh, becoming uh, more equal. There are two big influences on the world distribution of wealth. Uh, one is the differences between countries, which have been, uh, uh, are, those differences on average have been falling, that's, that's equalizing. The other thing is that uh, wealth distribution within countries has been becoming more unequal. Uh, similar to the increase in uh, income inequality that uh, uh, Michael Deal was uh, just speaking about. Uh, here are uh, global inequality trends. The bottom line is the share of the top 1%. This starts in the year 2000 and goes up to 2019. And you can see that that share drifted down to 2011 and then it went up. It uh, was down to 41% in 2011 and up to, back, up to 45% in 2019. Now, the other lines are for the green ones for the top 5%. I'll skip over that. Uh, the blue one is for the top 10%. You can see that that had a downward trend. It started at uh, about 89% and it's down to 82% at the end. Um, that may not seem very dramatic, but if you subtract that from 100, you get the share of the bottom 90%. And over this period, that went up from 12% to 18%, which is uh, quite a substantial increase. And the top line is the Gini coefficient. Uh, we find the Gini and the share of the top 10% tend to tell a, a relatively similar story. Uh, here's a bit of information about the distribution uh, within countries is the share of the top 1%. And you see that in North America, high income Asia, this is Japan and Australia and so on, uh, and Europe, there was an increase after 2010. So you've got the share of the top 1% going up. Uh, China, the increase came between 2005 and 2010. And since then, there's actually been a little bit of a decrease. Now, in emerging market countries other than China, so these are the ones that there's some difference in uh, lists of emerging markets that you see, but these are the typical emerging market countries, except for China. Uh, so we in include, include India there. There's been a very strong increase in the share of the uh, top 1%. So this is a, a force which has been disequalizing the world distribution. Uh, but uh, overall, the uh, compression of inequality between countries has been a stronger force, um, which is quite impressive. Okay, so in order to uh, dig deeper into um, uh, what's behind the increase in inequality within countries, I want to look at the um, wealth composition that's shown in Canadian data. Green, uh, we've got deciles of the wealth distribution along the bottom and then the, the top 5%, the top 1%, the green bars are all financial assets. You can see that they are lowest for the fourth and fifth deciles. And then after that, uh, it just goes up uh, as, as wealth increases and becomes very high at the top end. What that's telling us is that if there was a, say a big increase in stock prices in Canada, we would see the share of the top 1% go up, 5%, the top 10% go up for sure, because they uh, are, uh, their assets are concentrated in that form. On the other hand, if what happens if house prices go up? Well, uh, non-financial assets are mostly housing and uh, if house prices go up, then the uh, people who are benefit the most percentage-wise are the people in the middle, uh, deciles four to seven or eight. Um, so uh, those are two uh, conflicting influences. Um, so here are some numbers about the uh, fraction of assets that are in financial form in the world, Canada, and the US. 
And for the world and for Canada, these uh, numbers went down from uh, 2000 to 2010 or 2015, then up a little bit. In the US, in contrast, um, they've gone up uh, all the way through for the last 20 years. And this is uh, one of the major things that's behind the increase in wealth inequality in the US. The increase of income inequality does get reflected in wealth inequality, but there's a bit of a lag, right? Because um, you, you may save and invest out of your income year by year, and there's a cumulative effect. And uh, after a number of years, you begin to see some impact from that. So whereas asset price changes have an immediate effect. Uh, wealth shares for the world, Canada, the United States, uh, top 1%, bottom 90%. Let's go over to the United States. You can see that its top 1% went up from 32.8 uh, in 2000 to 35%. In 2019, both for both the world as a whole and for Canada, the share of the top 1% went down. Uh, finally, the final column shows the share of the bottom 90% of the US. That went down from 30% to 24%. So um, they're uh, not looking too good in terms of inequality. Uh, and in Canada, the share of the bottom 90% went up from rounding off 38 to 44%, which is a significant improvement. Now, most of that. Uh, increase in share for the bottom 90% accrued to the uh, deciles six, seven, eight, and nine. So those are the ones that are above the median, but not in the top 10%. And only 0.5 percentage points of that increase went to the bottom 50%. Okay, um, digging into these Canada-US differences a little bit more. Uh, the red line here, this is a house price index for the United States. You see there was a crash in house prices after the uh, global financial crisis. Uh, in Canada, there's just been sort of a gradual increase. Um, uh, these are share prices. Um, Canada, gradual increase. United States has gone up at an increasing rate uh, since 2008. And of course, one of the reasons is that uh, the US um, stock market is uh, heavily weighted towards the tech sector and more heavily as time goes on. And uh, Canada uh, doesn't have much representation in the uh, tech sector. Uh, more of natural resources and um, financial industry and so on. Okay, so it's been found by Ed Wolf uh, in the United States in his research that uh, the ratio of stock prices to house prices has a lot of explanatory value for the share of the top 1% of the US. So here are the red lines, that ratio. And in 20, 2008, the ratio was 0.6, and now it's 1.6. That's a huge change. So um, asset prices have been moving very much strongly in favor of increased inequality there. Canada, um, there are wobbles, but there's no trend. Uh, we're still very close to, uh, this ratio is still close to one where it started off 20 years ago. Um, okay, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the pandemic and uh, wealth inequality, uh, what's been happening during the period of the pandemic, not all of it necessarily due to the pandemic. Uh, GDP crashed in uh, most countries, inequality went up most strongly in North America. Uh, if nothing was done, uh, this would lead to wealth down and, and no doubt to wealth inequality up. Um, however, in the rich world, there have been very substantial emergency benefits and stimulus money. Uh, one of the interesting results of that is disposable income and saving of households both went up in most rich countries in 2020. That's partly because of the re reduced consumption opportunities or all the lockdowns. And uh, on the other hand, public sector went further into debt and typical increase in the public debt percentage of GDP was between 10 and 20%, actually more towards the 20% in, in most rich countries. Stock market, um, some people sometimes forget that it went down very sharply between about February the 19th, 2020 and March the 18th, uh, 2020, just for one month. And it's increased ever since. And house prices went up five to 10% in many countries in, um, Actually, it's 54 countries. There's the Knight Ritter House Price uh, Index, I think, for 54 countries that shows that. This uh, chart show, map shows the difference in uh, income replacement. The darkest color, uh, like Canada, is for countries where the public sector has replaced more than 50% of the reduction in people's incomes. Uh, then the less dark blue, like the United States, is, is uh, less than 50%. And there are countries in orange which have not had any income support at all. Contrast between Mexico and Brazil is, uh, is interesting there. Mexico not uh, basically not doing anything. And Brazil did provide uh, support to poor families for a fair while. And then it uh, 
kind of phase that out and then it brought it back a little bit. Um, here we've got, I'll concentrate just here on the last uh, column. Again, we have rich, four rich countries. We have four emerging market countries. Uh, stimulus money is a fraction of GDP. You can just see it's higher in all the rich countries than it is in any of these um, uh, emerging market countries. Uh, Brazil does uh, have stimulus of 12% of its GDP, but still that's less than all these rich countries. And on the other hand, the middle column is GDP. The hit to GDP was larger in all of these um, emerging market countries than it was in most of the rich countries. So, you know, where the need is greatest, uh, governments were not able to do as much as they did uh, in the rich countries. So uh, when the um, when we know what happened to wealth distribution in 2020, uh, maybe a bit of a lag because the data does come through uh, a year or two later, uh, I have no doubt that we're going to see that there was an increase in the global wealth inequality. Here's what happened to the stock price indexes. Um, you can see this uh, drop after uh, late February. That's about a 30% drop on average. And then most of the indexes have re recovered uh, pretty well and are now uh, above their uh, previous peak. A uh, notable exception is the UK at the bottom. So the country at the top is the US, country at the bottom is the UK. The UK, of course, has been struggling not only with the pandemic, but also with Brexit. Um, people are interested in what happened to the billionaires. Um, a mistake that is sometimes made, uh, particularly because the Forbes annual list of billionaires came out in, unfortunately, late March at the bottom of the stock market trough. So a mistake which is sometimes made is to compare now with late March, 2020. More appropriate comparison is with the previous peak in February. So uh, comparing with that, the top 10 billionaires, their wealth is up 25%, top 100, 20%, top 1,000, 14%. You see there that inequality among the billionaires has been increasing during the period of the pandemic. And there's some numbers about the tech billionaires at the bottom. They, uh, strangely enough, the top 10 uh, tech billionaires haven't done as well as the overall top 10 millionaires. Uh, that's because some of them uh, didn't do very well. Uh, we tend to hear about the ones who did very well, Zuckerberg and so on. But Bill Gates, his wealth uh, was down 8.5% in June 2021 uh, compared with February of uh, 2020, for example. So, uh, uh, I think the big story um, uh, in terms of wealth, or a big story, is that the public sector has bailed out the private sector. The increase in public debt in the United States, for example, was $4 trillion, led to an increase in household saving. This is excess saving, more than they would have, people would have saved if they had just been saving normally, $2.6 trillion and a $6.7 trillion increase in wealth. Um, these are uh, bars. The U.S. has a unique uh, source of data now about wealth distribution. Uh, uh, the data called distributional financial accounts, which are out on a quarterly basis from the Federal Reserve. And here you can see the uh, $12 trillion increase in total assets and the over $8 trillion increase in financial assets. Um, so financial asset story is very strong. Uh, you can compare that with the very small increase in business equity. Of course, a lot of businesses have actually gone bankrupt and so on. Um, here's this uh, distributional financial estimates. Um, What's happened to the share of the top 1%? Well, in the fourth quarter of 2019, it was 31.1%. Uh, at the end of uh, 2020, fourth quarter of 2020, it's 31.4%. Uh, that's not much of an increase. Um, they did uh, acquire uh, $7 trillion more, <laughs> but uh, the uh, wealth as a whole uh, in the country went up. Uh, the we even find that the share of the bottom 50% uh, increased a tiny bit. So, um, you know, a lot, a lot of attention has been paid to uh, the particular billionaires whose wealth has gone up remarkably. Some of them has gone up 50%. Um, but um, the overall story is, uh, yes, inequality went up, but it, uh, it didn't go up uh, as much as that might suggest. So I think I'm getting close to the end of my time, and maybe I should... Uh, uh, quit at, uh, about this point and uh, make time for questions. Thanks, James. Uh, we've got two questions in the Q&A. Uh, first one was, in your wealth levels chart, what are the stats for the EU? This is a question. We've, uh, 
Uh, right. Well, I couldn't. I, I don't have that in front of me. Um, the, the EU um, is the average wealth in the EU is not quite as high as one might think because it now has 27 countries and some of them uh, do not have particularly high wealth. Um, so as best as I can recall, the wealth for adult for the EU as a, as a whole is about $160,000 uh, per adult. We've got uh, another question. Maybe both of you can chime in on this. Is there another approach we can take to ensure the top 1% pay more? A tax on earnings rather than income tax? Oh, uh, I think probably the, well, I'll, I'll just jump in. Um, I think probably the questioner is thinking of uh, earnings in terms of investment earnings. I think so. Yeah. Uh, well, that's that's uh, certainly one, one alternative. And the simplest thing to do uh, would be to operate through the existing income tax and uh, increase uh, taxes, uh, for example, on capital gains and dividends and there are various uh, opportunities for uh, changing the way we tax corporate source uh, income. It could be integrated better with the uh, personal income tax. But uh, other things that people can think about is, you know, uh, Canada, like Australia and a number of other countries got rid of its estate tax. Uh, there's, there's no people. <laughs> I find that uh, the public thinks that there are death taxes in Canada. Well, they're not. We have deemed realization of capital gains on death, but we don't have any inheritance or estate taxes. Um, now, there's some countries that do. They have serious uh, estate taxes. Recently, it was reported that the um, founder, I, I think it's of Samsung in uh, South Korea, and one of their uh, huge corporations there, died. And a very large fraction of uh, his wealth is going to the state. And he's, uh, I, I don't know, practically building a new museum to house his, uh, all his art and so on. Uh, Japan also has a serious uh, estate tax. Uh, these things have an effect on the distribution of wealth. This was seen in uh, the UK, for example, in the 20th century, big reduction in the top shares of wealth. And that has been um, contributed in large part to their estate tax. Thank you. Michael, do you want to weigh in on that? Oh, I don't think I'd add much to what Jim said, except uh... When you look at the income tax system, the personal income tax system of a country like Canada, and you analyze uh, where you could raise tax revenues substantially, uh, it almost always would be in reducing special treatment for capital income. So some people argue that those treatments are justified, and we could talk about that. But just as an empirical question, uh, that's that's where the money is. If you like, you could you could, for example, instead of having capital gains taxed at half. You could have them taxed at 100 per 100 as if they were other income dollars. Again, that's a there's a lot involved in deciding what to do there, uh, but empirically, that's where the money is. Thank you, and I want to thank both of our both of our speakers for really interesting presentations. Uh, I'm going to move now to the panel, if we can, if we can put the uh, the panel up. So we have uh, we have three panelists with us today: uh, Dr. Craig Riddell. Uh, Dr. Janet Gornick and Dr. Lars Osberg. Uh, we've asked the panelists to keep the remarks to about 10 minutes, and so we can have an open Q&A session after that. Uh, and so I will turn it over. Craig, are you the one who's uh, going to kick us off on this? Uh, I'm happy to kick you off, yes. Uh, let me share my screen first. Uh, so I thought what I would do, uh, good, morning, good morning, everyone, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it is still morning here on the West Coast. Uh, I thought what I would do, try to do is to complement some of the uh, material that uh, Michael Veal and Jim Davies presented. And, and in my case, it's particularly related to uh, Michael Veal's presentation, because I'm going to focus on income inequality, not uh, wealth inequality. So just uh, some background. We've already heard in the introductory remarks what an important issue this is, uh, certainly one of, the, one of the major issues of our time as a former U.S. President, who you may remember, once uh, said, uh, "There's many dimensions. Uh, one that the, the one that uh, Mike Veal emphasized in particular is the dramatic rise in top incomes, but there's also the hollowing out in the middle. There's both fewer people, fewer number of workers in the middle of the income distribution, and also declining real incomes in the middle. Uh, and then there's growing real, 
declining real earnings at the bottom and growing number of workers at the bottom. Uh, and to adding all those up, there's after uh, many decades of the share of labor income being stable, uh, it's been falling in many countries, including, including Canada. Uh, and the, the, the policy responses, I'm not gonna talk much about policy responses, I'll say a little bit about a couple of them, uh, also differ uh, whether you're talking about uh, dealing with top incomes, we're getting into CEO compensation, corporate governance issues, whereas at the bottom where I'm gonna mainly focus, the policies are things like reforming labor law and to enhance union formation, uh, improving worker bargaining power, uh, increase the minimum wages and other similar uh, policies. Uh, and of course, there's many dimensions on the measurement side. So I'm gonna focus, Michael Veal uh, presented uh, income inequality information based on tax income. I'm gonna mainly focus on uh, household survey based measures of inequality. And the, the, they, they both have some pros and some cons, uh, so, but this will give uh, participants uh, a, another, another angle that's closely related. And as was emphasized, there's, uh, there's other broader dimensions, health, well-being, life satisfaction, as well as international transmission of inequality. Uh, and I'm gonna look uh, as much as possible on, on recent experience, although it's mainly pre-COVID. So let's start with, and of course I had to keep in mind that you probably hadn't seen enough figures yet. So I'm gonna show you a few more. Uh, I'm gonna show you, uh, first of all, family income inequality from the early uh, 80s right through to 2019. So this goes a little bit, a little bit more recent than the tax data did. I think the tax data went to 2018 if I remember. Um, and so what you see is, and this is measured using the Gini coefficient, uh, which is a widely used measure of uh, inequality uh, with uh, low, <coughs> low values being uh, more equal and high values being less equal. So this shows the Gini coefficient and over this period, the vertical lines, <coughs> excuse me, the vertical lines are recessions, uh, beginning, and, beginning and end of recession. So you can see that uh, in the early 80s, there was a very sharp recession in Canada, 81, 82. Inequality jumped up. It then declined during the subsequent boom, uh, and, but didn't quite get back to its pre-recession level. Then in the early 90s, we had another serious recession. Uh, and inequality increased quite dramatically. And it, during the subsequent boom, uh, it did not fall. It sort of leveled off. And then uh, since around 2000, inequality has been relatively stable, uh, which was also evident in the, in the tax data that you saw. Uh, and there's a hint of some recent, very recent uh, reduction in inequality. And that's something I'm gonna look a little bit more at. Uh, so back in 2016, I, um, I and two co-authors, uh, Franck saint at the IRPP and my UBC colleague, David, David Green. Uh, the three of us um, coordinated a project on income inequality in Canada, which uh, came out as a book in 2016 called Income Inequality, The Canadian Story. Uh, and it was a pretty comprehensive look at that. And I, I've given you the link for those that are interested to the overview chapter in that, in that book. Much of it's still uh, relative. And one of the issues that uh, we addressed in that book, one of the many issues is why did inequality stop growing in Canada uh, over the period from about 2000 to 2016 at that time. Um, and the studies indicated two main reasons for that. Uh, one were increases in minimum wages beginning around 2004, 2005, uh, which lifted up the bottom of the wage distribution. And there's a, there's a paper in the book by my UBC colleagues, Nicole Fortin and uh, Thomas Lemieux, uh, which uh, was, is the main basis for the conclusion that in the absence of the increases in minimum wages that we 
did have in Canada, beginning in the mid 2000s, uh, income inequality would have would have gone up more than it did, or would not have been as stable as it was. Uh, and that study went up to uh, about 2013. Uh, and that's important for what I'll, I'll show next. The other factor that led to the relative stability, according to the analysis in, in that volume, was the resource boom from about 2000 to 2014. And that lifted up the bottom and middle of the wage distribution, uh, especially very strong demand for manual type jobs, and it raised the earning earnings of uh, low-skilled workers, especially men. Uh, and one concern we raised that when that book was published is what's going to happen after the resource boom ends. Uh, so I'm going to just show you a bit of recent evidence in my in my remaining uh, few minutes, uh, based on work with David Green uh, at UBC and Kelly Foley at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, here we're showing not family income inequality as I had on the previous graph, but we're showing uh, the Gini coefficient of hourly wage inequality, um, both for men and women and then together. Um, and what you see is that over the period from about, uh, there was a rising inequality in, in the late 90s. Uh, it peaked in the early 2000s, it was fairly stable from 2000 to about 2017. Uh, but then we've seen some decline in wage inequality in the most recent period from about 2017 to 2020. This is the, the most current data you can get with, uh, in this case, it's with the labor force survey data. Uh, and I'm gonna take a bit of a closer look at that. Uh, this is the same picture using a different measure of inequality. The difference between the 90th percent on the 10th and the 50th percent on the 10th and it's especially evident in the 90-10 uh, differential, this recent decline in, in inequality in Canada. Uh, and one of the main reasons I expect, we don't have research on it yet, is the really dramatic rise in minimum wages in very recent years. Now, you remember that study by uh, Fortin and Lemieux that I mentioned, they went up to about 2013, uh, but you, as you can see, there was a, an increase in minimum wages from about 2005 right, right through to, uh, well, right through to the present, but it's been especially dramatic in the most recent years. And that is, uh, I'm guessing that that's uh, played an important role uh, in the recent decline in wage inequality in Canada. So there's a brief overview of some recent developments in individual wage inequality and in uh, household income inequality from uh, survey-based data. So I'll end there and uh, be happy to take questions later. Thanks, Greg. We'll save questions till the after the panel and then we can just open it up for general questions if that's okay. Uh, in that case, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Janet Corset to, uh, to join us. I see I win the prize for the most overloaded type of slide. Uh, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Just want to say I'm speaking to you from New York. It's a pleasure to be visiting Canada. I served for six years on an advisory committee to Statistics Canada, which was enormously interesting and brought me to Ottawa many times. And I'm afraid I haven't visited Canada in five years, so I'm happy to be, to be back such as it is. Um, I'm going to use my 10 minutes to offer some thoughts related to three interrelated questions about income inequality, so, some of which, especially in the last presentation, uh, have been alluded to. Um, I'll share those three questions in just a moment, but before I do, I just want to make two prefacing remarks. Nearly everything I'm going to say today, as has been the case with most of us, um, concerns high-income countries. I have carried out and supervised research uh, focused on middle-income countries, but today I'm going to focus on uh, 15 high-income countries. Uh, and the second thing I want to say as a preparatory remark, and again, this fits with what others have said, um, is if you uh, consider, say, the Gini or the 90-10, you consider inequality measures that capture, for the most part, the whole of the distribution, uh, not the focus on the top, which many of us uh, are also interested in. If you look at this income uh, distribution wide um, measure, what we find is between 1985 and about 2016, uh, income inequality rose in about two thirds of the high income countries and in the rest of them it remained 
um, steady or in a few cases fell. So of course the choice of endpoints is sensitive, but basically I'm gonna be pointing to a story of about uh, three decades. Okay, so what are the three questions? Also just um, previewed in the last comments. The first is we do hear a lot about the hollowing out of the middle. Uh, and during recent decades, I'm gonna ask what, what has really taken place in the middle of the income distribution uh, with a focus on the size of the so-called middle class. And then I'm gonna to turn to two qualitative questions. Uh, in those countries where income inequality has in fact increased, what do we know about the causes? And then finally, a few remarks on uh, drawing, especially in the academic literature, what are the consequences what, of high and rising inequality? In other words, why do we care? Um, this is a slide. Let me start by showing you this snapshot. Uh, so I'll tell you what this is. This is a snapshot uh, focusing on the size of the middle class as of 1985 in 15 high income countries. The data source is the LIST database, the longer name, the Luxembourg Income Study Database. I won't say too much about that, but it is a data source I've been involved with actually for 35 years. So in the q and I'd be happy to say something about that. Basically, it's an archive of micro data sets based on, for the most part, household surveys, uh, about 60 countries with income surveys and almost 20 with wealth surveys. But today I'm talking about income. Okay, so ongoing and active discussions about income inequality often raise this question, how is the middle class doing this with a focus on its size? Across academic disciplines and in political and popular discourse, um, a strong middle class is widely understood to be a necessary condition for a robust democracy and a resilient economy. Many argue that a sizable and stable middle class is required to ensure sustainable levels of public investment in core institutions like public schools, uh, hospitals, public safety, and transportation. So of course, there's been so much interest um, in the top, which I applaud a lot of research over many decades on poverty. But uh, I, my argument here is that it, we need to pause and look at the middle. Um, as well. So let me stress that in, in academia, again, in, in among scholars and policymakers and the general public, there is no one definition of the middle class. It's a much more uh, heterogeneous um, definitional problem than, for example, uh, defining um, what, poverty. So for, for this particular chart, to prepare the results in this figure, we chose a definition um, that is relatively common in this literature. We take the distribution of total household income after taxes and transfers is our starting point, and we define households as middle class, meaning sitting in the middle of the income distribution, sort of an economic notion of class. If their income, if their household income falls between half and one and a half times the median, okay, between 50% and 150% of the median, it's a fairly common um, a definition. Thus, it, with this uh, definition, as opposed to another common approach, say the middle 60, this is one where the size of the middle class obviously can change over time, and that's what we're looking at uh, here. In this particular picture, the middle class is, of course, in the middle. The, on the left, we show um, the share of the population that's poor, and on the right, the share of the population that's affluent by, this, by these markers. So the question, one of them that we were asking is, uh, what happened over time? Uh, that's something that Actually, wait, I'm sorry, before I do that, let me go back. I realize I forgot to say just a couple of things about the levels. Um, in 1985, well, one thing we see here is among these 15 countries, the US reported the smallest middle class, only 59% of Americans, fewer than two and three, according to this definition, lived in middle class households. So some 30 years ago, the US was already home to an unusually small middle class, one that was substantially smaller than that of many of our neighbors, especially across the Atlantic. At that time, the size of the middle class in Canada was substantially larger at 70%, putting Canada in the middle of the pack of, of this pack. And in the remainder of the countries, those that are visually sitting below Canada, the size of the middle class uh, was mostly at about 80%. Um, with a high of 86% in egalitarian Finland. So what happened? Did it in fact hollow out, meaning did the size of the middle class fall over time? Uh, and again, we're looking at about a 30 year period from 1985 to 2016. I, clearly things have changed in Canada in the last few years. So uh, I'd be curious and I will calculate these numbers again with a slight fall in inequality in Canada, which is of course quite, quite interesting. And we've seen in some other countries as well. Um, so has the middle hollowed out as we often hear? Is it a widespread? pattern. Our results indicate that yes, the dominant pattern in these rich countries has been a shrinking middle. In 14 out of 15 of these study countries, the share of the population situated in the middle uh, has in fact declined. The exception is Australia, where the middle class grew by about one percentage point. And the magnitude of change was remarkably varied, though you can see in half of these countries, the size of the middle class fell by a substantial eight to 11 percentage points, remembering on a base of somewhere between mostly about 70 and 80. Um, in five countries, including Canada, 
the size of the middle class fell more modestly by between about three and five percentage points. In two countries, the US and the UK, the middle class shrank, but only very slightly, virtually not at all, uh, declining by less than one percentage point. So let me just note that the, this result in the US surprised my colleagues and I when we first saw it, the, the result of essentially no change, somewhat unexpected because, but on the other hand, I, I mean, not much to celebrate since the size of the middle class, of course, was in cross-national terms small at both the beginning and the end of the time period. Um, but we were a little bit surprised because if you turn to the other metric and the other pattern of which I have endless numbers of charts, we do see looking at the Gini or the 90-10 that in fact income inequality in the US rose quite markedly in those years. So why did the size of the middle class remain stable? Well, the answer was also in our numbers and that is that most of the rise in inequality uh, was because the affluent grew more affluent. That group growth was the greatest in terms of income and the top moved away um, from the middle. Canada's results were perhaps less surprising, a little bit more intuitive than any inequality also grew overall. And again, this is taking us up to the point before this recent de de modest decrease in Canada, but the increasing inequality in the whole distribution in Canada is in fact paralleled by uh, a, a fairly modest, but still notable uh, decrease in the size um, of the middle. Okay, so on that note, I realize it's rather rapid fire, but let me shift to um, uh, some of the qualitative questions that it was suggested I might uh, address. And a lot of these have come up already. Uh, the question is often asked is what in very large sort of 30,000 foot question, why, why has inequality in household income, mostly we're working with disposable household income, meaning total household income um, from the market, from the state, and then minus income tax and social contributions paid out. That's our, our basic definition. Why has income inequality in that income measure gone up in two thirds of the countries? Um, in the rich world. Well, this is sort of the, these are kind of the usual suspects, these, these six points. Um, uh, clearly the, the first two I would describe as sort of global or transnational um, drivers, and that would be the changing influence of technical skills, composition, the reward structure. I will say very little. I know that's the subject of the next, uh, of the next session. Um, globalization itself, of course, is a factor, openness of trade, movement of capital and labor. Um, the other four on the list here are really much more um, drivers that operate within national borders, changing houses and changing household composition, including the, sorry, especially the rise of one adult households, um, changes in ways that high earners are compensated. We know that uh, Manuel Saez and others have talked about changing pay norms, of course, the rise of financialization. Um, weakening protections for low earners was just mentioned. This is certainly a big story in the US over this period of time. Uh, and longer declining union coverage and um, stagnating and falling minimum wages in many countries. The US is certainly a, a strong case of that. Um, as well as, uh, excuse me, reductions in redistributive policies, mostly tax and transfer policies that lessen market generated inequality. So just to say, I think the pre previous speakers have sort of said this, um, it would, it's foolish to identify any one driver. They vary over time. They vary across, they vary across countries the, the dominant causes of rising inequality vary across countries and they vary over time within countries. They also vary depending on what you're, what you're looking at, income or wealth, what metric, you know, the middle or the top. Um, my colleagues in, in New York, we often use the term of sort of, this is a story of causal pluralism. Um, uh, the corollary again, I would say is that, or the, I guess the punchline I would say is that where we really should be looking are at, at national, at country specific stories. Um, let me just say that th this is, I'm mentioning this only because I think this is not well covered in the literature. And, and again, I'm talking about inequality now at large and not simply the what's happening with the middle class. Um, there's a countervailing factor that's that we see OECD has reported this also across most um, high income countries, a countervailing factor that's compressing the household income distribution. And that is women's increasing engagement in paid work, which has risen in most rich countries over the past decades, interestingly enough, of course, stagnating. Um, in some places and, and downturning and during COVID. Um, women's increasing labor force participation has had an equalizing effect on the household income distribution because in general, in most countries, um, their entrance into the labor market has pulled up the bottom of household income more than it's pushed up the top. We hear a lot about homogamy, assorted of mating and the pushing up of the top, but the empirical story by nearly all, in nearly all studies is showing that women's increasing attachment to the labor market is equalizing. Um, let me just close with why do we care? I, I think many of you have spoken about this, including um, our, the introduction in the introduction. Um, just to say a couple of things that, you know, we've all noted, especially I think since about 2008, this explosion of interest in inequality uh, in many countries, not just, you know, partly the financial crisis occupied Wall Street, 
um, just been a, an enormous uptick in, in, uh, in many, many sectors. Um, some people argue that inequality is bad for normative reasons. It's just bad because it's bad. In rich countries, the have simply have too much compared to the have nots. But in my experience in the US, uh, I, I think in Canada, certainly in many countries in Europe, the public conversation has become more instrumental, that inequality is problematic because it causes other things, uh, other outcomes that it's non-controversial to argue that they're problematic. And I think this is sort of where this conversation um, lies. Clearly, there's a strong view that a rising inequality is problematic if it's associated with rising poverty, as it is in some countries and in some cases and in some demographic groups. Um, others, of course, are concerned if when rising inequality is associated with um, a reduction in the stability or economic well-being of the middle class. There's a whole other literature that actually isn't focused on income, but that's focused on other things um, that as the affluent grow more affluent, there's an impact on the middle class through rising prices, especially education and, um, and housing, and also decreasing public investment in infrastructures that are crucial for middle class families who don't have the option to privatize. Um, we also have a growing and enormously interesting literature on the impact correlation uh, or causal word is being worked out, but the relationship between high inequality seems to be increasingly, high inequality is increasingly understood to be associated uh, with lower levels of intergenerational, intergenerational mobility. My colleague, Miles Korak, being one of the world's experts on this, so I'll, I won't say more. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in recent years about inequality being bad for economic growth. Um, it's a very sophisticated literature now, much more than it used to be. Years ago, I think it's fair to say that was kind of a left-wing claim uh, in this country, certainly Stiglitz um, popularized it in his book and about the price of inequality. But now the argument that rising high inequality is bad for growth is one that's been fully embraced by many scholars of the IMF, uh, the World Bank. Um, and other you know, much more mainstream economic organizations. Uh, there are concerns and an interesting empirical literature, rising inequality or high and rising inequality are bad for social cohesion, sort of popularized through um, Wilson and Pickett's book years ago, The Spirit Level, that in countries or communities where inequality is high, regardless of the level of income, there's a damaging effect on social cohesion, which is played out through other metrics. And finally, a lot of research in this country and many others this is also very much, very strongly an American story that high and rising inequality interferes with the democratic process. So thank you. Thank you, Janet. Uh, I'll move on to our next panelist, Dr. Lars Osberg. Uh, Lars? All right. So uh, coming at the end, uh, it, would, it, was, it was always going to be pretty clear that, that there would be a lot of numbers uh, by this point in, in, in the game. Uh, and, and so I'm not going to inundate you with even more maybe a few a few graphics uh, the frustration of that of course is that I don't didn't really get a chance to file all my quibbles as as, as we went through uh, and you know just to pick one right off the top I guess Mike and I disagree a little bit on the uh, the possible importance of increasing tax avoidance and the use of Canadian controlled private corporations in, in Canada and how reliable uh, the income tax data in Canada is as an estimator of the top 1% share. Uh, when, when the CCPC share of, as CCPC as a share of GDP basically doubled uh, in the early part of the 2000s, and we have very little uh, evidence on, on what uh, reform, uh, whether reform has popularized this tax avoidance method or, 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 or clamped uh, down on it. But it also gives you a, ch a chance uh, and to, to agree with a lot of things. And so, and so why did I pick this particular uh, bunch of titles? I should explain. Uh, partly be, be, because, I mean, I think COVID-19 is, is a massive shock uh, to, to our economy and society and, and to the global economy and society. And, and if, if we think about the trends and inequalities, uh, Economists uh, have, have a lot to bring to the debate, but we also have to have, so, have some problems. Uh, we, if, we, if we're thinking empirically and we're using annual data, uh, right at this point of time, the only annual data available is 2019, and that's before COVID, right? Before this massive shock uh, to our system. If we think of our conceptual apparatus for analyzing uh, social trends, a great many of us uh, were brought up in the tradition 
of Alfred Marshall that nature doesn't make jumps. Uh, and so we're trained in the idea uh, that there's only marginal changes out there. So the past pr predicts the future. And we're not really well equipped, therefore, uh, to think of, of, of societal changes and of changes uh, in, in epochs. Uh, and you know, when, when you think of, uh, of, of this conference, for example, the title down here I see is uh, concentrate, Income Inequality, Concentration of Wealth and Technological Change. Now, certainly technological change uh, has an, an, an impact, uh, particularly over time, but it's tend to, it tends to be a fairly gradual and incremental. And, and I, I'd argue that it can't explain uh, much of, of international differences uh, among rich countries uh, at any particular point in time, uh, because technology uh, diffuses pr pr pretty rapidly. We, we have cell phones essentially all, all around the world, uh, and there's a lot of interest uh, among owners of capital in diffusing uh, best practices and technologies as, as fast as possible. So it has an, an impact, but much more rapid and much more differentiated uh, uh, much more rapid in change and much more differentiated across countries uh, is the difference in policy perspectives. And so that's what I want to, to really focus on. I mean, Craig already uh, mentioned the, the importance, emphasized the importance of the, the change in the minimum wage in Canada to, to bringing up uh, income to, at the bottom of the distribution. Uh, both Mike and, and, and Jim uh, uh, talked about the importance uh, of, of the taxation of capital income, which is after all, uh, pretty close to half of, of GDP. Uh, and in particular, uh, the importance uh, of the taxation regime for capital gains uh, as, as a determinant of the inheritance of, of, of wealth uh, and, and therefore uh, the inequality of opportunity that fa faces future, uh, uh, future generations. So uh, I, I'd like to focus uh, on uh, COVID-19 and its impact uh, on, on policy paradigms, because I think that th that, that is going to be uh, something that is driving the near-term future, future in a major way. And I think of COVID-19 uh, uh, as, as, as a truly massive inequality and insecurity shock, which, which overloads uh, us with uncertainty about the future. It, it, it's mad. I'm going to show you a bunch of slides to give you talk about how massive the shock was, but it also emphasized the interacting uncertainties. It's being driven by a, a global medical event. It, had, it spilled over very quickly into a massive economic event. It will filter out in political and, and social change. It will do so with uh, unknown phase durations, but also with global feedbacks. A lot of people have talked about how the medical event isn't over anywhere until it's over everywhere, but that's also true. And it has its, its reflections in, in global trade and global, uh, global politics. Now, right now we're still in the short term, we're in the short term of the, of the initial shock and the initial uh, waves and, and, the, and the lockdown phases, uh, but I'm gonna be emphasizing the, its impact on policy paradigms. And I think there are some important lessons already for, for the political economy of the societies in which we live. And, and one, the first one is it's, it's pretty obvious in rich countries, richer countries and poor countries, uh, that so, social safety nets are, are, are really crucial, they're really needed, that uh, the, the market cannot deliver uh, economic security uh, to, to countries. And there are very important times in which government has to step in in a major way. And so the, the argument uh, that dominated policy perspectives for quite a while, the government was kind of the problem. Uh, it just isn't gonna have a lot of credibility uh, going forward. When we talk about, uh, about ch uh, changes, well, one thing we observed in Canada is that, yeah, rapid social program change, it can happen. We, we can actually have multi-billion dollar uh, new programs within a matter of weeks. Uh, the, the, there's nothing like, having a possibility proof uh, to, to say that, that change can, can happen. And it, it's, it's also kind of evident that government deficits have, have increased hugely in Canada and around the world. And the, 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 that, that was kind of a, an absolute uh, sky will fall kind of pr prediction that you, you can't do this. Uh, it's happened and the sky hasn't fallen, uh, perhaps uh, partly because 
40 uh, percent of that increase in debt is actually internally held by the Bank of Canada. Uh, but that's another way of saying that, that hey, uh, this is something we can think about uh, in, in future policy options. We haven't yet gotten to the, 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 the medium term and, and the impacts uh, as at, in, in the immediate after COVID impacts in the recession, how long, over, however long it lasts uh, following the, the initial lockdowns. And there, there's going to be a long run impact. Uh, I'd argue that there's going to be an impact on, on both trend growth, uh, obviously on the level of, of the level of incomes, uh, and also the political economy implications. And, and so the question I'd like to kind of focus on is, is what policy paradigm will inform the, the post-COVID-19 world, and, and what will that, will that have to say about inequality? And just a few graphs to, to, to make them. This is for, for, really from, from last summer, this, for this first one. Uh, and it just shows the millions of hours worked in, in, in the Canadian economy, trending up as the population increases. Here's the 1990s recession. Here's the 1980s recession. We thought they were a big deal. Here's the 2008 uh, financial crisis. Uh, can you, are you guys seeing my, my, uh, my, uh, my pointer here? Or is, yeah. You are seeing it, but you can never tell in these Zoom lessons what, what people are seeing. Uh, so here's the 2008 financial crisis, which was, I remind you, uh, the, the biggest ec global economic downturn uh, since the Great Depression of, of the 1930s. And, and here's the downturn in labor uh, hours worked in Canada in March and April of 2020, just, just off the scale, right, in terms of, of shocks to, to the economy. And very differently uh, in terms of its impact uh, in the wage distribution, much more concentrated on the bottom uh, quintiles of, 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 of the wage distribution than the 2008 uh, recession. Uh, and th this is a story, it's a story around the world that this is the, the biggest shock uh, that was observed there. British data go back to 1709. 20, 2020 was the biggest uh, economic downturn, annual economic downturn in all that, that period, period of time, 300 years. So we saw the massive decline uh, in, uh, in our, hours worked uh, at the bottom of the distribution in the immediate months uh, after the first shock. We saw recovery at the top end of the distribution, not so much at the bottom end of the distribution, very much a K-shaped uh, recession, uh, recovery at the top, and continued depression at the bottom, at, at least in terms of market income. Now, of course, in Canada and in other rich countries, and I, I really like uh, Jim Davies' uh, map of the, the fiscal response and the income replacement ar around the world, because it makes a point uh, that I want to, 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 to this, this diagram also kind of makes is the absolutely unequal impacts uh, of uh, COVID-19 on economic activity around the world. Over here, the extremes are the two largest countries in the world. Here's China and its impact by uh, you know, mid-2020, and here's India, and Canada is in, is in here, in kind of in the middle, but massively big impacts in, in, in poor countries. But the, the, real, the real reason I have, I have this slide in here is uh, to, to talk about a bit about the, the pervasive forecasting uncertainty and the limitations of our, of our current modeling. Uh, I mean, uh, in sep the September 2020, uh, the OECD was for forecasting uh, the, the recovery path, and that's this red line, red line here. And of course, they, they always do this. I mean, computable general equilibrium models have this property that you always go back to the same trend rate of, of growth and you get back there pretty, pretty quickly because you assume that you get back there pretty quickly. Uh, but they weren't too sure whether it'd be just one wave. Well, in September, uh, they were quite sure there'd only be one wave. In the June document, they thought there was some possibility of one wave, some possibility of two waves. And of course, now we're is going in the middle of the, the third wave in, in Europe, not entirely clear whether, whether that, that, that's the end of it. Uh, so the, 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 the tools that economists have used uh, that, that he, you know, he, here's the, the, the great moderation and trend growth of, of per capita GDP off in the future, and we just get back there very quickly. It, it, there's a whole uh, literature on, on how the, the OECD and other in, institutions predicted rapid recovery from the financial crisis and every every quarter and it was always just 
a little bit far, far, farther down the road. But if we want to get back to normal, what are we getting back to? There's a lot of rhetoric about building back and exactly who wants to go back uh, to the old normal uh, before COVID. Uh, it, it, lots of other people uh, uh, present just, just different numbers. It, it's, it's hard to know which is, is the best one to summarize with. Uh, here's the, the real wages, the median real wages by educational level in the US for over a 30 year period, more like 40 year period. Uh, uh, and, you know, some gain at the top, de absolute declines in real income uh, at the bottom. So there are lots of, of people out there, uh, in, in uh, particular in the U.S., and that's particularly important uh, for develop policy developments in, in Canada, that have a lot of good reason to be unhappy. Uh, with the old normal. So the, I think the idea uh, that, that, you know, we, we can wake up a, a year from now and think, oh, this will all just be a bad dream that happened in the past and we go back to, to the same old, same old normal. I, I, I don't think that, 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 that cuts it. I mean, there, there is a, a go-to policy uh, for inequality that they say we just ask for, for more growth. Well, COVID-19 has already given us a, a negative productivity shock. It's also pro already produced an unwinding of a lot of glo globalization trends. There's been increased market income inequality uh, it, because of the differential shock uh, on, on, the, uh, on, er on earnings and hours, hours work. Now that's offset in Canada and in, in some other countries by a massive increase in social spending, but, but and with an, um, uh, an associated increase in, in the debt to GDP ratio. Uh, there's a, still an unknown net end to this process. We don't actually know uh, how many new variants are gonna emerge, what the long-term vaccine efficacy is gonna be. Uh, but we do have a pretty good idea that the unevenness of vaccination around the world is gonna leave global reservoirs of disease uh, for, from which new variants will continue to emerge. That means that this, this pandemic is gonna be with us uh, for, for quite a long time to come. And we were already, even before to, uh, the COVID-19 hit, uh, hit, we were in a position of, of uh, slowing productivity growth, of a long run trend and increasing top end share, declining natural interest rates, and a lot of uh, argument that, that, uh, that without increased government deficits, they already would have uh, tried to go negative. Lots of concerns about aging populations and increasing de dependency ratio, uh, accelerating trade wars in, in the period before 2019. So what some people have called secular stagnation and other people have called headwinds uh, to growth it, it was certainly a big focus of discussion, even back in, in, in 2019. And we do have some evidence that pandemics produce social unrest and, and, and conflict. Maybe not initially. Uh, during the pandemic itself, uh, there may be, uh, on, on the one hand, a, a certain rally around the flag effect, a, a social co cohesion effect. Uh, also, uh, pandemic control Im implies the restrictions on movement and surveillance of populations and control of populations, uh, which, which among other things do also uh, limit the possibility for demonstrations of, of, of social dis discontent. Uh, but uh, the IMF has an interesting paper out uh, talking about the increase in social unrest, uh, not, in the, not during the pandemic itself, but in the medium term, quite following the pandemic in, in the number of pandemic uh, uh, and, and epidemic incidences that, that have occurred uh, over, over recent, year, recent years. And of course, this pandemic is much bigger and much more widespread uh, than, than, than any of the, the observations uh, in, in, their, in their data set. And we can just uh, note that this, this social unrest uh, produces a lower growth, which in turn worsens inequality of, of forming a, a vicious cycle. And so there's lots of, I think there's pretty compelling evidence uh, that the implications of the pandemic uh, for, uh, for the economy don't just stop uh, with recession, but lead to uh, political and uh, pressures for political and social change. 
And so my question is whether we're going to move uh, from the Keynesian consensus through the neoliberal episode to, to, to something like, like a Green New Deal. I mean, we did have uh, through that period of, of stable inequality uh, between the Second World War and about the late 70s, early 80s, a pretty much a Keynesian welfare state consensus, uh, which had some skepticism uh, of, of, of the market embedded in it. It wasn't entirely clear to economists in those days that whether the market by itself would generate enough jobs or would generate enough economic security or a closer enough approximation to fair shares. So there really, really was a priority set to public policy that ensured full employment, some sharing of gains from growth, and some welfare state mechanisms to encourage economic security. Uh, I think it's fair to say that we had a, a, a whole package of, of what many people call neoliberal market fund fundamentalism for about the 40 years before 2019. Uh, low inflation, the idea of bu budget balance, of deregulation of global market value chains, uh, the, the general tendency to a smaller government and, and to improve incentives. You, you, you cut taxes at the top and you cut benefits at the bottom, you cut social spending most everywhere. Uh, so the top percentiles uh, prospered, but there was a big increase in, in, in there, there was much benefit growth in, in the middle of the distribution, as a number of people have already pointed out. Now, I would say that there was kind of a zombie phase for the last 10 years, 2009-2019, because uh, there was kind of a, a death of, the, of the, the, the pure market phase, uh, the, the deficit dogma kind of re receded uh, quite rapidly in, into obsolescence, but there was no new policy paradigm really. So the Green New Deal and Building Back be Better, they were kind of fringe ideas uh, a little over a year ago, and suddenly they're mainstream. Suddenly you have major trillion dollar uh, budget proposals, budget de deficit proposals in, in the US and, and proposals for changes in, in taxes and social policy that were just not on the agenda uh, a year ago, 18 months ago, two years, two years ago. And the, the key point, dimensions are decarbonization, a lot of tax and spend. I know it's, it's, it's pretty clear that not everybody's on board with this. The top end of the income distribution did pretty, really well up to, to 2019. Well, there's a big tendency to deny the, any problems that exist and still want more. So I think it's pretty easy to predict increased conflict over distribution of shares. And it's not exactly clear that it's, well, put it the other way around. It is clear that there are other ag agendas on offer. Uh, and so the, I think the political economy question is that if governments cannot deliver inclusive growth, which rapidly improves the well-being of the middle class, what exactly does happen when they, when, they, when they don't deliver economic security, when they deliver income stagnation and insecurity? Because the COVID-19 pandemic is the formative experience of, 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 a, of a generation. Millennials also got the 2008 budget uh, financial crisis. Uh, polling data shows sharp uh, generational differences in political attitude, and we have a whole uh, uh, environment of polarization and political instability. But there's also a desire for safety and security in dangerous uh, times. And we've seen already uh, that strong leaders can come along and offer an explanation, sense of community, idea of protection, and so the question is, if, if we don't go in one direction, if we don't pick up on the idea of, of basically a, 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 a resurgence of, of tax and spend redistribution and an attempt to do something about climate change, which some people have called the Green New Deal, what, what will the, 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 the left, where will the left behinds and the insecure uh, put their faith? And I'd come back to the, the insight of, of the changing consensus that the, uh, the welfare state and uh, economic security uh, was really seen as a, as a way of saving capitalism from itself, of maintaining the preconditions uh, for, for liberal uh, democracy. And I think I'm over time already, but I'll leave this up for a minute or two to some of my favorite uh, quotations. So that, that's it for me. Thanks, Lars. Uh, I remind people to, if they have questions, put them in the chat. We've got time for a few questions, uh, which we had but actually before we started. And I think maybe the Jim, if you're still here, this would uh, this would relate to what you were talking about. The question was, what is the influence of inherited wealth? 
That is, how much is first generation, example, tech billionaires versus inherited or family wealth? Uh, well, that's actually a question where there's been research off and on for uh, quite a few years. And uh, different people have come to different conclusions depending on exactly how you measure the uh, amount of wealth which uh, is, is uh, from inheritance. So the estimates range between 20% of wealth is due to inheritance to 80% is due to inheritance. And uh, uh, Tony Shorrox and I uh, looked at the evidence uh, some years ago and we concluded the, the correct answer is probably about uh, 40%. So it's pretty important. There's also a discussion about what the impact of inheritance is on inequality. Uh, some people who studied it, and that's a growing number of papers, where they uh, just look at, um, uh, in surveys, uh, how much wealth people uh, report that they inherited and uh, uh, look how that, how, that, how that varies across the wealth distribution and have uh, actually concluded that uh, the flow of inheritance overall is equalizing uh, because the money is going to, in many cases to people who are uh, not as well off as the people who died. Which is regression to the mean, I guess. And uh, so uh, it's, it's a little bit uh, of a complex uh, issue, but I think it's clear that um, a, a lot of uh, wealthy people um, are interested in a sort of dynastic continuity and go to a lot of trouble to uh, ensure that their wealth is uh, passed on in a secure way and that it uh, benefits the uh, later generations of their, their families. So I think it is a, it's a, one of the foundations of um, the uh, um, kind of, uh, you know, uh, system of uh, uh, class differences uh, that we have. Can, can I, can I j j jump in there? Because I really think that when we talk about I inheritance, a, a real problem is over aggregation. Uh, con considering the inheritances of, of the middle class, the, the inheritance such as they are of the, of the relatively poor, and the inheritances of the Westons, the Thompsons, uh, the Damarays, uh, the, the people at the top of the billionaires at the top of the wealth distribution, all the, in, in the same bag. I mean, there's a reason why inheritance taxes always have uh, a big uh, exemption at the bottom. Uh, because uh, that's uh, so, so that middle class people can pass on the family home, which is pretty much their only ma major asset uh, to, to their kids. And that makes a huge difference uh, to the, the, the quality of life of, of, of people whose parents were, were, were bus drivers in, in Toronto who bought a house when bus drivers could buy houses and who in, are also bus drivers and can also now ha have a reasonable house in Toronto. Uh, but that's not the situation that we're worried about uh, or that inheritance taxes were designed to be worried about. They were worried about the concentration of economic power. They were worried about the continued inheritance of, of the inheritances of, of billionaires and how they continue from one generation uh, to, to, to the next. And if we think about uh, that, you were kind of uh, t t talking a bit uh, about the, the importance of capital gains taxation. And, and in Canada, we have deemed realization of death. Uh, so that we, although we tax capital gains at half the rate of ordinary income, we still tax it uh, at, at death. In, in, in the US, they have this step up thing where you can pass assets uh, to your kids and, the, and, the, uh, and the, the cost basis for capital gains taxation steps up. Uh, at death. So essentially, if you, uh, if you get capital gains all your life, pass it to your kids and, 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 and they get capital gains all their life, it, it's never taxed, right? Uh, so the, the, the impact uh, on inequality of opportunity of the, the details of, of, of tax uh, legislation are really important for the percentage of, of wealth uh, that's uh, inherited and is going to differ in those two, two types of tax regimes. And, and the importance of policy changes uh, are really different because in the Biden tax proposals, it just came down. And this is why I'm emphasizing the importance of, of rapid uh, uh, institutional change. In the, in the Biden tax proposals, uh, not only do they propose increasing the rate of capital gains taxation, but they propose eliminating 
uh, the, the, the step up provision for large inheritances only. I'm not going to touch Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Middle class, no siree, only the top end of the distribution. And that's really about the, the idea of, of political control uh, of, of, our, of our democracies uh, as much as it is about uh, tax revenue. Janet, you want to uh, comment on this? I just wanted to comment. Uh, I'm sure many of you know this, but it's important to note that the transmission of wealth uh, across generations takes place through many mechanisms other than inheritance, as we obviously know. There's In the U.S., we endlessly focus on the inheritance tax. Some very interesting research in the U.S. and other countries has shown, if you look at intergenerational mobility during a life course perspective, uh, you know, the, the wealth of the parents is indeed a strong predictor of the wealth of the next generation, but that, and that, that correlation kicks in long before the bequest. So it's happening in other ways for young adults, not just inter vivos transfers, but, you know, if mom and dad are wealthy, then little Johnny and Susie also have higher income, which is translates into their own wealth. So there is, the point is, is that intergenerational transmission of wealth is a very serious, um, you know, issue, but it doesn't all take place through the bequest that's late in life. And so uh, we're just sort of here in the US and some of these discussions trying to focus a little more broadly than on taxing inheritance or, in, or, or estates. Well, thank you. Well, we're ex almost exactly on time. Uh, I wanna thank the speakers and the panelists for a very interesting, uh, for interesting presentations and an interesting discussion. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I will turn it back to the chair. Well, in which case, why don't I step in? My name is Nora McCray, and I'm the moderator for the next session. Excellent. I was just looking for that. So, Nora, I will turn it over to you. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much, Michael. Uh, my, and as mentioned, my name is Nora McCray. I'm the Associate Provost for the Cooperative and Experiential Education Program at the University of Waterloo. And it's my absolute pleasure to be the moderator for this session. And the topic of this session is uh, rapid technological change and the COVID-19 pandemic their impact on the future nature of work. This topic, as a reminder for those uh, who've looked at the agenda, is broken into two parts. The first part happens over the next hour where we have some distinguished speakers who will be speaking to this topic. One is from the OECD and two speakers from the Brookfield Institute, and I'll introduce them in a minute. And then tomorrow afternoon, we start part two of this important topic with an, with an exciting group of panelists and, uh, and individuals with a number of different perspectives on this topic, which will be very interesting. So I'd like to just first to comment on why the University of Waterloo is so interested in this work. Uh, one of the previous speakers I was listening just now talked about um, how the, the how young people or the younger generation is getting wealth as well and, and not all of it's inherited that's happening earlier on and this is of course the space that the University of Waterloo is interested in is young talent how do we get young talent in, in the case of co-op and experiential ed how do we connect what students are studying to the world of work why is that important? How do we prepare them for the future of work, not only being employable, but also being able to be adaptive and resilient for whatever uncertainties and volatility that, that uh, they will be experiencing? And of course, what greater example of that than COVID-19 as an example of something that's really disrupted um, our students um, studying, but also their work experiences but disrupted them not always in a bad way and some sometimes it's been a, it's a good it's been a good thing that's happened and uh, demonstrated the technological agility that our students have and also that our employers have and have been able to support our students in a number of ways so that's the space uh, that i'm very interested in in preparing our students for the future of work and how to adapt and also as a very active and proud member of a coalition that's been running over the last two, two years in the Kitchener-Waterloo area, uh, a Future of Work and Learning Coalition made up of, of um, representatives from a number of different sectors in the community and with the great support of uh, Communitech that's helped pull it together. We've had a number of very interesting engagements actually and there's more, more information about that on the website that's available for this event on the work of the coalition, how we've pulled the coalition together, how the, the role that Communitech has provided in, in being the backbone for that organization and some of the really interesting pilot work we've done, including the um, scorecard for communities wanting to see how future ready their community is. And it's based on a, a number of indices that we've been looking at. So, oh, there we go. Um, 
the, this is a bit of, about myself. I think that's that's great. Thanks very much. And I, again, you can read more on the special website that's available. But what I would like to do at this point is uh, introduce our first speaker so that we can get right into that. Our first speaker is Dr. Brooke uh, Brooke, uh, who's a senior economist at uh, the OECD, where he leads the organization's Future of Work initiative. He was co-editor and co-author of the 2019 OECD Employment Outlook on the Future of Work, and he currently leads a large research program on the impact of artificial on intelligence on the labor market. So I wonder, uh, Dr. Brooke, if you're ready to present your comments at this point to the group. I am. Uh, good afternoon. As you can tell by the lighting, it is good evening over here. Um, thanks a lot for inviting me. It's a real pleasure. So I'm going to try and share my screen. So thanks for the introductions. Uh, I lead the Future of Work initiative at the OECD. I've been looking at the future of work for the last three or years or so. Uh, we, um, we've been looking at how mega trends impact on labor markets, how, how labor markets change over time. Um, and what I'll try and do in my presentation today is focus in particular on technological change. But I think we shouldn't forget that there are some other big trends going on, like population aging and globalization. Um, but I will focus primarily on technological change and how that's impacting on the labor market. And I will talk a little bit about artificial intelligence in, um, towards the end of my presentation, since that's what we're increasingly working on. And I will also talk a little bit about COVID-19. Now, uh, one, one, one thing I, I should say um, is, I mean, I might as well summarize my, my presentation uh, in, in the sense that when we look at the future of work, we're not necessarily so worried about a future of massive technological unemployment we're more worried about a future of massive disparities in the labor market. So although I'm not a specialist on inequality and I followed with a lot of interest the, the presentation uh, that all the presentations that came before, and um, what I will talk about in particular is disparities in the labor market. So I will focus in my presentation on how these trends are playing out in terms of inequalities in the labor market. Now, as I said, we don't need to worry about a, a, a jobless future now. I kind of preempted my next slide, which it really is this fear that we often see in the media, the fear that we often hear among policymakers, about people even in the street, which is about this, this jobless future. And I'll just show you a few covers of magazines here through, throughout the years. It's a, it's a repeating uh, theme that comes back and it's kind of been bolstered by some highly renowned academics at Oxford, but also at, at, at Stanford, who have estimated or said that 50% of jobs, half of jobs would be automated in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, and some people like Bryn Olson have said that, you know, and I quote here, there's never been a worse time to be a worker with ordinary skills because computers, robots, and other digital technologies are acquiring these skills and abilities at an extraordinary rate. Now, at the OECD, we have come up with our own estimates of the risk of automation. Some of you might have seen these. We take a task-based approach, which means that we split the job down into different tasks and we look what kind of tasks could be automated. And then we, we kind of see what, what proportion of a job could be automated. And if we look at jobs that are at very high risk of automation, so are, that may well disappear, uh, we estimate that around 14% of jobs in OECD countries are at high risk of automation. So you can see Canada here, which is probably slightly below the OECD average, but we're still around 12% of jobs at high risk of automation. On top of that, you have the gray bars, which are jobs which are at risk of significant change. So a large, these jobs might not disappear, but a large share of the tasks that people do in these jobs will be automated, which means that the jobs that people do will change and they will have to adapt on the job. So overall, if you add up these two bars, you're getting close to 50% of people who will be significantly affected by automation. Now, these estimates are a few years old. Um, they, were, uh, they were based on data from 2012 primarily. So one exercise we did recently at the OECD is whether these estimates actually played out in, 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 in reality. And we, we looked at occupations, jobs that we estimated to be at high risk of automation, 
and we looked at job growth in these occupations compared to occupations that were at low risk uh, of automation. And we do, we do find a negative relationship in the sense that occupations that we estimated to be at high risk of automation did see lower employment growth than occupations at low risk uh, of automation. That being said, you can see that nearly all jobs over this period, which is 2012 to 2019 approximately, have seen employment growth. Now, of course, we're talking about a period which also spans the recovery from the financial crisis, but our estimates, at least the tests that we've done, show that actually these automation figures and the, and the relationship I show you here is robust to that. The other interesting thing I want to point out is that when we do this analysis at the country level, we find no evidence that countries where there's an average a higher average risk of automation actually experience lower employment growth. So it kind of evens out because yes, jobs get destroyed in some areas, but they are created in others. So yes, occupations at high risk of automation do seem to see lower employment growth, but that doesn't play out at the country level. So on the whole, uh, overall automation doesn't seem to have a negative in impact on employment growth. And certainly when we look at employment in OECD countries over the last 10 to 20 years, in most countries prior to COVID-19, we were at record employment rates. And over the last 20 years, employment rates have continued to rise uh, in almost every single OECD country. There's a couple of exceptions. The United States is one of them, but in almost every single other country, uh, we were at record levels of employment. Now, again, this is at an aggregate level, because now what I want to do is dig a little bit deeper into what happens between different groups. And I want to first go back to these automation figures, because one thing that we've done is that we've tried to break these down by different types of workers. So we've looked at high skilled workers and low skilled workers. And one thing that's very clear is that the risk of automation, at least with the technologies that we had over the last 10 years or so, the, the, these technologies primarily aut automated tasks and jobs done by low skilled people. Um, and, and so these have a significantly higher risk of automation than high skilled people. But I'll come back to that point later when I discuss artificial intelligence. Now you can see this in the labor market happening as well. Um, this is a chart which shows you employment growth by industry or by sector over the last, uh, over a period of, of uh, approximately 20 years. And I, I think you see some, I mean, earlier I, I heard a mention of some of these changes being rather slow or gradual. I would say that over a period of 20 years, we've seen quite significant structural change in the labor market. So in particular, what I want to point out in this graph is just one example of a structural change is that the blue bars show you a decline in jobs in manufacturing. So we've seen a massive decline in jobs in manufacturing and at the same time, growth in the service sector in particular. And many of the jobs that have disappeared in manufacturing used to be relatively good quality jobs that middle skilled workers, sometimes even low skilled workers could do. They were stable jobs that offered a relatively good wage. Whereas in the service sector, we, ha we have a different type of job. And then again, that's a point that I want to come back to later. This is a chart that many of you may have seen as well, but it kind of repeats some of the information that I've said. Um, there's good news in this story. This is a polarization chart of the of labor markets across a few uh, key economies in the OECD. And it shows you employment growth primarily in the high skilled jobs. So that's a good news story. We are creating many more high skilled jobs and that creates opportunities in the context of the future of work. But we see these middle skilled jobs disappear. So people, these used to be jobs occupied by people who had, say, a, a, a secondary uh, school qualification. Again, these were people who used to get decent jobs in manufacturing, for example. But then increasingly, these jobs are disappearing and these people are finding themselves in non-employment or being pushed into low skilled employment. Because as you can see, there's a little bit of growth on the low skilled end, which is in some uh, low skilled services jobs uh, primarily. So there's a lot of structural change and you can see that the, 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 the kind of people affected by this are not the same. Different groups have, offered, some groups have opportunities, others have real risks in the future of work. And one thing that I want to point out, that, I mean, these are snippets that are coming out of our analysis. We see a really challenging environment uh, appear for youth and low skilled youth in particular. So these, here I'm just putting a few quotes 
of, uh, of recent research that we've done. And, and one thing that we're seeing is that low skilled youth are increasingly being pushed into low paid employment uh, and also in, into underemployment. So they, they have jobs where they would like to work more hours than they can actually get or that their employer is willing to offer them. And the other thing that we see is that these new cohorts of young workers that do not have a university education are increasingly being pushed into low skill employment compared to youth 10 or 20 years ago. So the labor market for youth does seem to be changing. And again, to some extent, this is related to the trends that this the kind of shift from manufacturing to services. Uh, but also one thing I didn't mention about the risk of automation is that when we break down uh, the risk of automation by age, we find that young people tend to have a higher risk of automation. And that's related to some of the entry level jobs that youth used, youth used to take disappearing because they, they contain many tasks that can easily be automated. Now, so far, I've primarily talked about older technologies, but I think we're seeing a, a very big change in the, or we're going to see a big change in the labor market driven by artificial intelligence. And I think there are reasons to treat artificial intelligence differently from other technological uh, revolutions that we have seen. There, there are a number of reasons I think we should really monitor closely what is happening in the labor market as a result of developments in artificial intelligence, as a result of the adoption of, of artificial intelligence in the, in the work environment. The indication is that AI is a general purpose technology, so it will be adopted in nearly every single occupation, in nearly every single industry in, in our economies. And so it will have a very big impact. Another thing that's new about AI, or not new, but I think it massively or it magnifies some issues that we were previously perhaps dealing with with, with some technologies, but AI really puts makes this issue much bigger. And, and I, I would say these are issues around uh, ethical issues, things around issues around privacy, data transparency, explainability, uh, bias, and these are very very big issues that. Uh, our, our member countries are, are particularly concerned about. I won't go into in, in detail in my presentation today, but I, I did just want to, to, to mention these because I think they, they're, they're, they're new, at least from our perspective. I've been working on labor markets for the late last 10 years or so. I've never really worked on ethical issues. And, and, and so I think this has really come to the forefront and will be with us for the next years or if not decades to come. But the next point that I want to focus on is that What's really special about AI is that it tends to affect tasks done by high skilled workers in particular. So it tends to be able to do non-routine cognitive tasks, as opposed to say just standard robots, which used to do routine non-cognitive tasks. And so this is a this graph is way too small. You'll just have to take my word on it on, in terms of what, what it actually shows you. But we have looked at some uh, research um, done by uh, in the United States and tried to extend it to other OECD countries, where we've looked at developments in artificial intelligence and then mapped it onto a kind of abilities or skills of workers in different occupations. And once you do that, you see that high skilled occupations like business prof professionals, managers, IT at, uh, uh, people working in ICT, um, uh, lawyers tend to be more exposed to artificial intelligence uh, tools and, and developments. Whereas at the bottom, you see laborers, uh, food preparation assistants, cleaners. These are jobs which may have been previously more affected by automation, um, uh, but they're now relatively le less uh, exposed to, to automation. But I think that the we, we know very little at this point, and there is still we have we started a large program of work to try and better understand what this actually means uh, in terms of labor market outcomes. And the early indication is that actually this higher exposure to AI for high skilled uh, workers could actually be a good thing for them, and as a result, a bad thing for inequality. And the reason that or the mechanism through which this works is that AI may make these high skilled workers even more productive, could lead to wage increases for these workers, could lead to an increase in demand for these workers. And so AI in a kind of inverted way could increase inequalities in the labor market. Now, I said there, there really isn't uh, much research out there yet in terms of what impact AI 
has on the labor market. What I've seen is primarily focused on the, uh, on the United States. Uh, there's very little indication of employment effects of AI. So it's not like this automation in high school occupations leads to uh, a reduction in jobs. In fact, there are two papers that show the contrary that what happens is that it's positively, positively related to wage growth in these occupations. And so higher wage occupations and occupations where the average level of education is higher. So what about COVID-19? So uh, everything so far is really, for me, the biggest challenge in the future of work is disparities and rising disparities and inequalities in the labor market. Um, going back to the inequality discussion, we know that inequality was at its highest level uh, in many countries prior to COVID-19. It was rising in many countries. And from a policy perspective and, and in the future of work context, I really think this is one of the biggest challenges that we are facing. And I think, unfortunately, COVID-19 has not helped with this. It's accelerated digitalization. And through that, I think it may have widened again the gaps between people who have digital skills and people who don't have digital skills. But what, what I want to talk about here is more the immediate labor market effects of COVID-19. And one, I mean, we know that COVID hit some sectors much more than others. In, in particular, the service sector was very hard hit. Uh, so the accommodation, but also food services. And we know that certain socioeconomic groups are, are tend to be concentrated in these sectors. So it, it, more than 50% of low educated workers were concentrated in, in sectors that were hard hit compared to just 20% of, of, uh, of high educated workers. And similarly, just to give you some other statistics, if you look at um, highly paid work occupations, they are, their hours of work are pretty much back uh, at where they used to be uh, at the end of 2019. Whereas for low paid workers, they are still significantly lower than they, uh, what they used to be. Now, there are signs of a recovery, uh, but the question is how fast this recovery will come. Um, if there's any delay in the recovery, uh, we estimate at the OECD that many of these jobs in, in these very hard hit sectors, these are jobs that would be viable under nor normal circumstances. But even if we now keep the, the support measures that we have in place, Many of these businesses are likely to go out of business and with, I think, a, a big long-term impact on, on the workers. So in, in particular, vulnerable workers in, in these occupations. Um, in many European countries, we also had uh, schemes to support workers in work. So even though they were not working, uh, their wages were being paid, et cetera, but these schemes are gradually being withdrawn. So this again could be translating into longer unemployment and impacts on, on, on long-term unemployment in particular. Uh, and also um, uh, this connection with the labor market. Now I have 17 minutes. I was going to say a few words, I'm sorry, I've spoken for 17 minutes. I was going to say a few words about the platform economy. I, I, I'm gonna summarize my message here is that the platform economy has in many ways benefited from COVID-19. It has, the signs are that it has grown as a result of COVID-19. Um, now, the platform economy is, of course, a very heterogeneous group of, of workers, but we know even prior to COVID-19, we knew that there were many vulnerable workers in the platform economy. And we saw that these workers, at least at the beginning of the crisis, were very hard hit. They often had no unemployment protection, no coverage in terms of sickness benefits, etc. Fortunately, I think many OECD countries stepped in with emergency measures to protect these workers. But we learned the hard way, something that we've been saying for a very long time is that these workers need more protections going forward. And if it's true that the platform economy has grown and will stay at a, at a, at a higher percentage of overall employment, then this becomes an even more urgent problem to tackle. And particularly when it, when it relates to uh, it, the, the topic that we're covering today, which is labor market disparities, we know that certain groups of vulnerable workers tend to be particularly concentrated in, in these types of jobs as well. So I just wanted to, to mention this as another trend that I think we should be worried about and do something about. So I will stop talking here. Um, and I don't know if there's time for questions or anything like this, but I'd be happy to answer any. And here are my details in case you have any questions by email, or I'll be happy to answer those. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your comments and your presentation. I do see there 
There is a question in the Q and A. Um, can I just read it out for you if you're if you're willing to take a question? Uh, the question is the erosion of middle skill jobs. Uh, do we have a good sense of how many are pushed to low skill jobs versus training to perhaps move to higher skill jobs? That's a really good question. Um, I don't have the answer to that question, but one, one, one thing that we did do at the OECD is we tried to look at workers who traditionally were doing middle skill jobs. And because we know that the share of middle skill jobs is shrinking. So our question was, what is actually happening to that type of worker? So we had to come up with a, a, a typical kind of worker who used to do those jobs. And then we tried to see what actually happens to those over time. Uh, and, and, and as I said earlier, typically these are people who have a secondary level of education. Now, one of the very interesting things is when you look at this polarization chart, a lot of it, I mean, let me start, a little bit of it is driven by people being displaced from their jobs. Um, so yes, it's true, some older workers will be displaced from their jobs and they're, they tend to be pushed either into non-employment or into lower skilled jobs. But actually the bulk of these, these, adjust, the, these adjustments that you see are actually driven by young people people entering different jobs now than young people entered 10 or 20 years ago. So related to this question, I think this, this indicates that initial education is actually really important in terms of making sure that we fill the skills gaps that might be arising as a result of these changes in the labor market. So that, that's perhaps something that we didn't know uh, a few years ago, but I think this research that we recently did show that actually the main driver is, 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 is three young people. Um, that doesn't mean that these all the workers being displaced are not a big issue, but it, it does, it reminds us that the, the problem is more complicated than we, we may have initially thought. That's very interesting. And, and if I can just build on that a little bit, you made the comment about uh, younger workers being very vulnerable. And then a little later in your presentation, the importance of AI and how you, you're predicting that AI will infuse pretty much everything. So it certainly made me wonder about um, the need to start developing AI training in young people, maybe in elementary school, middle school, high school. Are you seeing any movement in that regard? I'm not sure how training programs are developing. I, I, I have seen some evidence that people graduating from AI programs earn incredibly high wages. So there's clearly a demand for that. There's also evidence from burning glass data. So burning glass scrapes uh, vacancy data on the web. So they're a pretty comprehensive uh, database of, of vacancies. And there's evidence that there's been growth in the demand for AI related skills, but it remains very low. It's something like 0.36% of all occupation or all vacancies demand some AI related skills. And so one thing I want to say in relation to this is that I think many of us or many people in the future will be working with AI without necessarily knowing it. And so it, that means that we don't necessarily need AI skills or to know anything about how AI actually functions. Uh, we will just be working with it alongside it. And so for me, the bigger question is not necessarily what AI skills do we need, it's more what other skills do we need to work with AI uh, and how will AI change that landscape? Um, that, that's something that we're looking at at the OECD at the moment, trying to understand that better because that will have implications for, for training going forward. Mm -hmm. So again, it gets to some of those human skills as the, as the Royal Bank of Canada has called them, you know, those critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, appreciation of a, of a broader context and someone might build an algorithm for you. You don't have to do it yourself necessarily, but that you can bring that to play as you're, as you're solving a problem in your own context, right? Yeah. Yeah, Great. exactly. Um, let's see, are there any other questions that have, I, uh, let's see, I think we've answered the question. Um, then if I may, thank you very much for your presentation. And if I may, I'd like to turn to the two speakers who are up next uh, coming to us from the Brookfield Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship in Toronto. So we have Diana Rivera, who's the senior economist, and Nisa Mali, who's the manager, innovative and inclusive economy. So I'm not sure who's going, who's going first or how, you, how the two of you are, are managing this presentation, but if I can hand it over to you, Diana and Nisa, welcome. Perfect, thank you very much, Nora. I'm just gonna share my screen, one second. Perfect. 
So thank you so much for having us and to Dr. Broca for that excellent presentation. Um, as Nora mentioned, I manage the Brookfield Institute's Innovative and Inclusive Economy Workstream, a thematic research program that wrestles with many of the same research questions that this conference is posing uh, and asks in an economy and society that's increasingly driven by innovation and reliant on technology, how can we include support and benefit people and communities across Canada? I'm here with my colleague, Diana Rivera, one of our senior economists and project leads, uh, and our team is housed at Ryerson University in Toronto. We're gonna to be presenting an arc of research today that slices uh, across a couple of different projects uh, from a pre-pandemic forecast for occupational growth and trends analysis through some smaller research projects that have gleaned a bit of insight into how technology has been used and distributed unevenly through the pandemic and closing with a, a framework for identifying and designing more place-based human-centered and flexible job transitions for workers, which we recently tested uh, for food retail workers here in uh, Ontario. We're going to do this at a bit of a lightning speed, so if, there, if there's projects we cite that you'd like more information on, please get in touch, and we have a slide in this deck that links to, to all of the published reports that we're mentioning. Uh, and maybe I'll just say off the top, uh, so often future of work conversations frame the future as something that's, that's market driven, that, that requires workers to, to prepare themselves for, rather than, than something that's within uh, our collective powers to, to imagine for ourselves, to make choices about the kinds of economy and society that we want, uh, the skills we may need to build it, uh, and how we'll support workers in making those transitions. And we often forget that these potential future trends that we talk about in abstract, like income precarity or technological displacement, are the very real, very present day reality for many people already, and for whom these, these possible futures may only normalize, intensify, or further disrupt their experience of work. So this arc of uh, our research is trying to move beyond supply and demand uh, and stay grounded in the fact that the skills, competencies, and expertise is held by people, it's held by, by workers. Uh, and it's held by workers that need jobs that pay enough to live in the communities where the demand is under decent and safe working conditions at hours that meet their, their caregiving and commuting requirements uh, and many other measures that you can really only identify if you, you actually go out and, and talk to people um, in those jobs on the ground. And uh, this is where I'm gonna jump in. Um, maybe if we can uh, move ahead on the slides. If you... There you go. Perfect. So um, thanks, Nisa, for that intro. Um, I'll start this with some research that we did pre-pandemic, and we released in early 2020. Uh, but that was also future-looking by design, and that's our Employment in 2030 project. This project created a new skills-driven forecast of occupational growth, which was meant to complement other projection systems in the country, say COPS, say um, you know provincial, provincial projections that are based on COPS, um, and include different data to inform it and help us get a bit of a broader, a different picture. Uh, and in this project, we had three main goals. Um, first, as I mentioned, was to create a an entirely new source of labor market information. Uh, a forecast of employment growth for 2030 that was based on skills. Uh, the second was to identify potential areas of risk and opportunity over this next decade. Um, and then third was to inform the stakeholders that need this information, whether it's uh, workforce developers, governments, um, educational institutions, et cetera. And we, again, did, did this in three stages. Uh, the first was through, the, sorry, in the first stage and through uh, strategic foresight methodologies, we identified some of the main trends that could uh, potentially affect the labor market. Um, and echoing the last presentation, in these trends fell within the mega trends that we're seeing of uh, technological change, demographic change, urbanization, globalization, environmental sustainability, um, inequality, political change, and others. Uh, and then we brought this to uh, labor market information experts at six workshops throughout Canada. Uh, and then informed by the data that we collected from, from these experts, we created a machine learning model that allowed us to see what our, particip what our participants would have said uh, about all occupations in Canada, whether they might grow, whether they might decline, whether they might remain stable, 
um, in share of employment in over the next 10 years, uh, effectively creating a set of projections that spans the labor market. And again, it's really meant, was really meant to complement existing sources of information. And uh, even then we saw change coming. Um, Misa, if you would have mind moving to the next slide. Thank you. Um, there were two trends that most that were most consistently consistently highlighted by um, our experts as having really important impacts and really broad um, impacts. Uh, again, echoing the previous presentation, uh, something that we call a trend that we called AI everything, which essentially uh, represents the fact that AI may impact and potentially disrupt every industry, um, very very broadly reaching. Um, and then the second one was that resources like clean air, clean water, um, even sand may become scarce and extremely valuable. Uh, there were trends that have only become more salient, but that affected how we worked even pre-pandemic, such as you know, being increasingly connected through technology, but also increasingly lonely. Um, our aging population uh, growing low, growing um, work and life integration and things like a suburban boom. Uh, in addition, uh, we found that five foundational skills may become really key to our labor, uh, to our labor landscape. And these traits encompass um, a worker's ability to teach, uh, to influence people's opinions and behavior, to identify ways to help people, to brainstorm, uh, and to absorb new information of different kinds and in different ways. Uh, but most importantly, and, and one of the things that we're really basing um, or our presentation on today was that we found that even then workers really faced different challenges and needed different levels for, of support. So as much as um, you know, we know that the impacts of COVID have been uneven, uh, even before COVID, we we didn't all start from the first from the same place. Uh, in 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 this project, we found that about a third of workers in Canada were in occupations that were projected to change over the next decade, um, and that these risks and opportunities were not distributed evenly. So, um, just switching to our next slide, uh, even pre-pandemic, this project already signaled change, but. Some of these impacts are hitting now or hitting quickly, as has been said in previous presentations, you know, rather than the gradual changes that we were expecting in much of the future of work, uh, research and literature and narrative, um, a lot of this is happening now and it's happening rather suddenly. So what, switching, switching a bit to what this work meant during the pandemic or once the pandemic hit, um, the findings from the Employment in 2030 project uh, led us to working with partners across the country uh, with um, the Future Skills Center to really learn about, uh, learn more about and even prototype what support might actually look like. Um, Interaction Labs project, for example, our partner in Newfoundland and Labrador is looking at supporting transitions for highly skilled mid-career workers who have been disrupted in Quebec is looking at upskilling mid-career workers in tourism and hospitality. In Yukon and in Manitoba are looking at future-proofing their youth. We, we heard from the previous presentation that young people and their adherence to the labor market is, is something that a lot of people are, um, are thinking about right now. Uh, and then BC is looking to better support early career immigrants in joining the labor market. So, in this work, we are currently holding workshops with partners and stakeholders to help address the different challenges that each region has in their labor strategies. But it's, as you might imagine, it's not only provinces, it's not only different territories uh, that we should be thinking about when it comes to different needs. Um, and on that, I'll pass it over to Nisa to elaborate on some of our uh, other work. So I'm obviously preaching to the choir here, giving the, the topic and the frame for this conference, but it's been obvious since the start of the pandemic that we are not all in this together, that the, the impact and experience of COVID-19 even uh, within Canada has varied widely between sectors, regions, occupations, uh, household income, health and exposure risks, family composition, uh, 
whether or not you had assets such as backyards or cars, cottages, or, or home internet and devices. And we've also seen uh, a reversal in trends or expected trends for some occupations uh, where, such as food retail workers, where occupations might have been expected to decline or be partially replaced by technology. Uh, and that work has, has become uh, both essential, uh, but also still undervalued and underpaid. So through the, the past year, our team has looked at the, this question in a, in a couple of different ways. Uh, using data uh, from the Canadian survey on business conditions, uh, we found that only one quarter of businesses reported operating almost or entirely remotely, uh, much lower than the, the percentage of occupations that can be done remotely, uh, and that many businesses were still requiring at least some of their workers to come in in person. Anecdotally, we're hearing this includes everything from law offices and accounting firms to, to publishing or, or HR for big retail stores. And although the pandemic has prompted many businesses did not already have an online sales presence to adopt one, uh, we've seen only a 3% increase in Canada since 2019. So from six to 9% in businesses that made 60% of their total sales online. So it's not a, a, a wholesale transformation, um, even for the businesses uh, that, that, uh, that, are already, that are already making a, a significant chunk of their sales online. At the, the household level, uh, although technology has shaped many people's pandemic experience uh, from, from shifting to remote work and learning to, to uh, shopping online or uh, community spaces that have gone virtual, uh, access to home internet and devices is not universal. It's not always affordable or sufficiently fast and in particular for low income households. So for those that don't have access, uh, affordability or lack of device was the most commonly cited reason in a survey we did in Toronto in uh, November and December. And many reported that it was impacting um, their access to critical services, to government information, to, to banking, healthcare, education, and work. For those that, that do have home access, one third reported that they worried, worried some or a lot about paying their internet bill. And nearly 40% of the households we surveyed had speeds below 50 megabytes per second, which is the CRTC uh, minimum target for downloads. We also ran a, a small project looking at occupational risks of exposure uh, back in April 2020, which feels like a, a world away. Uh, the data for this modeling came from pre-COVID assessments of exposure to infectious disease in general. So this doesn't account for shifts such as remote work, uh, the use of PPE or, or the installation of, um, of air filtration uh, or the specific, um, specific airborne and circulation properties of COVID-19. Uh, but I'd say that the main takeaways remain the same, that, that occupational risk varies widely across sectors, occupations, individual workplaces, with uh, high rates among healthcare, education, and service jobs, such as bus drivers or trades, uh, and that COVID-19 remains very much an occupational disease. So we're seeing continued workplace outbreaks in Canada, particularly where work is in close quarters or indoors. Uh, and uh, increasingly, we're seeing that the many patients are experiencing uh, some long-term complications after their acute illness, uh, including needing to reduce work schedules or workplace accommodations, and in some cases, long-term sick leave. So COVID-19 is going to shape our workforce landscape for years to come, uh, including uh, potentially worker shortages in, in certain occupations, and in particular, occupations that, that had higher, um, higher rates of exposure and higher rates of illness. Yeah, so we have all of this information um, and we, I think we've all heard some pretty interesting statistics about how COVID and um, in general inequality is evolving in, um, in our context, but when it comes to policy or research or program design, how can we look at some of these perspectives, some of these factors uh, in, in in more comprehensive ways. Uh, and, and here I want to give an example uh, in some of our work um, that's our job pathways approach. For this suite of projects, we're looking at something that uh, we've both mentioned before, uh, looking at job transitions for people who have been displaced or face disruption in this work, in their work. Um, and, and, and here we really aim to identify potential and realistic pathways for, for mid-career workers, and in doing so, inform potential interventions. So, when we look at potential, when we look at realistic, what what are we thinking about? Uh, well, we're thinking about a range of factors. On the one hand, of course, we're looking at skills, 
Um, there's a wealth of skills data, of vacancy data that um, you know, it is useful to use, but often work in transitions only focuses on the skills required for occupations or official vacancies to gauge that supply, that demand. But there are also factors like individual preferences, barriers, employer uh, perceptions that affect transitions perhaps even more than the skills that um, a particular worker may have or a particular employer may be um, demanding. So in this suite of projects, we've, do, we've done some work in the GTA, we've done some work um, at the food retail level in Ontario, uh, and we're also um, about to apply it in the oil and gas sector in, in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, the, and that this makes part of our, kind of this, the entire um, suite of projects that are, uh, that are under this approach. Um, that's the slide. <laughs> uh, but what makes our approach uh, really unique and, com and comprehensive is, um, and if, if we flip to the next slide, um, it's, it's this list of three things. Um, it's the importance that it gives to place-based design, is the importance that it gives to human-centered design, um, and the flexibility of application across sectors, across workers, um, across regions, across occupations, uh, and even more. So uh, as Nisa mentioned, this is a pretty uh, pretty quick, pretty uh, high level look at some of our work um, in this narrative arc of, of looking a bit more comprehensively at, at the perspectives that we're seeing in, in the Canadian context. But this is really the type of work that we think allows for the inclusion of perspectives that are you know, sometimes ignored in, in larger scope data, uh, but also necessary for a more inclusive view and for um, the successful implementation of certain policies and programs um, for, for a larger impact. Um, and with that, uh, I'm gonna say thank you. And I think we're gonna give it back to our um, very, Nice uh, moderator, Nora, to, to see what questions we've got on this. Thanks very much, Diana and Nisa. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, I'm not seeing any questions in the q and I'll give it a minute or two, but, but I'll, I'll ask you a question um, based on your presentation. It was, it was uh, nice to see you expand the discourse around an effective transition beyond just skills and, and what people can learn and the skills that people need or, or that are missing. So, I mean, of course, skills are very important, but as we all know, uh, one doesn't learn skills or retain skills or transfer skills in a vacuum. There's lots going on around that that, can, that enables that to happen. Um, and what we, for example, at the University of Waterloo during COVID, we had over 8,000 students who were on work terms, they all had to transition to working remotely. These are highly capable, capable students with very strong technical skills. But it's some of those things around them that helped them make that transition. It was uh, employers who provided them with support, who provided them with lots of opportunities to, so, to be part of a social community, a community, even though they were working remotely now, and who also continued to give them meaningful work uh, that really tapped into what, what they were hoping to achieve. So when thinking about some of this, the other components required for this uh, ability to shift skills and move, especially when looking at inequality, I think about the capabilities that are required, such as adaptability and resilience. And wonder if you've given any thought to those, those almost reservoirs of energy that we tap into when we need to adjust and, and move in very, um, very quickly during times of disruption. And in situations where uh, an individual is facing a great deal of inequality, whether it's uh, socioeconomic conditions or, or um, other, culture, other cultural conditions that are going on that uh, are oppressive, that can be very difficult to have a deep reservoir of adaptability and resilience to tap into when one needs to adjust and move. But any, any thoughts that your research has shed light on that component or, or even perhaps our speaker from the OECD on that? Diana. Diana, 
And I'm, I'm, I'm just yeah, thinking yes, about those, with those five foundational skills, as well as the, the, the longer list of, of foundational skills that we, uh, we thought might be predictive of, of growth and whether resiliency was in them. So I think it's, it's really interesting. Uh, I, I was also thinking about that, Nita, and sorry, uh, there's this awkward moment where you were unmuted and I was like, do I go, do I not go? Um, but I, I think, I think it's a really interesting, um, I think it's a really interesting question because resiliency and adaptability is not, it's not really a, a skill. Like it is in some way, but it really depends on, you know, your home responsibilities. Do you have care responsibilities? Do you have, whether for um, children or, or seniors in your family or in your circle, in your community, do you have, um, do you have enough financial cushions to be able to say, okay, this shift was canceled. Maybe I'll adapt and look for another shift. Or do you, are you, are you able to, um, I, I guess all of the, this idea of resilience and adaptability. So we've got, on the one hand, we've got skills. We've got skills like, you know, the foundational skills that we were talking about um, that are teaching, that are persuasion, that are um, service orientation, um, brainstorming. All of these are kind of aspects of adaptability. So can you brainstorm solutions to a problem? Can you teach other people how to do something? Can you help others be adaptable? Um, can you uh, persuade people? Can you help them? Can you look for ways to help them? Um, and, and in some ways help your team, help your own cause. Uh, but I think what's important, I think that's why this human centered approach is, is so, so important because you know we can say, Yes, you need this level of brainstorming. You need this level of adaptability to new problems, to new questions, to do this job. But fortunately, life is about more than just doing this job. Um, and it goes so much broader than that. So great, we have data, we have information about what you need to do a particular job in a particular occupation. And you know that has all kinds of limitations, but you want to know, do workers, um, how can workers in this industry, in this occupation, in this region, uh, deal with care responsibilities? Uh, do shifts in this industry tend to be uh, flexible? Do you have to leave for extended periods of time? So I think it's something that, <laughs> nothing that you don't know, <laughs> but I think it's something that really changes from region to region, from type of worker to type of worker, from person to person. And I think putting the onus, what we're, the final point where I'm going with this is that putting the onus on an individual worker to be fully resilient, to be fully adaptable is not the way to go. Um, I think uh, our co-presenter has uh, their hand up as well. Um, <laughs> but so I'll, 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 I'll step back, but it, that's, that's really where I wanted to go. There, there are so many aspects that the owners really isn't just on the worker. No, absolutely. And I, I certainly our research has shown that too, that it, this is a shared responsibility. Um, individuals, organizations, governments, society at large, if we, if we want to be able to uh, have people who are adaptive and resilient, it's a multifaceted problem and not just um, as, you, as, as, as you very nicely put, Diana, just the individual. Um, Dr. Brooker, did you want to add anything to this or we have some more questions coming in? Just very briefly, maybe to pick up on that last thing that Diana said, which I think is so right. It's not just, it's unfair to put this on the individual. At the OECD, we've published the OECD job strategy. So we advise governments on how to achieve good labor market outcomes, where we good labor market outcomes are determined in terms of job quantity, quality, inclusiveness, but also in terms of resilience and adaptability. And I think we know quite a lot now about how we make labor markets adaptable and resilient because the labor markets are in a constant state of flux and people will always have to adapt. And I think it's really up to governments and policymakers to make sure that people have the tools 
to adapt. So whether it's social protection, whether it's training, whether it's social dialogue, which is equally important in terms of resilience and adaptability. I think all these aspects, aspects about employment regulation, employment protection, all of this, all of this builds a whole that makes labor markets adaptable and resilient. Mm -hmm. no, that, that's great. And uh, certainly many of, many of the points that you've raised, we identified in our future of work scorecard, community scorecard, as for communities to be able to look at these different dimensions to see, are they really future of work ready? And of course, training and ability to gain skills is only one dimension. All right, so I have a question coming in um, from Miles. Would the speakers talk a bit more about the issue of connectivity and its policy implications? First, what can be done to promote more access to high-speed internet? But on the other hand, what are the implications of being connected? Should workers have the right to disconnect? Mm. So we, in um, fall 2020, uh, with partners at the Ryerson Leadership Lab, ran a, a survey looking at uh, digital um, home, home internet access and home device access in the GTA. Uh, we picked the GTA for a couple of reasons. One that the city of Toronto uh, was interested in better understanding this problem and designing um, some government run solutions to, to help fill gaps. Uh, the second is because uh, so much of the conversation on the digital divide talks about rural and urban divides. And we were interested in understanding um, the, the nuances and the details of what the divide looks like in a big urban center where the problem isn't infrastructure, um, like every, every house in Toronto could potentially have internet in it. Um, the problem is um, affordability. It's that uh, uh, plans are not available at the, the speeds that people need at the price that they can pay. Um, and that they do not always have uh, functioning uh, or uh, enough devices uh, for, for household members. And we saw a, a pretty drastic shift in the pandemic where a household that used to get by on a single uh, laptop or a couple of smartphones uh, suddenly was potentially needing one device per, per person, including uh, elementary school children. Uh, and so we came out of that project feeling very strongly that uh, the problem was not uh, a problem of infrastructure, that the problem was a, was a affordability um, and that it was, it was imperative to find ways to uh, ensure that um, every household in Canada uh, can not just have internet but afford to pay their bill. Um, in terms of the, the implications of that, um, we, we heard from survey respondents um, that it was uh, significantly impacting their access to information and to services. Um, many of the, the people who said that they didn't have home internet, said that they used to use the public library. Um, and in many parts of the country, um, that access has been either limited or, or completely inaccessible. Uh, they also reported that they used to use it either at work or in other people's houses. And again, many of those, th those access points no longer exist. And so I think uh, the, the other part of that conversation is how do, you, how do you fill the gap that community organizations and public libraries and those kinds of uh, drop in access points uh, we're filling in, in a context where we, we can't gather uh, safely indoors. Right. Okay. And there is another question that's come in. I know we are just this, I'm going to get this just under the wire. Okay. And this one's near and dear to my heart. Is there enough exchange between industry and the academic community to address skill levels? Anyone want to tackle that one? It's a million dollar question. Any thoughts on that, uh, Dr. Broker or Diana? I can talk in very general terms about this. I mean, we, we certainly know from OECD evidence by where we, I mean, that's what we do. We compare different countries and policies. And what, what, what we do know is, especially when you talk about school to work transitions, we know that countries where there is a very close link between the world of education and the world of work, young people tend to have a better transition. So. You know, whether it's about doing internships, whether it's about jointly designing curricula, whether it's about having um, uh, apprenticeships training, these countries tend to have better school to work transitions. But also going back to the topic we discussed earlier, uh, which is about displacement. And we, we again, we know that in, in countries where social partners work together, so employers and unions and governments and education institutions, find solutions, not just to workers being displaced, but in some cases also to skill shortages. I think in, in, in countries where 
all these stakeholders work together, we tend to see smoother outcomes. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. And uh, I think we'll end on that note. And, and of course, as, as one of the uh, world's largest co-op programs at the University of Waterloo, of course, our connections to industry are very strong and we take it very seriously and our graduate outcomes are very positive. Now, a reminder, uh, tomorrow we will be picking up this conversation again with part two of this topic. And I do welcome you all to join us again tomorrow at one o'clock where we have an, an, a wonderful panel coming to speak tomorrow. And I believe we have um, Savas Chamberlain who would like to make a comment. And I also wanted to thank Mr. Chamberlain for the support of this event um, and the, the foundation that has enabled this event to happen. If you would like to make a comment, do you want to come forward and do that at this time before we? Yeah, off? yes, of course. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Nora. And uh, my message is directed to all the participants. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a great, uh, a great, uh, uh, good analysis and good ideas and good uh, uh, true uh, numbers. Uh, we have. Uh, we have uh, seen, but my message to the to the participants is that uh, uh, obviously you have uh, many ideas. Also, you have also questions. I encourage you to uh, to share these ideas and the questions uh, and initiate discussion with your friends uh, on the multimedia. And uh, also, I like to share you. Uh, I like to encourage you to share your ideas also with your local MP. Uh, you can also uh, send it to other uh, um, uh, government officials. Uh, it's important uh, really to initiate and uh, lou loudly uh, uh, produce a loud voice with respect to our, ide our, our, our ideas about income inequality, wealth distribution, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, technological uh, changes and how it affects our society. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. Um, is there going to be someone from the CIC Waterloo branch who will be closing off the day? I think John may want to say something. Is if John's John going to close off the day? Okay. John? On behalf of the uh, Canadian International Council, Waterloo Branch. We want to thank you all for having uh, been with us this afternoon. And as Nora has mentioned, we have another full day, three hours from 1 till 4 p.m. tomorrow. The key things are you use the same link that you've used today to access the programming. As noted, there's a special web space where you can catch the program bios and a good deal of uh, extensive supporting information supplied by various speakers and uh, panelists. We thank the Savas Chamberlain Family Foundation for the support of this event. We all look forward to seeing you back tomorrow for uh, the conclusion of this two-day program. Thanks for being with us. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Laszlo Sarkany, and I'm the uh, president of the Waterloo branch of the Canadian International um, uh, Council. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here, and I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, second uh, very exciting day of uh, roundtables. Uh, the only the, the dealing with extremely topical and important uh, um, uh, issues facing um, us, us all. A, a big, uh, a heartfelt welcome to our audience. Thank you so much for joining us, and of course, a heartfelt thank you and welcome to our distinguished speakers, including. Our, uh, our national fellow Elizabeth VVA. Um, I would like to extend our gratitude uh, again to the Savage Chamberlain Foundation uh, for um, their gen gen generous support. Um, and uh, just to report back, uh, yesterday I had the opportunity to attend a national uh, president's forum of, of our other CIC branches and uh, other presidents uh, sending their um, regards. And um, uh, and we've advertised um, and, and uh, brought the attention of our membership to this uh, a very important uh, um, uh, um, a series of uh, uh, talks and panels. So. Thank you so much for, for your attendance. Thank you so much for your participation. And without further ado, I'd like to use, uh, hand it over to Nora McRae, who is going to be our moderator. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Laszlo, um, for the introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Uh, again, as I was yesterday, my name is Nora McRae. 
I'm the Associate Provost for Cooperative and Experiential Education at the University of Waterloo. And uh, this topic of, um, of technological change, the COVID pandemic and the impact on the future of work, all of these are really of great interest to us at the University of Waterloo and certainly in my space where we connect students and what they're learning to the world of work. And we're very concerned and, and uh, making sure that we prepare them for the future of work in a good way. Uh, this is part two of this topic, uh, rapid technological change. And part one, as many of you know, if you were there, uh, we had two excellent speakers, uh, Dr. Brooke from OECD and Diana Rivera and Nisa Mali from the Brookfield Institute, who spoke yesterday about uh, their perspectives on the future of work, um, digitalization, the impact of COVID and inequalities, and it, wonderful presentations from, from the two of them. And, uh, and I think they're with us today to get, carry on the conversation with our terrific panelists. So we have three panelists this afternoon who will be providing remarks and then there'll be an opportunity for engagement between and amongst the panelists. And then of course, for questions that you can pop into the Q&A and uh, we'll try to get to your questions and have this to be as an engaging as uh, an opportunity as possible. So the three panelists, I'll introduce them as uh, Ruth Castelbranco, who's the manager of the Future of Work Project from the Southern Center of Inequality Studies at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. We have Caitlin McGregor, who's the Chief Executive Officer from Plum here in Waterloo, and Dr. Elizabeth Vallet, who's a CIC Fellow and Director, Center of Geopolitical Studies, and Raoul Dunduran Chair at the University of Quebec of Montreal, in Montreal and Associate Professor of the Royal Military College, Saint Jean, Quebec. So three fabulous panelists. And I would like to invite uh, Ruth Castel Branco, if she's ready, to provide uh, her comments as our first panel speaker. Go ahead, Ruth. Thanks very much, Nora. Um, and thank you to the CIC for the invitation. Right. Um, so I will be speaking about digital technologies in the future of work, a view from the global south. Um, has it moved on to the next slide on your end? Yeah, great. Okay. Yes, it has. Um, and I want to locate this conversation within a, a sort of a debate a, in the literature. So on one hand, we have a position which has been advanced by the World Bank in its latest World Development Report, well, actually of 2019, that argues that digital technologies will increase productivity, promote rapid growth, improve the delivery of public services, and that they also have the added benefits for workers of increasing flexibility for women to, of being able to balance productive and reproductive activities and so on. Um, and that states can take steps to support workforces to develop new skills centered on problem solving, teamwork, and adaptability. And that there's also a role for social security and that one needs to reimagine social security moving away from a focus on social insurance, though it's not always clear towards what some form of publicly funded social welfare. Um, the, the second position is one that's advanced by Anner Umarani and others, which is that actually what's happened is that digital technologies have concentrated capital by facilitating the convergence of activities previously dispersed across industries and geographies. And that in this context, multinational corporations have been able to increase their monopoly power based on value extraction rather than value creation. Um, even if capital still derives the greater part of surplus value from commodity production. And here we can think, for instance, about the Amazons of the world, right? And that this process is likely to exacerbate the decades long tendency towards non standard and informal employment. Um, and, and this is a major concern, obviously, in the context of South Africa, um, where I am based, which has been marked by a rapid decline in employment in agriculture, mining, and manufacturing with automation um, and, and an increase in the service sector. Though, as I will discuss later, um, um, many of these jobs are highly casualized, that they're essentially gig jobs. And with the COVID pandemic, what we saw in South Africa was a dramatic loss of employment of almost 3 million jobs, many, the majority of which have, have, have not returned. Um, this is obviously given the legacy of apartheid, a racialized process, but it's also highly gendered. Women 
um, were disproportionately affected by job losses. And the latest employment numbers show that 75% of young people are unemployed. Now, the assumptions for the research that we're undertaking at the Future of Workers Research Project at the Southern Center for Inequality Studies, I just wanted to, to highlight some of them because I think we are locating ourselves somewhere between these two poles that I've identified in the literature. So the first is to recognize that technological innovation often takes place in spurts and that we are in, in, in a current moment of, 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 of real sort of acceleration of technological change. Um, and, and this change has centered around um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Many of the techniques our colleagues in the engineering department at the University of the Witwatersrand argue um, are actually not very new, but they are uh, proliferating in unprecedented ways. Um, but that we also see both the development of digital technology and its application. So those basic political economy questions, what is produced, how it is produced, and for whom, as, as political rather than technical or technological questions. And we see it as a, as a contested terrain between capital and labor in the widest sense of, of, the, of the, both those words that both reflects and reproduces structures of power, but is also not unidirectional nor necessarily predetermined. And so that means that a focus on contentious politics and the ways that digital technologies are developed and applied is really important. And it's also our contention that many of these contradictions are perhaps more, more evident in the global South. And I say perhaps because in fact, <laughs> Uh, many of the debates around the future of work remain and, and are perhaps necessarily so speculative, right? Um, but it's important for us as the Southern Center for Inequality Studies to recognize that the global South is extremely diverse in terms of the levels of economic development, the degrees of digital penetration, labor market structures, and thus the impact of digitalization, as well as the balance of power between labor and capital and the possibilities or limitations of, uh, of social dialogue in that process. And I think that's something that was raised yesterday. And that obviously in all these contexts, but especially in the global South, the first, second, third, and fourth industrial revolutions often coexist. So if we look at a number of different countries of the global south. These are some of the countries that we are focusing currently on at the Southern Center, Ghana, Mozambique, Kenya, South Africa, Colombia, India, and Ethiopia. You see that there's a huge range in terms of access to cell phone use, access to the internet, and access to mobile banking. I'm originally from Mozambique, and in Mozambique, only 10% of people have access to the internet, right? Which is in marked contrast, to levels of internet coverage in Colombia. And the, and the reasons for this that have been raised, and there's some really great work that has been done by ICT Africa, um, which is also like us funded by the IDRC. Um, so the reasons for this include, of course, weak infrastructure, poor services, high cost of data, but it also includes other aspects, levels of literacy, right? Power relations in the household, and that in, some countries, among some respondents, people saw them, saw digital technologies as unnecessary, right? So the, the, the way the digital technologies um, is reshaping the world of work is, is also shaped by a range of other factors that are, are, are or forces, right? That, that are defining the, the, the direction of, 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 of economic development and the kinds of jobs. And these include um, choices about the nature of economic development. Much of the African continent relies on resource-driven development, uh, financialization, global restructuring. And so digitalization is being mapped onto that, right? And so our research questions and some of the findings that I'm gonna present here are really centered around three elements. One is, how are digital technologies reshaping the world of work and workers? How are workers redefining the terms of digitalization, considering that in fact, this is a contested terrain? And how can states in the global South use their regulatory and redistributive power to advance decent work in the digital economy? And some of the, our findings were somewhat surprising. Um, and, and I should say that we're really in, in, the, uh, in the second year 
uh, of this research and, and, and there's future research coming, but some of our initial findings were surprising. So the first is, and of course it makes sense, is that automation and, and the application, the development and application of, of machine learning requires some level of investment and that firms' decisions to invest are based on calculations related to profitability and labor costs. South Africa has, has and has had for the last decade low levels of capital accumulation and investment in the manufacturing sector. So automation is most common in manufacturing sectors that are reliant on foreign investment, where there's pressure to adopt fit for purpose robots. So we're talking about the auto industry, mining, agriculture, um, and, and specifically around tasks that are repetitive, but it's far less common in the service sector or in the manufacturing sector where you're having domestic investment or among tasks that require either manual dexterity or, or what one calls abstract labor. Um, and, and of course, social dialogue or contentious politics shape the terms of automation, the kinds of concessions that workers are able to receive, retraining and so on, and apprenticeship programs, et cetera. Um, we also are then looking at platform work. Um, and, and here, uh, there's been work among my colleagues, Eddie Webster and Fikile Masikane, and sorry, that should say 2020, not 2010, that looks at the Uberization of work using Uber Eats as a, as a case study. And what we've seen is that there's um, been a systematic misclassification of, of, of workers as independent contractors. And yet, workers also appreciate the autonomy of being independent contractors, which poses some interesting conundrums for the trade union movement. As you think about how to organize workers, but also how, how to convince workers who see themselves as entrepreneurs in some moments and as workers and others to join membership organizations, right? But, but if we look at the conditions of work and, and, and these are, are, are not new, some of them were raised in yesterday's discussion already. So uh, uh, platform workers, particularly on location, uh, platform workers are subject to the invisible authoritarian algorithmic management, not authorization, apologies, which assigns tasks, tracks performance, determines pay, and can terminate employment unilaterally. And in fact, one of the big demands among Uber Eats strikers in Johannesburg has been uh, the ability to have due process when being uh, terminated from an app. Right now, apps can simply eliminate you without any of the kinds of protections that exist in the labor law. The, the other is that they provide platform services and produce, produce value for the app on a regular basis. Um, so this is not a sort of ad hoc side hustle and they are economically dependent on the app and cannot work independently. And finally, they do not generally own the means of production. The app is the means of production, not the car. And as, as Darcy Dutoy um, at the University uh, of, of the Western Cape has pointed out, a car is, is not a business, right? And oftentimes these are then bound up in, in, in these leasing relationships. The conditions of work for on location based platform, long working hours, low wages, though interestingly, not necessarily between the below the national minimum wage. And this points to the fact that in South Africa, having a job um, that, that complies with standard labor regulations may not actually ensure that families are able to meet their basic needs precisely because labor protections have been pared back so much that in fact, um, platform workers do sometimes earn above that level, but they have to absorb the risk of all of the, the operational costs. And that then leads um, to indebtedness. Obviously, there's also a lack of paid leave, including maternity leave, which is a gender issue, lack of social security benefits, and occupational health and safety protections, which is especially important given how dangerous these jobs often are. Um, and obviously, what we see is that, is that these sectors reproduce social inequalities around gender, race, and immigration. And in fact, in the sample study of Uber Eats um, drivers in, in Johannesburg, what we saw is that the vast majority are un undocumented immigrants from other areas, which raises some important challenges in terms of thinking about regulating the sector and extending labor and social protections if we don't at the same time 
think about immigration and immigration um, uh, laws. Now, I just wanted, this actually doesn't come from me, it comes from the ILO, but I find it very useful. And I just wanted to point out two things. It's from their excellent report on platform work, which I recommend that everyone checks out if you haven't read it. So the first thing is the digital platforms are extremely diverse and there's certainly small and medium companies that are part of it, but it's highly concentrated. So 96% of the investment is in, in, in Asia, North America, and Europe, and 70% of the revenues generated go to the United States and, and China. And so then the question for us on the African continent is, well, where does that put us? It's also important to distinguish between online-based and location-based platforms. And, and I think here what's interesting is that actually location-based platforms, your Uber Eats, are far more visible and, and, and bring into, into the connections far more local enterprises, right? The, both the demand and the supply for the thing that is being transmitted is, is, is local. Whereas online-based platforms tend to be invisible workers that are highly educated um, and, and include disproportionate, many more women than, than in location-based platforms, but where the demand generally originates from the global north and supply from the global south, and there's a huge discrepancy in wages. Um, and so both of these have opportunities, but also limitations in terms of organizing and improving the conditions of work. Um, the other set of findings is that there are, of course, new forms of organizing that are emerging. And so in South Africa, there have been numerous strikes, successful strikes by Uber Eats drivers um, who are organized around hybrid collectives. Um, often developed along national lines and, and located at each one of the locations, but who connect with other locations using WhatsApp and engage in what we call digital direct action by logging off, right? So this is your standard strategy of staying away, but you're staying away on the app. Um, and it has worked at, at, at different moments in getting concessions, sometimes much more quickly than a contentious face-to-face -face strike has. Um, but these hybrid collectives also provide mutual aid, including, you know, support uh, during after accidents, which are actually quite common with Uber Eats because they use motorcycles or, or funeral benefits and so on. And Webster and Masikani conclude that there is this potential for structural association and societal power. We've also seen the emergence of new forms of organizing that are affiliated with the Central Workers Union, as is the case in Colombia. And so the emergence of the union app Unidad of, of RAPI workers that emerged with support from NGOs, but then affiliated with, with the labor movement and has begun to organize transnationally because of course RAPI is a transnational company and an example of one that's emerged from Colombia and then expanded elsewhere. And we've also seen then, and, and there's many cases in the US, but, but I wanted to highlight one from the African continent, the emergence of cooperative apps um, uh, among, among workers. And, and in Uganda, you have one for the Boda Boda drivers, uh, which, which was developed with support from the Amalgamated Transport General Workers Union that was able to increase um, their membership dramatically from a fledgling 5,000 workers to more than 100,000. There's a fantastic study on this by the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. Um, and, and, and shows that there the, the sort of is a strategic growth area. And, and, and these apps allow you both uh, to facilitate the business, so to messenger passengers um, and, and courier, um, et, et cetera, but also to pay your membership. And so it means that it's much easier than other informal worker organizing in terms of, of securing union dues. But of course, it's expensive to manage. It requires some rethinking around the structures. And there's a digital divide. Not all Boda Boda drivers have access to the smartphone, have access um, to this app. Um, there's obviously also a lot of work that we're doing around the regulatory and redistributive role of the state and thinking about four elements. So labor protections and how you extend these to um, Uber Eats uh, uh, drivers and, 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 and other platform workers more generally in the context of South Africa, social protections, consumer protections and, and questions around data protection laws, but also immigrant rights. Um, because if these ultimately cannot be extended um, to undocumented immigrants who make up the bulk of some of the sectors of platform work, then they are in fact of, of very little value. Now, we've also done some work around 
and social protection. And there's a lot of interest now in universal basic income. And, and obviously there's benefits um, to universal basic income, I think, which, which are not new to this particular audience. They provide income security for those precariously connected to, the, to, to formal labor markets. They would reduce poverty and potentially inequality depending on, on the value. Um, they would enable people to engage in socially meaningful activities outside of the labor market. And, and, and there's many of the pitfalls of the current system which it avoids. But, but I think you know, we also have to be very careful about what the UBI actually is. And, and, and our argument is that a UBI is only meaningful if it's set at a meaningful level, which would be for us around the poverty line. If we conceive of it as additional to rather than a replacement to for existing forms of welfare provisioning. In other words, that we don't replace some of the, the core commitments of social policy to equality of outcome with UBI, which is really about equality of opportunity, right? We want to keep the debates around equality of outcome and that recognizes the welfare provisioning is just part of a broader set of labor, social and consumer protections aimed at increasing the social wage and improvising working and improving working conditions. However, there are some challenges and one of the case countries that we focus on and where my work personally is on is Mozambique. You know, how does a country, one of the poorest in the world, how would it be able to introduce um, a, a UBI? And here there's some costing that I did. Um, and, and we see that a UBI um, introduced to all at the level of, of what the cash transfers for the COVID response were, which was the PASDPE, that, that would be equivalent to 129% of the national budget, right? So regardless of how much political will there is, it is not a feasible approach. It's not a feasible response in the context of Mozambique. Um, and, and this really raises a, a conundrum and highlights that you know, the, ultimately the process of redistribution cannot be disarticulated from processes of production over uh, you know, both it's the redistributive basis, but also we, we need consumption, right? So th there's key questions around um, the, how production is organized that are about digitalization, but they're about how that fits in within broader questions around industrial policy and so on. We're still, as I said at the very beginning, um, and, and our second round of research is just starting now, and we're particularly interested in these five themes, digital capital and the corporation, labor process, conditions of work, worker organizing and policy regulations in these five sectors. Because I think that looking at these five sectors will then allow us to tease out some of the surprises and some of the contradictions. But I'll leave it there for now. And thank you so much for inviting me to, to attend. Thank you very much, Ruth, for your uh, comprehensive and very thought-provoking presentation. Uh, and I would welcome Caitlin McGregor, if Caitlin's available, to be our next panel speaker. Thanks, Caitlin. Hi, so my name's Caitlin McGregor. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a tech company called Plum. Uh, we're based out of Waterloo, Ontario. And what we've done is taken best practices from industrial organizational psychology and really democratized access to this highly predictive information so that we can, as employers of often enterprise sized companies, make better talent decisions, both in terms of who is hired as well as how to better support existing employees. And I was really impressed by uh, the speakers uh, yesterday and, and Ruth today, you know, really talking about the future of work and how so much of how we've seen and dealt with talent in the past is rapidly changing and will continue to change. And I think that, you know, anybody that's followed future of work um, kind of research, if we think about three years ago, the predominant message that was coming out of future of work research was the importance of what has been called in the past soft skills. Um, we've heard them also be called durable skills as they are the most durable over time in contrast to kind of hard skills and, and past experience and really looking at the shelf life. If we think about developers five years ago, Ruby on Rails was the hard skill that everyone was looking for. Whereas now, you know, the only reason why you'd be looking for a Ruby on Rails uh, developer is if you're trying to keep an old system on life support. It really is already outdated and it's gone from being the hottest thing to now completely irrelevant in just a few years. Whereas we're seeing all the future of work research coming out and it's definitely mentioned yesterday, 
talking about the importance of problem solving and the ability to communicate and be persuasive and be adaptive. These are all those soft skills or, you know, it's really what's innate to people and transferable from one job to the next. And what, you know, has been really interesting is that in this space, we've been talking for three solid years about the importance of these transferable uh, innate, we, we call them talents at Plum, things like innovation and communication, like we said, persuasion and uh, teamwork. What's been interesting with COVID is that companies were feeling like the future of work was something that they needed to think about maybe a decade from now. And COVID has really accelerated the need to focus on those transferable talents. We're seeing enterprise companies going through what is often called a lift and shift. The need to take employees that were doing one job and now because their companies are trying to you know, meet new business objectives and certain parts of their business were, became irrelevant and new parts of their business became more important, they're trying to figure out how to realign their existing talent to new business objectives. And so they're taking people that maybe would have been doing one job in the organization and now trying to understand if they will be successful in a new role and whether or not they can move those people into a brand new role, regardless of what they've done in the past. We often talk about our client Whirlpool. You know, they were a manufacturer of appliances with retail distribution partnerships. With COVID coming along, you know, they're now a tech company and as a result, a cybersecurity company because all of their Internet of Things devices can be hacked. So now they have to be experts in cybersecurity and there's no retail distributions partnerships. It's now all online. So they had to become an e-commerce company. So Whirlpool with their thousands and thousands of employees can decide to either let go of all of their old employees that, you know, met their old business model or whether or not they can repurpose their employees to do new things. And it comes back now, not just from the literature and a decade from now, it's about the future work. It's a practical problem that they have to decide, can I take somebody that was doing job A that is no longer relevant to the business and can I move them into job B, C, or D? And it really starts to be about, you know, it is too costly to go out and rip and replace these employees. It's much better to be able to look at your existing people that understand the company, understand, you know, have that knowledge of the customer, have that knowledge of that company culture, have all of that institutional knowledge, and then be able to move them into new roles. As we hear a lot about upskilling and reskilling. And a lot of the times when I heard conversations five years ago on, on uh, you know, there was a TED talk talking about, let's just take every coal miner and train them to be software developers. And that's a great you know, concept of upskilling, but in practice, maybe only 2% of coal miners are going to be successful at software development. It comes back to understanding what transferable innate talents will make somebody successful regardless of the role they're in. And, and the piece that I think that you know, I contribute to the conversation is saying, you know, we talk a lot about soft skills and the importance of them, but people aren't talking enough about measuring them quantifying them. There is a science behind this. It is an entire field of industrial organizational psychology. There are 6,000 industrial organizational psychologists, PhDs in the world that have spent their life's work figuring out how to quantify this, not just on the individual's level, but also understanding, getting away from job descriptions that are constantly outdated, but understanding the behavioral needs that you need somebody to be successful. When we talk about, you know, do you need somebody that is gonna sit down and just check off a to-do list and be self-driven to get that done with no supervision? Or do you need somebody who is great at being able to understand how to work effectively with teams and to collaborate and to solve problems as a group because there was no answer before. The only way they're gonna come up with an answer is to collaborate with others and, and to get to the heart of teamwork understanding the behaviors that are actually fundamental to success is how we predict future performance. When we look at things like where somebody went to school and previously worked, that's actually about eligibility. And when you talk about upskilling, it's not about eligibility. It's about how long will it take if you give somebody the training for them to be eligible. But if you want to be able to predict performance, it's not about the eligibility. It's about will they be set up to thrive? Are you taking somebody that naturally loves coming, with out, coming up with out-of-the-box ideas 
And are you putting them in a role that requires them coming up with out of the box ideas? Or are you taking that really innovative person and putting them into a role where there's already a defined process and they're just a cog in a machine, which will lead to burnout. So I'm gonna kind of wrap up this part because I, I want us to get into a healthy discussion uh, on the panel, but you know, a big thing for people to recognize is that one of the things that's not being talked about enough is that the projections right now from various studies are saying that 50% of employees are going to be looking for a new job in the next 12 to 18 months. We are going to see a fundamental change in the workforce post COVID where, or you know, the US is definitely in a post COVID mindset. I'm not sure we're, we're quite there in, in Canada yet, but the reality is we're moving into a new phase where people are trying to bookend the trauma of COVID and move on to something where they can say that was the past and we're now moving into the future. And part of that is that they wanna end that you know, situation where they are now in a state of burnout, over 50% of people are saying that they are burnt out is the top performers that are the ones saying that they are most burnt out. They're looking for a new opportunity. So we are having this mass exodus of employees leaving, which means that we have an opportunity, we need to, the if, uh, companies are forced to redefine the employee employer relationship where for the first time the employee has more power than they ever have and they're asking to be seen and heard and understood and to be set up for success to not be put in situations that drain them and lead to burnout but for whatever their potential is to be optimized and utilized in the in their employee in their job every day you know they really we are moving into a world where the future of work means for the first time we can start to be in a place where we really truly enable people and help them to realize their full potential. And that is exciting opportunity to help people realize their full potential, to be, start to use data that is not relying on what school somebody went to or where they previously worked, but relying on data that says, we're gonna look for the most innovative people in the world to work on these innovative projects. We're gonna look for the people that are best at collaborating and put them in teams. And we're seeing this happen in large organizations. Scotiabank right now, if you are a new graduate, you are no longer applying with a resume. You are completing a plum profile, which is psychometric data, all about people's innate you know, transferable talents, problem solving, social intelligence and personality mixed together. And it is about if you have the behavioral fit to be successful and they are looking at not the role you applied to, but what roles in the company you could thrive. So the change is happening and this really allows us to start hiring and nurturing people based on their potential and getting rid of the data that is embedded with systemic barriers and biases, which is that historical data that is found on a resume. And so I think there's an exciting change that has been forced by COVID and we're gonna see more and more of this as employers have to change the way they're doing things if they're gonna retain their talent. I'm done. Great, thank you so much, Caitlin. That was lovely. Well done. Uh, and if I could ask uh, Dr. Vallee now to present her remarks, that would be fabulous. Dr. Vallee. Thank you very much. Bonjour à tous. Je suis honorée d'être là aujourd'hui. I'm honored to be uh, among the, the speakers. I uh, will be sharing my screen and um, I hope you can see the, the screen uh, and I'll be talking about the the impact of the uh, the pandemic on borders uh, and border fortifications. Um, as you all know, in March 2020, uh, more than 91% of the population was living in a country that had border restrictions. And 39% uh, and of that world population was living in a country where you could not neither go out or come in, which trapped many uh, people, migrants, but also asylum seekers, uh, them in sort of no man's land where they were stuck. And that's interesting to see how inequalities just hit right there because you could just as before the pandemic the people who could travel freely around the world were mainly most of us as i see us uh, being white uh, people from the northern hemisphere or from richer countries uh, we had the the ability to be able to be mobile uh, when the pandemic hit we had the ability to choose 
to be not mobile, which was not the case of uh, migrants and asylum seekers who were either caught, trapped, or had to be mobile because they had to go to work and they were the people uh, helping in um, older people's homes. So um, being able to choose your mobility is uh, a privilege, but in the, in the case of a pandemic, it's even more so. Um, and what was interesting in that case is that one of the first reflex of during the pandemic was to close the borders. So to address uh, the pandemic as a matter of national security, uh, instead of addressing it as the global a phenomenon. And it um, actually, it was not the first time um, that, um, oh, and this is the map, of course, I, I thought it would be relevant to compare what has happened in March 2020 and what we can see now. So there are still a lot of border restrictions that do have a, a, an impact on the way we travel uh, and, and the mobility we can enjoy. Um, and of course, this is linked. And I think it's interesting to go back in history and to look how um, the, the trajectories of pandemics have already affected mobility and, and the virus is by definition mobile. So it is um, an interesting reflex to close borders um, to, as almost a, a first measure uh, rather than uh, totally um, immerse ourselves in contact tracing, tracing, which is what has been done, let's say, with Ebola. Uh, there, were, there has been some border closures, but contact tracing uh, was, uh, and isolation was one of the first um, uh, measures put in place. And what's even more interesting is to see that um, the pandemics have, are by definition global, and by definition border closures has been almost a reflex. And I like that picture. It's the last uh, event of the plague in Europe. And the reflex at the time was when the, the plague arrived in Toulon, uh, was to erect a border, a border wall, Le Mur de la Peste, as you can see here. And it was in 1720. And by the time the wall was completed in 1722, the plague was all over the place. So virus don't, uh, don't care for either border fortification or border walls. Um, and we have seen that reflex of bordering and rebordering, uh, even in sudden, at a subnational level. And that map has been designed by Alex McPhee, who is a, uh, a student in Calgary, and he was willing to keep a track for uh, indigenous people, actually, so that they would know where to, uh, how their community was protected. Uh, and that was really the, the first matter of his map was to be able to uh, identify border closures within uh, the provinces, between provinces, but also in accessing uh, indigenous communities. And that reflects of rebordering um, those communities, um, bands councils have had had the memory of those um, plagues per se brought by uh, um, the Westerners and they, the reflex of rebordering those community, those reservations uh, was uh, implemented because the elders had the memory of those, um, of those um, um, events. Um, but this um, bordering and rebordering happens has happened very fast, and we've seen that it it can it has changed the way we see borders. And of course, we've seen border closures before, and as we all know, just crossing from here in Montreal into uh, into the U.S. to go to Burlington used to be an easy thing. Uh, people before 9-11 used to wave us through on the U.S. border. So this used to be a, a relatively soft border, but the change that has been implemented by 9-11, um, which was uh, imposing a passport on most of us, uh, is a change that we will see more and more and will be, become more common, common with the pandemic because we will be um, including biometric data in the passports and related to vaccination or testing or even contact tracing. So this will also be a tool that will limit the mobility of those that we expect maybe to be less mobile or that we don't want as a northern, a northern country uh, to, to be uh, mobile because there is a, a, a relationship to mobility that uh, a state have implemented. Uh, anything that is not fixed 
or that can be fixed at one point, nomadism, is considered as a threat. Um, so this will further the trend we've seen since 9-11 with that aspect of quick bordering and rebordering, which is what we've seen uh, last Christmas when the um, a, a, a virus mutation has been registered in the UK and almost immediately in a matter than, of less than four days, most borders around the country have closed, uh, meaning that this uh, movement of border closure and this implementation of more and more biometric data uh, will be uh, will be uh, taken into account. Will be more of a, a, a current uh, trend when we are looking at border crossing. And also the, um, the use of technology, which is what we've seen in Taiwan. Taiwan has been uh, cross uh, matching um, databases from immigration, tourism and health and has been uh, has designed a, a way to assess very quickly the level of risks. Of, of people entering the country, um, even before they were on the, on the uh, on on Taiwanese territory, and the externalization of the border is something that we see more and more. So we keep people as far away from our borders than we can to in order to be able to assess their acceptability and miscibility in the country. And of course, that has an impact, uh, um, um, an heavier impact on uh, poorer people and people who need to be mobile and not those who choose to be mobile. And I, I've always felt that this, I, I, we need to see the pandemic in the continuum of what has happened since 9-11, but I, also as an accelerator of what is going on. This picture, of course, is, has been taken pre-pandemic in the enclave of, Mel of Melilla, which is a Spanish enclave, hence EU enclave uh, in Morocco. And what you see is uh, are those Spaniards uh, playing golf while you have people from sub-Saharan Africa on the fence, there is a border wall there, trying to fall on the right-hand side of, uh, on, the, on the right side of the wall. Um, and this trend we've seen across um, um, history, and even more so since 9-11, uh, reflects a, a movement of border fortification um, that we have documented and shows that every time you have an event, uh, namely 9-11 or the Arab Spring, uh, it will trigger a, 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 uh, a movement, a trend of further fortification. Of course, those are just border walls, so border infrastructures around the world, and there are more than uh, 70 around the world uh, today. Um, and, uh, but it, it is surrounded with many um, technological features, uh, sensors, cameras, thermic, thermical cameras, and there is an entire um, security military complex uh, that is uh, multinational and benefiting from that, but also furthering uh, inequalities. Consequences of what we have seen so far through border uh, fortification, and that is being accelerated by the pandemic, is the militarization of the border. We speak more and more of the Mexicanization, although I do not like the word, but it's being used in the literature, the Mexicanization of the northern border. And there are some documents that uh, do project a possible fencing slash walling of the Canadian border with the US. So it's not happening yet, but it is uh, on many desks at the Pentagon and at DHS. Um, and the militarization of the border leads to further inequalities when let's say we're using technology um, drones, for instance, but also armed robots. So an algorithm making the decision to kill or let live somebody who comes across the border because it is assessing the level of danger by itself. Um, and of course, discourses are changing. We've seen um, the idea of all the, 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 the discourses on the Indian variant, the um, British variant, all this is attached to a nationalism of the border. The external, the other is the danger. And this is, uh, 
getting more and more evident. And there is a singular contrast between the, the book of Kennedy, A Nation of Immigrants, where immigration is seen as something positive, where you have um, either Fox News, but also you know, current um, um, reality show talking about border wars or uh, you know, those border realities, which are not seen through the, the prism of, of um, what, what borderlands can bring to the discourse. And that's interesting to see how, let's say people in Burlington watch hockey on CBC because this is what they relate to and uh, the, their own national network. Uh, but rather seeing that in terms of, of walling and separating and fencing. And of course, fractured borderlands, that has an impact. And as borders are have closed, they will slowly reopen. There will be some scars of that bordering process, rebordering process. And this, again, will impact uh, lower, lower wage people. And as a consequence, there is more violence of, at the border. Um, we have documented that with my team uh, along the Texas border, for instance, just as an example, what you see on the left hand side of the screen is a little love jacket for a kid of four to five years old, and it was on the on the side of the Rio Grande so people had put their kids in that life jacket to cross the Rio Grande. And I have swam in the Rio Grande, which is not the healthiest thing I've done in my life, but I can tell you that the currents are really, really high and I would not take my kid unless it would be safer for me to cross the Rio Grande with my kid rather than staying on the Mexican side. And of course, there will always be routes going around the constraints. So what you see here are the routes that are the migratory routes that have been designed along the years to avoid uh, border closures. But you will see more and more of those as the borders of the pandemic will stay partially closed. And once again, you have to think that it costs maybe up to $15,000 to be able to take one of those routes, namely the equivalent of a business uh, flight from one side to another, which is interesting. It costs the same thing, but the, the difficulty of crossing it is much higher. Um, and I, 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 I want to, uh, Show you those pictures to show you that a a border a border fence or border wall or border barrier or whatever border fortification whether virtual or real can always be uh, transgressed we can always go around so it is an illusion to believe that technology uh, and infrastructure will allow to slow down the flows and one of the problems the illusion that we have through that theatralization and militarization of the border is not dealing with the real problems, which are not at the border, but are much further uh, away. So it shouldn't be a border policy, but it should be maybe a foreign aid, uh, a foreign policy uh, approach. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. So we've uh, had the pleasure of listening to three very talented and uh, interesting speakers with a variety of perspectives uh, from, from uh, the Global South, from Waterloo, and uh, looking also at, at borders and the implications and what COVID has done to accelerate technological change as well as some of these geopolitical issues. Now the first, we have a few minutes left here and what I'd like to do first is to see, we do have a speaker from yesterday. Uh, Dr. Brooke is still with us, I believe. And if there are any questions between the speaker from yesterday, the panelist from today, either uh, back and forth or amongst yourselves, do would you have any questions for each other before we open it up to others who may have a question? Anything you'd like to ask one another? Don't I have a question? I have a suggestion or a question. Yes, please. Yeah, education is a great equalizer, according to one of my colleagues. Uh, our society should put uh, more resources for the underprivileged uh, and the working class uh, uh, towards education. This is uh, primary school, high school, and university. I'd like to hear the the the. the the opinions and the comments of the panel uh, of the speakers of yesterday and also of today. Uh, I don't know whether uh, my question, my my comment was or my question was uh, properly received. Okay, so if I can paraphrase, then um, asking the panelists and the speakers about the uh, importance of education and challenge in addressing some of these challenges that have been raised by them. 
Yeah, but uh, my point is that uh, according to my colleague, uh, education is a great equalizer mm -hmm. when it comes to inequality. Inequalities, according to me and also to my colleagues, is that uh, they are more pronounced in the uh, underprivileged <laughs> class and the working class and the lower part of the middle class. The okay. inequalities are less pronounced in, uh, in, the, in the upper middle class and they, of course they, are not, uh, they don't exist in the 1%. So really my point is the equalizer and the effect of the inequalities at the, at the lower, uh, lower uh, classes. Okay. So would anyone like to jump in and, and address that very important question? Caitlin, I see your hand is up. Yes, please. I'm going to go out on a limb here. So this is a little bit outside of my background in international development, despite being a CEO of a tech company. Um, so of course, I agree with that statement for a whole bunch of reasons. But I think a new part of the discussion, and this is you know giving a lot of credit to the University of Waterloo, is the importance of work integrated learning. I think we're starting to recognize that it's not just about what you learn in a classroom. It's also giving people experience to do new things. And that is opening up new career paths that people may not have imagined. And so unfortunately as a society, we really suffer from pattern matching. So we often will use education as a way of saying, you know, whether or not we think somebody is worthy of being hired or a promotion and, and it will create an immediate inequality between those that have education and those that don't. But another thing that we do with pattern matching is we look at, has somebody done this job before? You know, has a coal miner been doing software development before? And if we have seen that they have gone on and done some coding and been part of some hackathons and you know, the second we see somebody doing the job that we're interested in considering them for, our levels as human beings of taking risk get, you know, we get much more comfortable taking risks on people that have demonstrated that they've already been able to do it. And so one of the problems happens is that if you don't have access to, uh, you know, if, if you don't have friends that work in a tech company, and you don't have a foot in the door and you've never coded and, and there's nothing in your past that says that you will be successful in a tech company, that whole opportunity is closed off to you because you don't look like the pattern. The second you give somebody the opportunity as a co-op or through an internship to get their foot in the door to demonstrate that they can thrive in that environment, then it's really easy after that to be like, oh, okay, well, you worked at that tech company. I'm going to like, I'm going to hire you over here. And so an equalizer is also giving people the opportunity, bank tellers, to have the opportunity to show that they can be successful in a different environment with a different job title. So the more we can kind of open up on the job experiences, and that's really where the work integrated learning is coming to the forefront, I believe that's a critical new piece to, of the discussion that we need a lot more support around. Um, and, and we're really just, starting to scratch the surface on that. And I see that, you know, being really a solution globally. And it's a way of bringing the workforce into the education discussion. Like Nora said yesterday, you know, this is the strength of the University of Waterloo is being able to have those conversations and open up those pathways. But internships is something that we see across the world. And it really doesn't have a high barrier of entry. It just has to be prioritized and the processes need to be put in place. That's great. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Couldn't have said it better myself. Lovely. Um, let's go on to a couple of questions. There are two questions, actually, Caitlin, that have been posed for you. Uh, the first one, maybe, maybe you're reading it in the Q&A, but shall I read it out? Okay. Uh, how do companies go about retraining their staff like this? Is there access outside of the company more generally to training, or is each company unique? How can we support them? Yeah, I would say that this is one of the barriers that we still need to figure out. Um, I think there's a lot of desire for more upskilling, but there's a big question of how you do it. And so, you know, I think the universities are starting to say, hey, can we, can we play that role? What would that look like? I think that you're seeing hubs popping up. So Masterclass, which is like you can, it's an online subscription. You can see that they've just announced opening two offices in this region and they're about to open eight more um, in Canada, it's because they're trying to play into this game. 
Um, you look at Communitech, which is you know the Waterloo Tech Hub in Mars. They're trying to say, can we do boot camp type things? Can we do them in collaboration with you know universities? So I think everybody's trying to figure that out right now of how do you upskill it. My my expertise to this equation is the fundamental first step is understanding if you are helping somebody be set up for long-term success through the upskilling. If you are upskilling, um, we there's a company in town, I'll give them a shout out, Uvero. They train people to be business development representative and sales representatives. I think that's fantastic. But not everyone is going to be persuasive. Not everyone is going to be enjoying talking to people all the time or enjoying the rejection that comes from sales. And so the first thing is understanding, you know, maybe somebody has been an Uber driver, but if you upskilled them to be a sales rep, their income is going to quadruple and they're going to have a new career path and they're going to be incredibly successful because we don't have enough great salespeople in this area. So the first step is identifying which Uber drivers or which, you know, people that are working in hospitality or any industry who would make a great sales rep. I thought sales was slimy and gross. Well, actually persuasion is one of my top talents and I don't like the rejection, but there's certain elements of sales that I've come to really enjoy. And, you know, if I had known this earlier in my career, I probably would have taken some formal sales training training because I think it could have helped me at all levels. Um, and it's something now I'm doing later in life, but I think it's first and foremost, understanding which pathways, which upskillings are going to tap into people's innate talent that comes through quantifying and understanding that the second step is okay now how are we going to educate them and i think we are just starting to figure that out we have a long way to go to find the right solution for that okay that's great um now i'll there's a question come in for ruth um and we just have a minute or so left uh ruth can you speak more about integrating UBI, so universal basic income, with existing programs to provide increased security for low income people. Thank you. That's a big one to tackle in a minute. Thanks. Um, yeah, it, it is. And I actually, I wanted to say something before that, speaking to the earlier question, the great science fiction writer, um, Stephen Gould said, I am somehow less interested in the weight of convolutions of Einstein's brain than in the near certainty that people of equal talent have lived and died in cotton fields and sweatshops. And I think that points to an important aspect. Education is absolutely important, but it is only as important as the quality of work that is available and that can absorb an emerging youth, right? So in the context of South Africa and structural unemployment, where 75% of young people are, are, are unemployed, what is the point, young people ask, of getting an education, right? So you sell that dream, but it does very little. And I think there's another issue that came up yesterday, which is around the relationship between interventions at the bottom of the labor market and at the top of the labor market. And that you can't simply address inequality by having interventions at the bottom of the labor market. UBI in the context of South Africa is gaining growing political traction, um, but it is inevitably a tool to reduce poverty. It is very unlikely that it will make a dent into uh, questions of inequality. And that is because um, of, of, of the possibilities of the level of what UBI can be and, and the role it can play. So it has to be tied to other kinds of, of labor and social protections that guarantee higher levels of livelihood. And we can't simply abstract from the key political questions of how production is organized. Great, good. And uh, I think I'll just summarize then some wonderful conversations here this afternoon again. Great panelists, thank you very much for spending time with us this afternoon and uh, pass it over to the moderator. Good afternoon. We have such a fun and exciting topic lined up for our next conversation. So thank you there, we've got our screens up. So I'm gonna take a moment to introduce myself as the moderator of our, our next topic, uh, and then hand it off to our next speaker because we have such a delightful list of speakers to share today. So as a repeat tech CEO, the topics that we're covering today are very near and dear to my heart because we're looking to not just make an impact with the companies 
that we serve, the, the employees that we bring on, but the broader society that they work in. And everything that we're covering today is going to be so salient. Uh, I've had the opportunity to find found five technology companies and at every step of the way, building diverse and inclusive teams have been very important to me. And so getting a chance to moderate today's conversation uh, is also a great learning opportunity for me. So I'm very excited about that. But to get us dug in, uh, we do have a great presentation uh, and then we have a panel followed up and I'd like to take a moment to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Claire Trottier. Uh, she is a board member of the Trottier Family uh, Foundation. She is a philanthropist. She is an advocate and she's an activist. We had some fantastic conversations ahead of today's session. I know she has some great topics and information to share. Um, in particular, two things that she's mentioned that really stuck out to me were the ideas of uh, a more, more progressive, more aggressive tax movement. Uh, we often hear about the opposing forces of you know, wealthy individuals who don't want to pay taxes, uh, groups who maybe don't earn as much money and feel they're being overtaxed, uh, but we'll be hearing a fantastic perspective of someone who says, hey, tax me more. And I think that's going to be a wonderful conversation. And I know she's got some fantastic data. There was a fantastic article uh, that came out from ProPublica yesterday that was jarring in terms of the taxation of the mega rich. And I know that Dr. Trottier is going to dig into some of that material. Uh, so before we introduce our panels for the conversation portion, I'd like to pass the mic over to Dr. Trottier to help really emphasize some of the changes we can make to improve the way we uh, tax and manage wealth across economic divides. Dr. Trottier, it's all, all yours. Thank you so much, Joseph, for that introduction. And uh, thank you everybody for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm here because, um, not because I'm a, an academic with expertise in taxation or inequality or public policy, um, but because I'm actually a part of the 1%. Um, and uh, I think that the quote uh, that was shared earlier actually um, from Stephen Jay Gould is a really good one. Um, you know, I basically am in this position because I essentially won the lottery of life uh, by born, being born into my family. Um, I did not work to have access to this level of wealth. Um, the wealth of my family is uh, due to the work of my father, who is um, a co-founder and now sole owner of a company called Matrox, which is a technology company based here in Montreal that's still going very strong. Um, and so I know from the inside what um, structures are in place to allow wealthy people to continue to accumulate wealth. Um, and I think that the system that I benefit from is, uh, is not a just system. Um, so just a little bit about me, like I said, I'm not an expert in taxes. My background is actually um, in microbiology and immunology, another very pertinent topic these days. Uh, my expertise is in virology and immunology. Uh, and up until just a couple of weeks ago, I was actually working full time as a professor in microbiology and immunology at McGill University, where I taught immunology. So if anyone has any questions about the COVID vaccines, that's actually more my, my area. Um, but I, I left all of that uh, behind uh, in order to focus on work uh, at our family foundation and in my advocacy role, uh, because I think that um, I can contribute a unique perspective to these types of debates. Um, so as Joseph said, you know, we, we, uh, we had a real blockbuster um, uh, news article that came out yesterday from ProPublica, the timing could not be better, um, where they managed to get their hands on um, tax information uh, in the United States and publish some information about uh, the 25 wealthiest Americans and the level of tax that they have been paying. And, and they have um, uh, tax information over uh, a period from 2014 and 2018. Um, and and you can see for yourself the amount of uh, the true tax rate that are being paid by some of these um, richest Americans, um, much, much lower than I'm sure the people that are here on this call. Um, these numbers actually even surprised me a little bit, like I, I knew it was going to be bad, but I, I guess I didn't, I, you know, it, it's really bad, right? <laughs> Uh, and I think we can all agree that this type of situation is 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 deeply unfair. Um, and when we are in a society and a world confronted with pandemics, um, with uh, climate change, uh, which is a, a, a very significant global threat, um, we really need to have additional resources to be able to confront these problems as a society. 
Um, so I'm here to tell you all about an inequality and some of the solutions. But before I do so, just a, a little snapshot on inequality. We've already um, gotten some really uh, fantastic presentations yesterday on income inequality and wealth inequality. Uh, but just to provide a few highlights uh, from my perspective, um, we know from um, the Parliamentary Budget Office that uh, the top 1% uh, wealthiest Canadians hold over 25% of the wealth in this country. Um, so there is a very significant amount of wealth that is in the hands of a very small group of people in this country. Um, we also know that the super rich uh, have gotten richer even during this pandemic. On the right, you can see some data um, with um, some breakdowns and you can see Canada right here. Um, the, the share of GDP at time of 2020 for some of the richest Canadians has gone up during the pandemic. Um, so inequality exists and it's, it's not a, a good situation in my view. We know that you know we're talking about income inequality, we're talking about wealth inequality, there's other forms of inequality as well. Obviously racial inequality um, is a, a very significant problem. Um, and these things play out um, during uh, the pandemic as well. So I think you know if people weren't really aware of um, the disparities um, and, and inequality prior to the pandemic, I think that that has really brought that to light a lot more. Uh, just to kind of give you a, a little bit of um, sort of um, uh, indication of what these impacts might be here on the left hand side, we have a map of Montreal, which is where I live. Uh, and you can see this color coded um, map where different regions are at different intensities. Um, and we're looking at the cumulative COVID cases per 100K in the island of Montreal. Um, and the neighborhoods that are in darker shades of red are neighborhoods that um, have residents with a lower income, as well as a higher proportion of racialized residents. So cases really concentrated in those neighborhoods. Turning our attention to data from Toronto on the right, you can see on the top a very clear correlation uh, between income level in Toronto um, and uh, case count per 100K in the population, where there's almost a perfect correlation where people who um, earn $150,000 or more had much lower rates of COVID uh, than people at the lower end of the, uh, of the income um, um, spectrum. And you can, kind of fill in the blanks here that a lot of people who are at higher risk of COVID are people who are essential workers who work in meat packing plants, uh, wrapping your Amazon order in a warehouse, et cetera. Uh, these are the people who are um, uh, in, in, in higher risk uh, work situations, whereas me working from home in my office here, uh, my risk of COVID is, is quite low. Um, at the bottom here, you can see um, the curve for the first wave in Toronto. Um, when um, measures were implemented, you can see that communities that have higher income and lower percentage of residents of color um, did not experience the first wave in the same way as neighborhoods that have higher proportion of lower income people, um, as well as higher proportion of racialized individuals. So um, clearly, um, there are very different experiences of the, of the pandemic when we say we're all in it together. It's not quite true. Um, I, I've, re I've, I've read, you know, one of the things that we're all in the same storm, but some of us are in cruise ships and other people are in rowboats, right? So the the, the experiences that we have um, during the pandemic has been, have been very different, um, and a lot of this is along income and racial lines. So, you know, I think that it's quite clear inequality exists. I think we all agree that inequality is exists, is a, is a, is a, is a thing that exists. And I think we can all agree that it's bad, you know, that, um, that there is a, a, a very high proportion of wealth that's, that's held by a small proportion of people and that it comes with consequences. Um, a lot of people have called this a new gilded age with the rise of new set of plutocrats um, with outsized power. Uh, and I think that this situation is problematic for a lot of reasons. And I'm not here to talk about all the reasons why it's problematic. I think that um, uh, that's a topic for another day. What I'm here to talk to you about are some solutions to this problem. What can we do about it? Um, so any solution to these issues really have to tackle, in my view, you know, two different things. Whether you know, we want to find measures to lift people up from the bottom, for example, using UBI or other measures that have been discussed by previous speakers or measures to rein those in at the top. And so I'm here to tell you that you absolutely must have measures to rein uh, people in at the top. Um, and I'm part of a growing movement calling for more progressive taxation, including taxes on people like me. 
And I'm not alone in calling on these uh, types of measures. I I'm part of the movement and there are many um, scholars and um, uh, eminent economists who agree with me. Um, so there are many, many books on income inequality and the role that taxation can play in addressing these problems. I think most famously, um, Thomas Piketty's book, Capital in the 21st Century, uh, in many ways um, launched this topic into the limelight um, and made it a very serious idea that, uh, that deserves to be considered and addressed. Um, of course, there are economists like Emmanuel Saez, uh, Gabriel Zuckman, and Joseph Stieglitz ha that have uh, described some of the problems with inequality and have proposed taxation as part of the solution. Um, we have um, uh, people like that I'm going to speak to a, 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 a bit um, from organizations like Patriotic Millionaires talking about taxing the rich. Um, and then we have our own finance minister, Christian Freeland, who wrote a book a few years ago called Plutocrats, um, really uh, describing some of the problems with this growing inequality and consequences. Um, so I think that there is a lot of agreement. These are very mainstream ideas now. Um, and at, this has led to the emergence of some proactive movements really advocating uh, quite forcefully for more progressive taxation. So this international movement um, it, you know, includes two groups that are composed of millionaires that are advocating for wealth taxes. Uh, these two groups are called Patriotic Millionaires and Millionaires for Humanity. Um, Patriotic Millionaires uh, was created uh, and founded in the United States. Um, the chair, um, uh, Morris Pearl, is a former executive at BlackRock. Uh, they have a number of very prominent members, including Abigail Disney, who is the granddaughter of Roy Disney. Um, and there's another group called Millionaires for Humanity that I'm also um, involved with that has a number of members uh, in, in various European uh, countries and around the world. So this is really a growing movement. Um, they're involved in a series of different actions. Um, two concrete actions that uh, I was lucky enough to participate in uh, were two letters, one that was uh, presented at Davos in January of 2020, advocating for a wealth tax, uh, which was followed up by a letter in April of 2020, um, a similar letter this time calling for a wealth tax in the light of um, uh, the pandemic. So there are millionaires actually uh, um, in over 21 countries right now um, that are have either signed these letters or are actively participating in these movements. So it really is a global um, movement of people who have wealth, who recognize that they benefit from the system, who recognize that the system is unjust. And because of this realization have stood up and said, tax me as part of your solution, okay? Um, and, and I'm very happy to be a part of uh, this movement. Um, a bit closer to home, I have also done a bit of work for a group called Resource Movement, which is a group of young people. Um, although I am not so young anymore, they, they let me stick around. Um, this is a group of young people who have some wealth and privilege who are, are trying to um, advocate for the redistribution of wealth, land, and power. Um, because of course, with this type of wealth, it also comes with a, a, a fair amount of power and access to power. And one of the activities of this group has been a campaign to uh, promote the idea of wealth taxes and an inheritance tax as well um, as part of the solution to these problems and also as a way of funding uh, much needed social programs and confronting climate change among other uses for this type of um, additional revenue for the government. Um, so we have movements of, of wealthy people advocating for these changes, uh, but we're not doing this in isolation or, a known, uh, or alone, rather. Um, in Canada, um, Research Movement is part of a coalition called the Tax the Rich, Tax the Rich Coalition, um, which includes um, some major labor unions, uh, as well as Oxfam. Um, Oxfam, of course, um, is uh, very well known for their work on inequality uh, around the world. And, you know, every year Oxfam comes out with this big report, usually around the time of Davos as well, um, looking at the impacts of inequality. Um, and so really this sort of illustrates that, you know, not only is this a global movement, not only are wealthy people standing up and saying tax us, um, but we are also um, part of this more uh, broader movement uh, from civil society, um, to, to try to address these problems and promoting the idea of um, more progressive taxation um, as a key component of the solution to this crisis and, and of, of inequality. 
So there are changes already on the table, okay? These are not um, completely, um, you know, these are not radical ideas. These are very mainstream ideas um, and, and that are now really like being translated into concrete, tangible policy. So south of the border, uh, President Biden has already several tangible proposals on the table uh, to um, try to make changes to the tax system to make it more fair, including increasing corporate tax rates, um, bringing in measures to rein in profit shifting by corporations and individuals, um, increasing the capital gains tax, amongst other things. And you know he's received some pushback for these uh, proposals uh, in some cases, um, but I think it's nice to kind of look at this figure here on the right to kind of get a sense of like where his um, increased tax plans are situated, you know, within a historical framework. And you see that actually the the changes that he's proposing uh, would actually just bring us back to um, levels that we saw in the 80s and 90s. So we're not talking about dramatic increases. We're, we're talking about bringing it back up to something that we saw during a period of great growth. Um, just last week, uh, another kind of nice timing uh, here, um, the G7 actually announced an agreement uh, the, for the first time the G7 has agreed to imposing a minimum corporate tax. Um, the amount that they have proposed is a 15% minimum um, corporate tax, which is actually lower <laughs> than um, in several countries. Um, so while it's encouraging to me that the G7 has come to an agreement, and this shows that if there is traction for this idea of a global minimum uh, cor corporate tax, um, you know, I, you know, I, I will lean on um, Nobel Prize winning economist Joseph Stieglitz, who has responded to this announcement from the G7 and, and has said that they should actually uh, be raising that um, minimum to 25%. And some of the parameters in this proposal are also a little bit strange to me. For example, Amazon would not even qualify for this tax for various reasons. So there's clearly some work to be done. Uh, and there will be further discussions at the G20 and OECD level. But I think overall, the point here is that um, these ideas are starting to really um, go from ideas, books, conversations, topics, panels like today to mainstream um, uh, common sense ideas and now into actual tangible policy. And, 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 and I hope that some of those actual tangible policies will have a little bit more teeth to them um, uh, going forward. So there are a number of solutions that are sort of in the sort of umbrella of taxation for progressive taxation, um, and that are all aligned with a, a vision for a more equitable system of taxation. Um, which in my view should really have, you know, their, concentrate their impact on the very rich and corporations for the benefit of broader society to be able to confront things like climate change and to meet growing needs. And just again, to say that, you know, I, I'm not an economist. Um, and so I'm a little bit agnostic about, you know, at what, like, what's the cutoff for wealth if we were to apply certain taxes? What percentages should we be applying? That's not my area, you know. So I'll be showing you a few slides that have numbers on them, but I'm drawing from numbers from others um, to illustrate the point. Uh, for me, um, I'm agnostic. I just think we need, to, we need to move forward and we need to do something. So the first measure that I think is absolutely essential is a wealth tax, okay? And I would be among those who would be impacted by this wealth tax. So just to give you some examples of numbers that have been um, uh, looked at by some organizations, uh, for example, if you had a 1% wealth tax on a wealth above 20 million, that means, you know, if you have wealth of 20 million, you're not going to be affected by this tax. But if you had wealth, for example, of 25 million, you would only be taxed on that 5 million, and you would end up paying $50,000 a year in taxes. $50,000 a year in taxes might sound like a lot of money for um, somebody who makes an average salary for Canadians. Um, but for somebody with $25 million, I assure you, you will not notice, okay? So if I was subject to this tax, it would have absolutely zero impact on my life, zero, okay? Um, it would change my lifestyle, zero. <laughs> and so to me, the question is why not? Um, and we can see that the PBO has estimated you know, that you could generate significant revenue in Canada with such a tax. Um, and can, um, a group called Canadians for Tax Fairness have um, um, done some calculations for a slightly different variation, 1% uh, tax on wealth over 10 million, 2% on wealth over 100 million, 3% on wealth over 1 billion. Now, again, I'm agnostic on the exact numbers and cutoffs. Um, 
but you know this this level of taxation would not even cut into the growth of somebody's assets um you know if they're investing sens sensibly you would still be able to continue accumulating greater and greater amounts of wealth every year even with such a, a level of wealth tax so great i think this is a good idea wonderful <laughs> what about everybody else well it turns out that canadians massively support a wealth tax um, a recent survey demonstrated that 75 percent of canadians support a wealth tax and not only that this support for a wealth tax is found across political spectrum. So, you know, people who affiliate with all different types of political affiliations are strongly in favor or very much agree or support uh, the idea of a wealth tax. This is um, the case seen across geography in Canada uh, by gender and by age. So this is really like um, consensus, a clear consensus across Canada. There's very few topics that you'll find that have such enormous support across political stripes, across geography, across Canada. This is actually a unifying um, policy idea that can bring Canadians together and help support um, programs that will help all of us. So in addition to a wealth tax, I think there's other measures we could be thinking about. Um, we talked a little bit yesterday about um, some of the gaps in income as well. Um, and so I think it's reasonable to consider whether you know, we could be um, having additional taxes on the very top earners. You know, One number that I think is quite striking is the fact that Canadian CEO CEOs make about 197 times more than the average worker's salary. So that's a pretty big discrepancy. I think you, know, you could probably pay a little bit more. Um, we know that the highest income tax rate in 1980 was higher than it is today, so there is precedent, precedent to, to, to have a little bit of an increase. So one proposal um, from Canadians for Tax Fairness is a 5% tax on income over 550k, 10% on income over 1 million. Again, I'm sort of agnostic about the percentage and the cutoff, but you know, I think that it's reasonable to consider the possibility of having an additional bracket um, for income tax for the for the for those at the very very top, since the concentration is at the very top. Another topic that came up a bit yesterday was the capital gains tax, um, which is sometimes a bit of a snore as a topic. But just to give you a really concrete example, so like I mentioned earlier, I was up until recently a, a full time professor at McGill. Um, nobody ever talks about salary; it's taboo. But I can tell you that my salary is, was around ninety thousand dollars. If I were to take that same income as capital gains from my investments, I would be taxed at a lower level than when I was a professor. That's crazy, is it not? So, you know, people who um, have a lot of wealth, a lot of people who have a lot of wealth um, are able to, as we saw from ProPublica, <laughs> find ways to minimize and defer their taxes. Uh, for capital gains, you know, there's lots and lots of ways to, to defer tax, to um, minimize taxation, and a capital gains tax is currently only on 50% of gains. So I think it's reasonable to think about having an increase in capital gains tax. And not only that, we know that a lot of tech CEOs and other CEOs hold a lot of their wealth as shares. And those shares might increase in value over time. You think about like the typical example of Amazon, who's uh, shares increase uh, the value of those shares increase over time if you don't declare cap you know if you don't realize those capital gains um, you don't even have to pay the capital gains tax so you can you can sort of hold on to those gains over time and increase your wealth some people borrow against that in order to you know buy yachts <laughs> okay um, so one proposal is to actually um, set a date to realize some of those gains and maybe you know a calendar for payment of those of that tax over a period of years um, to try to um, address this issue of this this huge concentration of wealth. Um, just a few words on corporate taxes. Um, we know that in Canada, the rate of um, the actual the official rate of corporate taxes has been decreasing. We know that the effective corporate income tax rate has also been decreasing over time. Um, and so I think it's reasonable to consider, you know, what would be a slightly higher potentially um, uh, rate of corporate taxation. And here's a, a timely tweet from Patriotic Millionaires yesterday, looking at cor corporate tax rates in the U.S. throughout history under Reagan, even 34 um, percent. So, you know, 15 percent is clearly not sufficient. Um, and, and uh, you know, I think it's a, a part of the reflection to have. 
I think some of these um, changes and even enforcing the current system requires um, proper um, resourcing of the CRA to be able to ensure compliance with these rules. Um, uh, Biden is reinvesting actually in the IRS. Um, and I think that, you know, there are lots of ways that wealthy individuals and corporations can use loopholes and perfectly legal ways to minimize and defer their taxes. Um, so I think that is also a good idea to, start to, to address some of these loopholes. In addition, Canada doesn't have an inheritance tax, so maybe it's time to rethink that. So I've talked about wealth taxes and these types of things in a number of places, and I've read about them, and there are a lot of um, common counter arguments that I've encountered. So I wanted to just address a few of those as sort of my, my final piece here today. Um, a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, rich people will just use XYZ strategies to avoid these taxes. Like, what's the point? I find this to be a ridiculous argument. If you can predict the loopholes that people will use to avoid these taxes, address the loopholes. You know, we have laws today and regulations today that wealthy people are using loopholes to defer and, and um, uh, minimize their tax bill today. Does that mean that we should just repeal those laws? You know, what's the point? I find this to be kind of a, um, a silly argument, to be honest with you. One of the arguments I hear is like, oh, people will just leave Canada. They'll pack up, they'll bring their money elsewhere. I mean, first of all, it's a global movement. So I think hopefully we'll find that more and more countries will be imposing a wealth tax. So I don't know where you're going to go. Um, but moreover, I think that there's a very simple solution that's been uh, proposed by um, people like Gabriel Zuckman, which is to have an exit tax. Um, you want to leave? Fine. You're going to have to pay a hefty fine for that. One common refrain I hear is, well, they work really hard. They deserve it. First of all, I didn't work hard. Whoops. I, 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 you know, I did nothing. I was born in this family. So this argument doesn't apply to me, certainly. Um, so there's lots of um, questions about, you know, wealth accumulation, inheritance, intergenerational wealth, wealth transfers. Um, if you don't tax the people who generate the wealth, you're going to end up with more people like me, okay? And you're going to end up with more people like me anyway, but let's try to tackle it and at least um, get at some of that wealth. And even if, like, I was the one who had done all this work, and my father did a lot of work, but, you know, other people work hard too. The rich don't work orders and orders and orders of magnitude harder than everybody else. Um, and they should certainly be paying a fair share of taxes, unlike those we saw in the first slide today that are paying 1%, if that. And then wealth creates wealth without work. You know, um, once you have enough wealth and you invest it, you just get returns on your investment and you don't have to do anything. So this idea that you're working hard for that wealth, it just doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't make sense to me. And then the final one is, well, what about philanthropy? Or why don't you just cut a check to the government? <laughs> I mean, sure, you know, um, our family is involved in philanthropy. Uh, I think philanthropy can do a lot of good work, but we're, we're talking about deep structural issues in our society that need to be addressed. And we can't be relying on the individual generosity and goodwill of a select few rich people who decide to give back according to their own desires. We need everybody to pay their fair share. Uh, and one of my very favorite quotes is from um, a book called Winners Take All, which I highly recommend by Anon Girard Haradas. Um, and the thesis of that really is generosity is not a substitute for justice. Okay, generosity is great, but we have lots of deep structural problems in society and we need to find ways to, um, to, to resolve those and address those. And the only way we're gonna do so is if everybody pays their fair share. So in conclusion, hopefully I have, um, you know, convinced you that um, more progressive wealth, uh, uh, pr more progressive taxation, including a wealth tax on people like me are absolutely essential tools to address wealth inequality. They will have no discernible impact, impact on my life, but in the aggregate, the amount of money, the amount of revenue that can be generated by these types of taxes can have substantial and dramatic changes and, and opportunities for the government to be able to address issues like climate change and provide more support for, um, uh, for the population across Canada. And we will all benefit from a more just society. Um, yes, okay, and I think that's it for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. Trottier, thank you so much. Um, before we, we let you go, and of course, before we bring in our next panel, we've got a few questions uh, that would love to run past you. Um, so first off, for everybody in attendance, I'd invite you to make uh, active use of the chat, the q and I'm keeping an eye on it, uh, and there's some fantastic stuff in there. Uh, but first off, I'd like to say thank you, you know, for, for sharing your, your perspective, your experience. So often these conversations 
uh, get put as kind of a class versus class. And this is a very, uh, it's a refreshing perspective to have someone, you know, coming up and, you know, representing both sides of it. Uh, but to, to kind of dig in, first off, you, you suggested a number of policies, a number of processes, and you, you identified that you're, you're not an economist by training. And so one of the, the easy, you know, questions is, well, why, why should someone with an immunity, you know, immunobiology background be espousing you know, tax policy? And we, we had this chat beforehand and I'm sitting in a similar seat to you, but I would love to hear, how do you handle that objection? And why should we have these conversations? Why is it relevant? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a good question. I mean, I think that, you know, I'll be the first to say that, you know, it, it, it really boils down to, I'm in this position um, of, of immense privilege. Um, and I recognize that, and I recognize all the ways in which I benefit from the system. Um, you know, even the reasons I was able to even get a PhD in the first place, you know, a lot of people get PhDs, but certainly like I never had to pay tuition. I never had to worry, you know, so it's, it's, it, it, it allowed me to make decisions that might be more difficult for other people. So I'm definitely aware of, um, of the different privileges that I benefit from. And I really consider it to be um, a, a responsibility. I, I think that, you know, we're faced with sort of a status quo situation where there is huge um, wealth inequality. It exists. We know it exists. It can be measured. We mm -hmm. from eminent economists yesterday who, who gave us lots of data about it. Um, so to me, saying nothing is equivalent to saying I'm okay with the status quo. And I'm not okay with the status quo. Um, and I'm not comfortable with my own silence on this issue. And that's one of the motivating factors for speaking out is saying, you know, even if I'm not an economist and I'm not an expert on this issue, um, I refuse to be silent about it. I refuse to, um, uh, to by my silence, support the status quo. So I think that it, it you know, either, either you're naming the problem and recognizing inequality, saying it's wrong and trying to actively change it, or by your silence and inaction, you're in effect sort of supporting the status quo, which is deeply unequal. As someone whose uh, peer group is a lot of tech entrepreneurs and CEOs, and generally whose peer group is advocating lower taxes, it's refreshing to hear someone else also uh, advocating increased taxes to, to improve you know, distributions. Um, it, there's a great question that came from the audience, not just the people being taxed or the recipients of the, the benefits of social service, but the actual government themselves. What have been the responses amongst Canadian politicians to some of the policies that, that you mentioned here? Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that surprised me, surprises me the most about Canada is Canada likes to think of itself as like a very forward thinking nation. Uh, but we haven't heard very much actually from Canadian politicians on this issue. And, you know, we like to often, we, we look to our neighbor to the south, you know, the giant to the south, um, and, you know, sometimes pat ourselves on the back, like, ha ha ha, how much better we're doing. But actually, you know, Joe Biden is a fairly moderate Democrat, you know, during the primary campaign in the US, we had Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders make bold proposals for wealth taxes, amongst other measures. Um, but Joe Biden was the candidate and he is the president. And yet as a moderate uh, Democrat, he is bringing forward concrete proposals uh, that are aligned with this vision and that align actually quite closely with some of the policies that have been supported by patriotic millionaires. So I think that, you know, um, Canadian politicians can and should do more. And as I showed you in the polling data, it is like incredible, the consensus on this issue amongst Canadians, right? So I think any politician who wants to talk about wealth taxes will be very popular. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the questions that, that also comes up, I mean, even if we raise those taxes, you know, as, as we're, we're going in, you, you teased out a couple of thoughts there about, uh, you know, a way to address inequality through taxation and allowing government programs to then you know, leverage those revenues. Uh, you know, other angles are through philanthropic endeavors, perhaps instead of passing funds through the government to then address issues, we pass them through your charitable or the social services sector. You sit in an interesting position where you, you see both. You know, you're, you're paying taxes, but you're also supporting a family foundation. Um, how's your, what are your thoughts on that balance of so reducing inequality through philanthropic activities, through tax policies, why should we be advocating for one over the other? Yeah, I mean, I don't see it as one over the other. I think that there is a role for philanthropy and that's why we do work at, a found, at our foundation. You know, I think that there are a lot of very important critiques of philanthropy. I think that, you know, philanthropists have a lot of power and decision-making 
about where they choose to spend their money. And sometimes that money can be spent in ways that can reinforce existing inequalities and don't necessarily respond to the needs from communities. Um, but I, but sometimes they do, you know, um, and I think that there is definitely a place for philanthropy um, and generosity is not a substitute for justice. Okay. <laughs> because you can have people like my family that try to give back and we try to make the best decisions we can. Um, a lot of people hold on to their cash. Um, and so, you know, I think that there has to be a mechanism to ensure that everybody contributes in a significant way. Um, and that can only be done through taxation. Um, and so to me, it's not an either or, it's a both. Um, and I think philanthropy, you know, without getting into it, I think that there are a lot of critiques of how philanthropy uh, engages. And, um, you know, I think we can think, for example, just to cite a few examples, you know, the percentage of philanthropic dollars that go to black led or indigenous led organizations is incredibly low. Um, and, um, and there are great needs in these communities. Um, and those communities know best how to address their own needs. Uh, and don't necessarily have the same amount of decision making power and certainly don't have the same access to capital. So, you know, philanthropy can also do better, uh, but it's not the solution. Um, it can be part of the solution. We need um, more taxation to really make a dent. So you, you've got an interesting, um, interestingly and refreshingly unique perspective on a lot of this. Uh, and running a family foundation, you perhaps more than others here in, in the conversation, had the opportunity to talk to others who have large amounts of family wealth. Um, so I'm hoping that without naming individuals or, or specific anecdotes, could you crack open that box a little for us? If you have these conversations with other family foundations or other wealthy families, what do those conversations look like and how do they react to these comments or these thoughts? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I had to be frank, I haven't had that many of these conversations with my peers. I've had a few, uh, and, and I'm lucky to have found a few um, uh, like-minded individuals, certainly within patriotic millionaires and millionaires for humanity. Um, recently, uh, I, I've been in conversation um, with uh, Jonathan Goodman, who I think is still watching me right now. <laughs> Hope he doesn't mind. Uh, but he wrote an op-ed actually in the Globe and Mail uh, recently um, calling for uh, increased taxation. And so I got in touch with him. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and so there are others like me and like us um, and others that I've spoken to, you know, there are others who agree, um, but for lots of different personal reasons, don't feel comfortable speaking out publicly. It can be complicated in families. Um, and so, you know, it, money is a taboo subject, right? Money is a taboo subject. People are not comfortable. Even to, for me to say I'm part of the 1%, like very few people will say that even a very wealthy person will not say that, right? It's like embarrassing somehow. Um, it is kind of embarrassing, but you know, like you gotta sort of like, it is what it is. And I'm extremely lucky. No one's gonna cry for me, obviously, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but to find people who are willing to sort of put themselves out there, um, there aren't as many people who are willing to, to, to do so um, for a lot of different reasons, yeah. Um, so, Great comment in the chat there. Uh, Jonathan Goodman's there uh, cheering on the message and everything. So thanks for, Jonathan, thanks for tossing that to the chat. Thanks for the support, Jonathan. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's interesting because uh, throughout all of this, there's just that, that uncomfortable topic of, hey, if we're talking about taxing you know, the, the wealthy or, or the rich, uh, it sets things up for that class conversation and sets people up for those com difficult conversations about you know, whether it's impacting them. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love to, to reframe it a little bit. The top 1%, you know, it's that anecdote that we're all using. Um, but that article that you published in ProPublica, I mean, the top 25 is not the top 1%, not even the top 0.1%, I mean, the 0.01%. Uh, the policies that you talked about in many regards are uh, kind of wide ranging, very broad instruments. But if we're talking about reducing inequality, arguably we should be focusing on the really super ultra rich. It, if you had to think through your, your policies and your ideas on what could be the most precise mechanism to help reduce that, is there anything you'd point to? Anything you think we should be keeping in mind uh, as, as a highly, highly leverageable tool? 
I mean, I think wealth tax and capital gains tax are the two for me that I think are probably the most tangible, including this idea of um, sort of setting a date on unrealized gains and, and realizing them for people who are owners of a lot of shares and companies. Um, I think those are two very tangible um, policies. And, you know, like I said, I'm agnostic on the threshold. Um, you know, certainly we have, you know, we don't have anybody at the level of Jeff Bezos in Canada, um, but we do have a lot of very wealthy people. Um, so where we, where we cut that off, you know, where we set the parameter, I, I don't know. Um, but, uh, but in general, I think we should be, we should be um, targeting um, the very, very rich. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes when we talk about these large numbers, like they're so large, it's hard for people to really get a firm grasp on them. Um, you know, like Oxfam publishes this, 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 this uh, annual report on inequality. And in this year's report, again, to bring in Jeff Bezos, but, um, you know, they, I can't remember the exact number, they, they said something like, you know, Jeff Bezos could give each Amazon employee, of which there are a couple hundred thousand, something like 150K bonus, and he would still be wealthier than pre-pandemic. So this is just like, this is the scale of the numbers. And we, like I said, we don't have people necessarily at that Jeff Bezos level in Canada, but it's hard to kind of grasp at the scale. And if you set, you know, a fairly modest percent of wealth tax, if you increase the capital gains tax, it's not gonna impact people, you know, the wealthy people's lives in any, you know, maybe, maybe someone like Jeff Bezos has to buy a slightly smaller yacht. <laughs> Um, he'll still have a very nice yacht with a helicopter landing pad. He'll be fine, you know, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think it's reasonable to, to, to put in those measures. Uh, I love that you comment on the wealth tax. Uh, I promise not to keep you too long because we've got other conversations, but I want to, I want to double click on that one a little bit because you had a comment in your, uh, slides earlier where you mentioned how earning the same income as payroll, you'd be taxed significantly more than earning that same income. Uh, you know, from from savings, and I think you use the words like, you know, why why do we do that, or is that reasonable? And every public policy is a values policy to a certain extent, and you know, I I'd argue the policy is saying that we want to encourage people to save. So, is it not? Uh, you know, how how do we kind of come back to that idea of if we say saving is a good thing, making sure that the people are are safe for retirement, you know, their position, their long term future. Well, if we we tax all of that growth at the same rate, if we add a wealth tax, it's going to be so impactful. Are we not running the risk of disincenting savings? And when people's retirement is more vulnerable now than it ever has been, you know, are we not perhaps putting those uh, increasing the risk for populations who are already vulnerable? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the way to do that is to set a threshold so that you're not impacting people that genuinely need to save for retirement. Like, I don't need to save for retirement. I'm going to be fine. <laughs> so, you know, there's a real difference between somebody who, who, who owns a house. Um, most of their wealth is tied up in that primary resident residence um, and maybe putting some money aside for retirement. I'm not talking about targeting people like that necessarily. I think that we need to be targeting more people who have uh, more significant um, wealth. Um, and, and I think that, you know, that, that will ultimately benefit all of society and, you know, getting back to that point about like, well, there is a values proposition there. There is a, a question of like, what is the signal we're sending as a society or worse by, by having the status quo and the policies that we have in place, we're saying that, um, like the taxes, like that, that the salary, I, the income I receive from my salary as a professor <clears throat> is more deserving of being taxed than me sitting here speaking to you, which is great. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> okay <laughs> and hopefully i'm doing something like worthwhile with my time but anyways i'm not receiving a paid salary as an employee somewhere right and i'm going to be taxed less i don't think i don't i i disagree fundamentally with with the values that underpin that policy that is not aligned with the way i see the world i, I do not think that that is fair um and um and i think that most canadians would agree that it's not fair I don't have anything else that I can add to that statement. So I'm going to take this opportunity to, to kind of let you, you wrap up. We'll, we'll bring on our next, but thank you so much for your comments, the information you shared and for teeing up such a strong, you know, values driven conversation. Uh, you shared authentically, uh, you shared with candor that often isn't available in these conversations. And so thank you so much for the time, information and authenticity. I appreciate it very much.
My pleasure. And thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> um, for everyone, uh, some fantastic, fantastic data, some fantastic thoughts, uh, perspectives. Uh, we went deep with one speaker, but we're now going to tee up a fantastic panel. So I'm going to quickly introduce the uh, four panelists that we have. Each of them have the opportunity to share free a few pre prepared remarks, uh, and then we're going to field some more Q&A. Again, I'd remind the audience, please make active use of the Q&A in the chat. I'll be taking notes, watching the Q&A, and after each speaker has a chance to share their remarks, we'll open it up to a more uh, dynamic question and answer session. And I cannot begin to express how excited I am about this panel. Um, went deep on kind of a very personal experience with Dr. Scottier, uh, and now we're including uh, a more diverse perspective to get some back and forth. Uh, so first off, uh, I'd like to speak to Dr. Peter Warian. He's, you can see his title here on the screen, uh, is Distinguished Research Fellow. Uh, he's also an advisor to the Vatican, and he has some remarkable perspectives again on how every policy choice we have is ultimately a values choice. And that includes conversations on dignity and technology surveillance, on AI and predictive capacity and judgment. And about prior to today's panel, we had some fun conversations about whether or not employers are well set up to help support kind of moral and value-based policies and judgments. So he promises to have some very interesting information. Um, we, we will uh, quickly introduce the rest of our speakers and then I'll give uh, Peter the microphone. Uh, but we also have Dr. Miles Kroc. Uh, you could see his experience at the Stone Center of Socioeconomics uh, and Inequality, uh, City University in New York, and most importantly, he has some fantastic information about mobility, intergenerational mobility, social mobility, uh, and specifically which policies we should be asking our provincial and federal governments to be considering. Uh, we also have Kate Higgins. She's the Deputy Executive Director at Oxfam Canada. Uh, and especially as we talk about ending inequality across a multitude of perspectives, her experience at several international think tanks uh, will be invaluable. And her perspectives, especially on uh, Canada's role with sustainable development and the broader social uh, sustainable, sorry, the broader global sustainable development goals uh, and civil society's participation gives her a fantastic perspective. And then uh, last but not least, uh, Dr. Matthew Mendelssohn, um, not only is he a, 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 visiting, uh, a visiting professor, but also the founding director at the uh, Mowat Center, he's also been actively involved in government. So as we talk about provincial and federal government participation, uh, previously he served as the deputy secretary to the cabinet, uh, where he ran two important units, not just the Prime Minister's Results and Delivery Unit, but also the Impact and Innovation Unit. Uh, he's also, uh, in the past, been a Deputy Minister with the Ontario government. Uh, and so when we take a look at the panel we have coming up, you've got a great variety of conversations, uh, and then we're going to have a fun discussion. But to kick us off, uh, Dr. Warian, uh, I'm going to pass you the mic and let you share uh, your comments with today's audience. Right. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, inevitably, when you get at the end of the panel, you hear much more interesting stuff from the previous people. But um, I'm just say for them very briefly, among the items on my tattered resume, I was formerly chief economist of the province of Ontario. So I've had to sit as, uh, as a chief economist of the government and think about tax issues. All I would say is, do we need a more progressive tax system? Absolutely. For financial and all ethical reasons. However, the total tax uh, take in Canada is somewhere north of a trillion dollars. If you really want to move the needle on the trajectory of the society and the economy, it would more likely come not from a wealth tax, it will come from a, uh, an inheritance tax, a digital tax, and a carbon tax. So that was just chief of the government. It's like a bone in front of a dog. You have to go for that. But I'm not here to talk about that uh, this time. Um, so I am very happy to be at Waterloo, at least, um, at least um, uh, virtually. I think I'm the only person in the planet that has four degrees from the University of Waterloo and another one uh, from MIT, all in different subjects. So that tells you something. But more recently, I've been functioning as an economic advisor to the Vatican on AI robotics for the future of work. So I'm gonna start to make a few remarks specifically on the question of workplace inequality, other dimensions of, of inequality, but that's what I'll focus on. 
And I'll do that from the perspective of Pope Francis uh, and Sikil uh, Laudato Si. Um, it's important to understand where Francis of the church is coming from. Like since 1891, Rerum Navarum, the encyclical that first recognizes trade unions and the ravages and the poor, the industrial revolution. But particularly after Vatican II, there was a shift and a focus to uh, the dignity of the human person, which is actually a rights-based formulation. That is um, very briefly, uh, because for all the reasons that, that Ruth mentioned, our perspective is major technological changes also are in fact involve social choices. There's always a social innovation component of a really uh, big choices. So my first major point is if in the classic industrial economy of the 20th century, it was Henry Ford's assembly line that was the reference point for industrial organization. Where we now are, as we look at the digital economy, we are looking at, I think, Amazon's fulfillment prop, uh, uh, Amazon's fulfillment model as the reference case for industrial organization, applies to services and other, other things. But that would be my uh, uh, first thing. And when we look at that, if you look at the research on, on modern uh, industrial or high tech employers, what do they want? What do they want from their employees? They want workers who are engaged, uh, communicative, trusting, have judgment, willing to experiment, wanting to learn. Those are all human virtues. If I give you a Catholic perspective on this, i.e. Uh, those are moral qualities of the human person. So you begin with a discussion of technical engineering technology things, but in fact, you conclude that discussion about human nature. We view that as a good thing. The bind is, what is it the employers are asking of the employees? They're actually asking to mobilize their, uh, themselves as moral agents. And the, the bind is, what is the employer, are the employers willing to give in exchange as a moral commitment to their employees, their workforces? in exchange for this employers, the, uh, the, uh, the commitment that they're asking from their employees. And that's, that's the first point I would make. Uh, the second point of, I'd make is that from an ethics perspective, the platform technologies can, and we've got lots of data still coming in, we have lots of examples in front of us, that the platform economies, uh, platform technologies can threaten the autonomy of the individual and they're functioning as an, an autonomous moral agents. But the recent stories you can see in the media about the routine, routines that Amazon workers have. The first thing they do is check in so they can be monitored at every moment. And an average person in a Amazon warehouse is doing 1200 or 1800 items per hour. So Amazon workers, uh, Amazon warehouses have three times to four times the rate of workplace injuries of general warehouses in the United States reporting to OSHA, the Occupational Health and Safety Agency. So where, where does that take us? First point I'd make in, in, in my opening remark is number one, with respect to COVID and the impact of technologies, et cetera, Francis has repeatedly talked about three most important things. One is the escalation in the digital divide that has been brought on by, uh, by COVID. You just look at the trajectory. Folks who can work at home, I mean, our incomes have risen and uh, quote essential workers, most who are, cannot have to be in a workplace, their, their incomes have declined. So one is the individual, individual divide, digital divide. Secondly, Francis always points to the most vulnerable. And he means two groups by that, migrants. And secondly, so-called informal economy workers, like the 300 million agricultural workers in India who actually have no employee voice and they have no social protection at all. 
So the church's commitment is to address, first of all, the most vulnerable. Looking out in front of us, I would, I would uh, throw out three points for discussion. Uh, one is on the whole point of employee voice and worker representation, however you want to state that. I think there's been a fundamental shift as in the digital economy, where classically trade unions talk about workers acting on their inter economic interests in negotiating wages. I think interests are, have less, become less of the fulcrum point, the national identities. And that means the identity of people from uh, gender identities, racial identities, other identities, I think have become a more powerful force in, in quote, representation than they, they were. And that suggests a different kinds of representation of different kinds of voices in the future. I think, that, and that's a challenge for the church because the church's traditional uh, assumes sort of the labor market institutions of Western Europe, and we've now moved into a different zone. So that was one thing, uh, just uh, how people uh, articulate formulations of uh, employee voice in the workplace. Secondly, something that uh, uh, my folks and uh, friends in the Jesuits are pretty good are look at Africa as, uh, the African problem, but it's a problem all over the, the southern part of the globe. In Africa, you've got the urbanization of the African workforce that will not, for all the reasons that uh, Ruth mentioned, will not follow the classic stages of agriculture to manufacture to services. It'd be a direct entry into those economies under the architecture of these platform technologies. That's a different whole qualitative ballgame. Um, the, the third, um, um, beyond the African situation, is just this question of who the vulnerable are. Because as we recover out of, out of uh, post-COVID, right, uh, of the rich countries, 94%, that's the estimate today, 94% excuse me, they will almost all be at 94% of their pre-COVID employment or GDP levels within two years. But, uh, but the, uh, in the poor countries, it will be something like 30%. So that gap just keeps, has a number of economic technological drivers, but it just keeps growing and we can't ignore that. So that's the ethical perspective. It informs some of our commentary uh, when we're looking at these things from the Vatican. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments, uh, Dr. Warian. Um, uh, Dr. Korak, you know, I'd love to turn it over to you so you can share some of your thoughts uh, out of our discussion. Thanks, Joseph. Uh, yesterday, when Savas introduced the uh, conference, he encouraged us to be participants in a conversation. And I want to uh, offer you some reflections on how to frame the public policy conversation. Conversations aren't going to be um, completely open-ended and the politics dictates that uh, groups that frame that conversation are going to drive the agenda. And so for people like Claire and others, how should we think about framing that conversation? And I'm gonna pick up and some semi-structured thoughts on some things that Peter just said, uh, and also articulate in a, perhaps a different way some of the points that Claire has made in light of what we learned yesterday. So um, I'm going to make three points, and I'm going to need about three or four minutes uh, each, if you'll give me uh, the time for that. So let's ground this in uh, Catholic uh, social teaching. And I'm going to pull three lessons uh, out of this. Uh, the first is that all humans are created equally and they have the right to be treated with dignity. What does inequality do? Inequality, particularly top end inequality, fosters entitlement amongst the few. It creates shame among the least advantaged and it engenders insecurity amongst the aspiring, all right? And so in that sense, it cuts very much against the dignity of many uh, people. 
How do you frame this conversation to move beyond that and to respect everyone's dignity? I think a important part of that conversation, Claire hinted at, and uh, she made it very clear. Public policy conversation has to push back against entitlement and meritocracy. And it has to emphasize the fact that some people are unlucky and some people are very lucky. Robert Nozick begins his famous uh, book with a discussion of a basketball player, Wilt Chamberlain, as he call, was called at that time. And he said, that basketball player is enormous um, income is worth it because a lot of people want to see him uh, play the game. He was very, very tall. Where did he get that height? It's a mixture of a bunch of alleles in his GNA, DNA that have expressed themselves in different ways and produced a very tall man. What we're responsible for is the payoff structure of that man's productivity. Right? For example, there's another black person who's famous. Her name is Henrietta Lacks. And she died a poor black woman uh, out of, from cancer. But her cancer cells had this amazing ability. They were human cells that you could grow in a Petri dish. And every lab across the world makes use of Henry La uh, Henrietta Lacks' cells. Tremendous gains in knowledge to the benefit of all. And she got paid zero dollars. She was unlucky and, and the payoff structure in society was such that she got paid nothing for that. All right. So how does entitlement arise? It arises because the human brain is not a great statistical machine. We use information that is available to us. So our reference points are the people around us and we see just our neighbors. If you take polls and ask people in the rich countries to predict what the income distribution is, they inevitably get it wrong. They think it's much more equal than it is because they only see the people around them when they're making that calculation. And rich people too do that. And this is why you get sort of New York Times stories and Christian Freeland in her book, Plutocrats, thinking about the top 1% as being hard done by. After all, once I put the kids through private school, once I uh, pay for their horse um, uh, equestrian uh, lessons and pay the taxes on my six bedroom home and put us enough aside for good vacations, I hardly have any money left. And we always look for, to the people just above us. All right? And the other thing the human brain does, it has something called loss aversion to it where we care much more about a dollar lost than a dollar gained. And so it's natural that the rich are going to put ramparts up and prevent themselves from falling down the income distribution. And they use all of that isolation amongst themselves because after all, they are hardworking and some of them do have talents to tell themselves like many University of Waterloo, Waterloo graduates like me who worked hard for his PhD, that I in some sense deserve it. But as Claire mentioned, it's really just luck of the draw. So the first framing of public policy is that dessert is very, just dessert is very, uh, a very questionable thing and luck has a lot to do with, do with it. Read Michael Sundell's recent book and you get a very articulate expression of that. My second point has to do, again, uh, putting this into uh, Catholic social treaty, uh, 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 teaching, is um, with the um, tax system and tax policies that uh, uh, Claire talked about. Catholic social teaching tells us that labor has preference over capital, and what is due through justice cannot be offered with charity. So if labor has preference over capital, why is Claire reasonably asked, why is capital income favored in the tax system? So let me talk a little bit about that and articulate some of the options that she put forward in, from an economics perspective. But first, let me open a sidebar 
to give you a template about how to think of tax policy or, or, or public policy and inequality. One of the things we heard yesterday was that there are many different types of inequality and they may have different policy implications. So, so think of a little table with three columns and three rows. Down the rows, what type of inequality do you care about? Bottom, middle, or top? Across the columns, where should public policy intervene? Before the production process, during the production process, or after the production process? So if we go into that top left-hand cell, if you're worried about bottom end inequality before the production process, it takes you to policies about healthcare, about education, maybe a universal basic income. Go to the bottom cell of our little table, after production and you care about top income. Where does that take you? It takes you to wealth taxation or capital taxation. So let me pick up on Claire's um, uh, very articulate presentation and give you the economics perspective on, uh, just to save time, on the inclusion rate in capital income. Why should we give preference to capital over a professor's salary? Something I'm interested in too. Um, well, uh, one is if there's high inflation, a lot of those capital gains could just reflect the return to inflation. And so we should probably tax capital at some lower rate. Second reason has to do with sort of an income averaging. It may be that this is the per person's uh, only income. He or she realizes these gains and gets a big bump in income in one year that shoots them up into a higher tax bracket. And, but next year, they're gonna fall back down the income distribution, but they're gonna get taxed on that annual income rather than some sense of lifetime income. So I need to sort of smooth. And then the third reason that we tax capital income less has to do with to avoiding um, uh, a double taxation. There's a corporate tax rate, the corporation pays taxes, and uh, therefore, when, uh, uh, when it distributes uh, profits to, uh, through dividends or through um, uh, uh, shares, preferential treatment of shares, we don't want to tax that income twice. So that's the rationale. Now, not so long ago, and I really don't mean so long ago, uh, the inclusion rate was 75%. And it fell in the 1990s to 50%. Why did it do that? We moved to an era of low inflation. Odd. Tax averaging and tax brackets. Well, let's look at the data that Claire's put us. Much of those people are, many of those people are gonna be in the top bracket anyways all the time. So it doesn't really matter. And third, as she told us, why did we lower the inclusion uh, rate, um, uh, lower the inclusion rate when the corporate tax rate was falling, falling by a half. All of those arguments, low inflation <laughs> and a falling corporate tax rates argue for a higher inclusion rate. It's high time to do that, as she said, from strictly an economics rationale. You don't need a huge revolution here in terms of wealth taxation. If you do capital taxation correctly, it's equivalent to a wealth uh, a tax. And it's not a big ask of government. It's a budget item. It's a line. And we're just saying, go back to where you were in 1990. Uh, so I'm hard pressed. And then what you'd want to do, uh, which was mentioned, is put an inheritance tax on that. I would prefer an inheritance tax over uh, an estate tax. And you've got your wealth tax. Not a big deal. You should give labor preference, all right? And there is no uh, rationale for the kind of uh, inclusion rate that we're using now. The third framing, so the second framing is fair taxation. 
The third framing also relies on Catholic social teaching. Um, Catholic social teachings tells us that wealth is created to be shared. Those aren't my words. Uh, those are the Pope's words. And so where does that take us into the conversation? It takes us into these buzzwords, the growth agenda, building back better, inclusive growth, the new green economy, trickle down. So I think the third framing of public policy that advocates have to really get a handle on is the growth agenda and particularly nail into its coffin the idea of trickle down. Take inclusive growth seriously. What is inclusive growth? It's a conversation that promotes growth while at the same time incorporating a discussion about income distribution. If we're going to go through this huge green shift, if it's going to require a reef reconfiguration of a large, large, large part of our corporate structure. Let's not replay the same film we did when Canadians were asked to accept free trade and saw huge parts of Ontario, including areas around Kitchener and Waterloo. And in fact, I grew up in Kitchener and Waterloo uh, before the big tech boom, when the University of Waterloo was holding its correspondence courses with cassette tapes. Downtown Waterloo, was full of old style factories. Downtown Kitchener was, Waterloo was the insurance place. And my family grew up in that working class across the street from the Smiles and Chuckles uh, Chocolate Factory on Weber Street, which is now gone. All right, and that opening up to that growth agenda caused a great deal of havoc. And at the same, in many people's lives, at the same time, through fighting deficit for hell and for, for, for the cause of hell and high water, as uh, Prime uh, um, Minister Martin said at the time, undercut a lot of the social safety nets that we thought of as insurance for people. All of it done in the name of trickle down. So we have to take inclusive growth seriously as growth that also implies income distribution for the least advantage emphasize luck and earnings, ask for fair taxes, and, and call for inclusive growth. Frame the public discussion that way, and it's grounded in some of your fundamental values that I think, as Claire's um, illustration of that polling data suggested, a lot of Canadians share. Thank you so much. Such clear and specific recommendations. This is going to be some fantastic material for the, the rest of our conversation. And I took some furious notes. So I promise to be sending some more questions your way, Dr. Karak. So thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Kate. Uh, Kate Higgins from uh, uh, Oxfam. Would you be able to share your comments to tee us up for the conversation? Sure, Joseph. Hi, everyone. And uh, it's really fantastic to be with you all this afternoon. Um, and, and a huge thanks for the invitation to participate. Um, income inequality and the concentration of wealth in Canada and around the world is an issue that is very close to our heart at Oxfam. Um, in 2013, motivated by um, a desire uh, and a drive to shine the light on deep and widening income inequality, uh, we decided at Oxfam to start publishing flagship inequality reports as the global elite descended on Davos for the World Economic Forum. And ever since this moment in 2013, we have really been uh, trying to, to raise our voice, um, to drive political change on, on, on the issue of income inequality. And I have to say, um, while there's still a huge amount of work to do, I think we are very heartened at Oxfam to see that an issue that we have really rallied around and frankly devoted immense organizational energy and, and resources to go from being relatively marginal in the public discourse to really being quite mainstream. 
And so my reflection on this is as we talk about uh, income inequality in Canada and around the world, and we think about what we can do at this critical moment, is I do think that there are a number of actors that need to work together to drive the change. And so we, we need amazing experts and academics like Professor Korak, who is, who is a brilliant thinker on, on income inequality in Canada and globally. We need philanthropists like Claire. We need organizations like the Canadian International Council. And in my opinion, we need organizations like Oxfam who mobilize Canadians, who mobilize the public, who try to make a noise on this issue. So I want to focus some of my comments um, on a little bit more in the context of COVID because I think this pandemic um, shines a light a little bit on, on the issues that we're talking about here in, in Canada and around the world. Um, and I think it's been well documented that income inequality has become more acute, more exacerbated in the context of COVID. Um, we are seeing global inequality play out in the vaccine apartheid that we're witnessing globally. Um, we're seeing uh, inequalities that exist in our communities, in our countries and around the world become exacerbated. And frankly, there is no doubt that it's women, it's marginalized communities, it's racialized communities that are bearing the brunt in Canada and around the world of this pandemic. They're more likely to be pushed into poverty, they're more likely to go hungry, they're more likely to be excluded from healthcare and a vaccine. So our economic system is building, is enabling the super rich to get richer uh, on the backs of billions of poor people around the world. And, um, and, and, and it's great that we're all here thinking about what we can do about it. So I want to do two things in the small amount of time I have. Um, the first is to share four observations, um, what I might call killer facts about what is happening on inequality. And then the second is to uh, provide four recommendations on area, areas of action that I, that I think we should be taking in Canada. Uh, these killer facts are facts that we use to mobilize our supporters, to mobilize the Canadian public, to try to push for political change. And so the first is that globally, the super rich have gotten richer during this pandemic. Our research shows that at least nine people have become new billionaires since the beginning of the pandemic, thanks to the excessive profits of pharmaceutical corporations with monopolies on the COVID-19 vaccine. In addition, eight existing billionaires who have extensive portfolios in the pharmaceutical world have seen their combined wealth increase by $32.2 billion. The second point I wanna make, or the second killer fact, is the rich have also gotten rich in, richer in Canada. And, and I appreciate Claire's commentary on this not just being an issue, the south of, south of the border. This is an issue here in Canada too. And in 2020, we saw Canada's 44 billionaires increase their fortunes by almost 63.5 billion Canadian dollars. We estimated that that was enough to give every one of the 3.8 million poorest Canadians a check for around $17,000 each. My third killer fact, vaccine inequality or vaccine apartheid is acute. In May of this year, G7 nations were vaccinating at a rate of 4.6 million people a day. If this rate continues, we estimated that people living in G7 countries should be fully vaccinated by January the 8th, 2022. At the current rate, which is vaccinating 63,000 people a day, it would take low-income countries 57 years to reach the same level of protection. And my final killer fact is that this pandemic is really exacerbating gender and racialized inequalities in our country and in our world. Women have faced increased risk of contracting COVID-19. Women make up roughly 70% of the global health and social care workforce. And women globally have borne the burden of care, looking after our children, looking after our elderly and looking after our sick. So there's a lot of big numbers there, 
There's a lot of millions and billionaires and millions of dollars and billions of dollars. But I tried to share them relatively slowly to really let, uh, let, let us, to, to, to really let these, this, 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 this huge inequality really sink in. So what do we do about it? And as an activist, as someone who works in the civil society space, um, we don't really have the pleasure of just analyzing. We are really asked, if this is your, anal if this is your analysis, what do you want us to do? So let me, let me provide four recommendations. There are many more, but let me, let me stay focused on four. And this is what we're focusing on at Oxfam Canada. The first relates to intellectual property and the vaccine. Um, I think looking at the crowd here, we're all reading the news. We are all seeing what's happened. Uh, we're all seeing what's happening with, with the vaccine rollout. We are advocating for a TRIPS waiver the trade related intellectual property rights or the TRIPS agreement needs to be waived. We're calling on Canada to join the United States, to join President Biden and several other countries in waiving this. A waiver on patents and intellectual property related to vaccines can help rapidly scale vaccine manufacturing and production, particularly for Global South countries who are ready to produce these vaccines. Actually, just today, the WTO members have agreed that they will engage in a text-based process on waiving intellectual property rules on COVID-19, vaccines, tests, and treatments. This means a deal which would see a temporary suspension of intellectual property or TRIPS um, is increasingly likely, which is really excellent to see. But as I said, of the, of the G7 nations, it is only the US that is explicitly supporting waiving patents on vaccines. Japan has said that they will not oppose. Germany and the UK are vehemently opposed. Canada, Italy, and France remain on the fence. Really interestingly, polling that we at Oxfam uh, commissioned here in Canada in March found that 76% of Canadians are in favor of, of waiving trips. And when we did this polling with Oxfam, Oxfam colleagues across the G7, it was 70%. So I do think that there is perhaps more political, more public interest and more public recognition of the importance of this than maybe the government thinks. The second area of action I want to focus on is a fair attack system. I think Claire and also Miles have, have more articulately than I can um, made the case for us uh, really taking a good hard look and making some good hard changes to our taxation system. Um, as Claire mentioned, uh, the 15% rate, which was agreed um, or, and discussed at the G7 just last week, is not enough. Um, President Biden and the US have said 21%. Uh, we agree with Professor Stiglitz on a 25% corporate tax rate. This is, this is, however, good news. And as Claire mentioned, this will go to the G20 and the OECD. So we will continue to push for a higher rate than 15%. We also agree that a wealth tax here in Canada needs, we need action on this. Um, both Miles and Claire have talked about this. I think the, the work of Canadians for tax fairness, who, who are allies of ours, is really important. And Claire shared um, their analysis based on pub, parliamentary budget office figures, um, which says that, you know, we could get to $20 billion annually here in Canada with a wealth tax. My third point um, is one that I haven't heard much discussion about this afternoon, but I do really want to emphasize, which is I think this COVID-19 pandemic has really underlined the centrality of care and the care economy to our societies and our economies. And historically, the care economy and the care sector has frankly not received the recognition, the funding, or the discussion in mainstream policy, policy spaces that it really needs. Um, we were absolutely thrilled at Oxfam when Minister Freeland answered the long standing and long time call of childcare advocates uh, and announced the historic $30 billion investment to build a national learning and childcare system in the 2021 federal budget. We now need to see this happen. At Oxfam Canada, we are also doing a lot of advocacy with uh, colleagues at Global Affairs Canada to try to push the Canadian government to take a leadership role on the care economy as part of its feminist international assistance policy. 
Um, it really is an area that is ignored in the international assistance, assistance landscape globally. And we would really like to see Canada playing a leadership role in, in doing some really important work and making some important investments in the care economy through our international assistance. And my final point is, is we really need to walk the talk in Canada on global solidarity. This is immediate action on the pandemic, but also to tackle climate change. Um, we do acknowledge the government's commitment to mobilizing international assistance through the access to COVID tools or the ACT Accelerator. You may have read about and heard about COVAX, which is the initiative to buy doses, uh, vaccine doses for low and middle income countries. We appreciate and applaud the Canadian government's leadership here, but we do need to do more. Um, at a time when global inequality is growing, when global solidarity is more important, not only morally, but for our societies and our economies and our communities to be safe, and to thrive, we really do think the Canadian government should be stepping up their aid commitments, um, which remain stark, frankly, relatively low. Uh, we are below the average with our OECD peers when we look at international assistance or aid spending. We're a long way from the 0.7% of GDP uh, benchmark that is widely accepted globally. Um, so, so we do hope that we can see some changes here. I think I'll leave it at that. There are two things that are relatively practical that I thought I might share that might be useful. Um, we do have a podcast at Oxfam, which is called Equals. And I would recommend if you're interested in podcasts like I am, that you check it out. Uh, because just last week or the week before, we had some really great discussions um, with, uh, with leaders in the patriotic millionaires movement um, that you may be interested in hearing about. The second thing is we are running a petition to really try to um, push on vaccine equity globally. And so I can put that in the chat. And if you feel motivated to sign that petition and reach out to, to, to political leaders, I'd encourage you to do so. So thank you so much. Um, it's been a really great afternoon and, uh, and I'll pass it back to the moderator. Thanks, Joseph. Thank you so much, Kate. Uh, your killer facts, your uh, recommendations, uh, are some great food for thought. Uh, looking forward to coming back to some of these in our discussion. Uh, Dr. Mendelssohn, uh, if you could share some of your thoughts and uh, you know add some additional details for our conversation. Uh, looking forward to uh, hearing hearing your thoughts here. Uh, thank you, Joseph. I'll I'll try and do the best I can. Um, uh, before I get into the substance of uh, my my remarks uh, and my comments on previous panelists, I, I want to do three things. First, I want to let you know that I'm in Toronto or Tuckeronto, which has been home to Indigenous peoples for over 15,000 years, uh, the Huron-Wendat, Patoon First Nations, and Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the New Credit River. The territory where I find myself is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share and protect this land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples and settlers from all over the globe have been welcomed into this treaty in the spirit of peace and friendship and respect. Uh, and colonialism uh, is obviously uh, important to our discussion of uh, inequality uh, yesterday and today. Uh, second kind of comment that I want to make before I get into uh, the substance of this is I wanted to apologize. Uh, I missed uh, the day yesterday in most of the sessions today. Um, I, uh, I am dealing with two young children at home who have been online for a very long time, uh, who are not necessarily doing exceptionally well. Uh, and uh, I would say I personally am not at my emotional or spiritual or intellectual best these days. Uh, and so I haven't been able to participate fully. I would have liked to. I feel, um, uh, I always feel a bit awkward if I'm speaking at an event or a conference and I haven't heard the previous conversations because obviously I'm situating myself within an ongoing conversation and context and I've uh, I've missed that. So I apologize for that and I apologize if I repeat uh, or take uh, certain things for granted that may not have already, uh, already been discussed. Um, the third thing I wanted to mention uh, is that I left government about a year ago uh, and uh, it is, awkward uh, for uh, 
recently departed deputy ministers to speak about ongoing public policy issues for all kinds of reasons that uh, hopefully one day we can all talk about in real life. Um, but I'm very grateful to the CIC uh, and to John for having invited me uh, to do this. Uh, this is you know, probably about my first real engagement uh, on public policy issues since I left. Uh, I'm uh, overwhelmed with the talent and insight of my fellow panelists and uh, of our speaker. And I align myself very much with just about all of their remarks and have great respect um, for, uh, for their work. Um, and uh, I think that this uh, conversation obviously is, uh, is so important. And I will try and bring uh, my understanding expertise of how government works, how public policy works uh, to, uh, to this discussion. Uh, I wanna um, make five points, five policy points. Um, before I do though, I just want to highlight uh, what I consider to be our current context in our current moment. Uh, again, I'm sure everyone has already talked about this, uh, but we are at uh, a consequential moment in human history. Uh, our model of capitalism is very different than the one that we designed policies for 50 years ago or 100 years ago. The wealth inequality that we've talked about, the rise of the intangible economy, uh, rise of protectionism and uh, global uh, geopolitical and economic competition, uh, the platform economy, uh, which has changed dramatically the way wealth is created and passed on. Um, all of these things uh, highlight that our policies uh, that we have accepted as uh, natural and inevitable to create economic growth uh, are not really fit for purpose, uh, but they have a very long tail. Uh, the I'm sure you've talked about this, but what we understand as the Washington Consensus and the end of the Washington Consensus, um, we are, uh, they, they have very long tails and we're dealing with their consequences, but the policy tools that we have used for the last 50 years and that are embedded deeply in finance departments in mainstream economic think tanks and our op-ed pages that economic growth and inclusion and wealth and opportunity are created through low taxes, free markets, deregulation and balanced budgets. Um, we increasingly know that those are not going to deliver inclusive growth um, without intentional action, without um, really um, uh, changing some of the policy tools and levers that we use. Uh, I personally am very pleased that the current federal government understands this, um, has announced clear direction to move towards more inclusive economic policies, um, uh, but they will need everyone's help because there are lots of powerful forces that wish to resist uh, the movement towards uh, inclusion and greater equity. So uh, with that, um, uh, you know, it's really important that all of us continue to give governments license to act on uh, this agenda, that we give governments license to be intentional, to lean in. Uh, addressing inequality is yes, values-based, yes, rights-based, yes, dignity-based, but it's also empirical. We know that um, more equal societies perform better on just about any measure. So ethically and empirically uh, addressing inequality is the right thing to do. Um, but there are lots of mindsets which continue uh, to resist this. So um, my five points quite quickly are, and I won't belabor the first one, are taxes. I do think wealth taxes and tax realized capital gains, uh, but also, and I'm sure you've talked about this, the statement from the G7, um, uh, last week, um, and now ideally moving to the G20, which follow up on the base erosion process, the BEPS process, um, which are designed to find minimum corporate taxes, but from my perspective, more importantly, find ways of getting at uh, revenues uh, generated by the platform economy in particular uh, countries, but taxing them at a local or national level. We're not there yet, 
there are many steps before we get to a real digital tax, but I think we have to acknowledge progress um, and, uh, and continue to support it. But taxes have to be core part of the agenda. Second, uh, means-based income transfers uh, remain an important tool. The current federal government has made enormous progress on this. The Canada Workers' Benefit, which uh, values uh, work and helps the working poor. The Canada Child Benefit, which provides uh, a basic income uh, for uh, families with children. The changes to the Canada Student Grant, which move uh, our spending away from passive uh, universal tax benefits towards targeted benefits for people who need them are all uh, really important. I think we should also be doing a consolidation of our uh, tax benefits and programs for seniors as well, um, but that's, uh, that's an additional issue. Um, third, it is so important that we invest in services and public services, childcare, community infrastructure, housing, access to childcare, access to community services, parks, recreation, all of these push back against inequality. We've talked a lot about tax and money, but access to dignified and decent public services uh, is also an important uh, pillar uh, of this. I think we uh, here in this country would recognize that one of the things that has fought so hard in favor of equality uh, is continuing and ongoing investments in public school uh, uh, that are of good quality and accessible uh, higher education institutions um, that are across the board of good quality and don't create uh, uh, generational and hereditary elites, um, but are widely accessible. All of these um, are uh, important pieces that push back against inequality. And increasingly, we understand they are all economic. Um, you know, I've spent 20 years in government meetings of various kinds, and I, it would, uh, I won't name names, but so many of senior economic decision makers would mock the idea that a community center is an important piece of economic infrastructure. But increasingly, I think we understand that community centers are economic infrastructure, that child care, finally, people understand that it is economic infrastructure. Bike lanes are economic infrastructure. Um, and so we have to continue to, to invest in public services. Fourth, uh, point uh, is uh, the current moment, as we see with the Biden administration, is one where we in Canada have to take the question of inclusive industrial policy in its broadest sense seriously. There is a deep uh, um, prejudice against in Canada against uh, government intervention to uh, support sectors um, and support business activities, but the rest of the world uh, is way ahead of us. And I use the term inclusive industrial policy in its broadest sense to support startup and scale up, to have a robust IP policy, to use federal, sorry, government procurement policies um, to help Canadian businesses get first and second clients, to build clusters of activity like we see in KW, to provide uh, government support for business to invest in digitization and ICT and export support and new machinery and equipment. Um, at, at its broadest level, um, uh, we need industrial policies that are focused on inclusion and equity, that are focused on healthy communities and community well-being and generating wealth within communities that stays in those communities, and obviously broad sustainability. The, the, an investment in childcare or in uh, renewable energy is not the same as an investment uh, in uh, something else. Um, these things deliver uh, greater benefits. And uh, Robert Aslan was unfortunately not able to be with us today, but I would add that mission-oriented challenges and mission-oriented uh, innovation and mission-oriented industrial policy uh, should also be part of the mix. And fifth, uh, we, we need to take the issue of stakeholder and inclusive capitalism seriously. Um, Capitalism is something that is constantly mutating and that we uh, structure uh, governments uh, shape markets, government shape uh, how individuals and businesses and workers participate in markets, uh, and we can uh, embrace um, different 
visions of uh, capitalism uh, with different kinds of policies. And the things that I'm particularly interested in are community finance institutions that uh, get access to capital for traditionally marginalized groups who haven't had it, whether those are rural communities or black or indigenous communities, looking at how our policies uh, can encourage more co-ops and employee share ownership models. Um, and that too is uh, a, a growing uh, movement, uh, employment standards, in, income protection for gig workers, social protection for vulnerable workers. All of these uh, are part of, in my mind, uh, a, a, the government's role uh, in, in defining the terms of market competition, uh, and all of them are ways of, uh, of pushing back to some extent uh, on, uh, on growing inequality, because if we don't push back, um, uh, things are going to be worse. That's it. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Mendelssohn. Um, so for everyone who shared some remarks, thank you again. We have so many recommendations and points here. I have more notes than we can possibly address in the time that we have and some wonderful questions from the audience. Um, there's a couple that I want to cherry pick. So I have some questions for the group here. Uh, I will direct them to specific individuals, but also open the floor for anyone to chime in. So please don't don't stand on ceremony. Please feel free to chime in. Um, this first question might perhaps best be directed to Dr. Warian, uh, perhaps Dr. Mendelssohn as well. Uh, you both shared some comments about the uh, nature of employment and reducing inequality in those employment relationships. Um, and there was one specific comment that that employment contract has evolved from being purely a, you know, an exchange of labor for money and has become a moral exchange as well. We're asking employees to make a commitment. Uh, I, I'd ask, if we're looking to make changes, if we're asking companies to make changes, what commitments should they be making to employees to honor that new arrangement and to reduce inequality? I mean, clearly the, the question of, of uh, uh, reasonable uh, commitments of uh, employment security. I mean, a smart wag uh, once uh, recently told me that, you know, we're now an economy of the, the temporarily permanent and the permanently temporary. Uh, the gig economy thing, it just is not viable for a whole bunch of reasons. So the question of continuity uh, of employment is really in security of employment really is important. Now that has to be linked to skills, career paths and all, all those good things we talked about earlier. But um, I, I guess uh, uh, from my Vatican, for the Pope, la human labor is inherently valuable as a source of human dignity growing uh, personal capacities, building the common good. So in fact, uh, Francis objects to just thinking a UBI just washes everything away. He says a, a society built around people who work and people who don't work is inherently unstable and probably ultimately a dangerous place to live. So when you support a UBI, it's work is inherently valuable uh, in the Catholic perspective. And, and Dr. Mendelssohn, uh, any additional comments to share around the, the contract that employers should offer? Uh, no, I don't, I, I don't think so. And others may be uh, better placed. I, I would just note that uh, the nature of the employment contract has uh, changed dramatically over the last 20 years. And many of our social policies have not kept up with that. So our employment insurance system, uh, um, our health insurance system, so many of our social protections and social benefits are now not based on our citizenship or our individuality or the fact that we work and contribute uh, to the economy, but they are based on uh, the specific employment relationship that we have with our employer. And we see this a lot um, with, uh, you know, for example, contracting out um, and employment services where individuals who feel, who, or let me rephrase that, individuals who legitimately have uh, workplace complaints, um, their workplace complaint uh, cannot be upheld because their actual employer is a contractor, not the place where they're actually working. So all of these relationships have changed so dramatically and governments are struggling to keep up and governments are, sorry, again, I'll rephrase that. Some governments are struggling to keep up. Some governments 
have clearly demonstrated that they don't particularly care. Um, so uh, I just think that uh, we have to continue to be intentional about um, uh, uh, focusing on things like our employment standards legislation uh, in the United States and other countries. You're seeing lots of court decisions about is someone entitled to join a union? Is how, who is technically someone's employer? Is Uber an employer or is Uber not an employer? All of these issues, um, which I'm sure you've talked about over the last two days, uh, are, are changing dramatically based on how capitalism is changing and how the nature of work is changing. And many of our policies have not kept up. If I could just jump in, Joseph. Please do. I wanted to emphasize uh, Matthew's point about um, the sort of um, lag between economic developments and uh, some of our policies, and particularly employment insurance. So. We've been focusing on an inequality agenda, but there's also an insecurity agenda that's part of it. And with insecurity, uh, the policy solution is um, insurance. Our employment insurance system is in need of significant reform to meet these uh, new realities. Part of that, I think, has to be uh, giving individuals and workers more uh, agency. Um, things are very dynamic. We can't expect government necessarily to have all the information to move quickly enough, but we could design programs in which people have agency over their uh, um, uh, uh, benefits in a way that'll give them to flexibility, flexibility to adjust when they face contingencies that we couldn't possibly foresee. So employment insurance reform has to be some part of the uh, uh, policy agenda going forward. Thank you. Um, the, the focus on employment, uh, the nature of employment, I think is a great lens. And I know we've we focused a lot on tax and that kind of prefaces the, or, or it establishes the idea of inequality being inherently economic, but there are so many lenses through which we can look at inequality. And yeah, several of you alluded to some of them, um, but I'd like to touch a little bit on on racial inequality. Uh, you know, we, we'd like to explore some of the, the topics that uh, governments, you know, technology, society can make, and we've had so many recent examples. Um, I'd like to open it up to the group uh, and, you know, happy to let anyone chime in first, but the policy recommendations, the changes that you thought, is there any that you would specifically point to? that you think would do a more effective job at tackling some of the racial equality issues that uh, address our society right now. And to our uh, media team, thank you for helping with the uh, pinned videos. Uh, I know it's a moving target. Uh, Kate, I did see your hand raised, so if you could chime in first. Yeah, thanks. Um... Uh, first, just let me say uh, to Matthew, thank you for the land acknowledgement um, at the beginning of your, your remarks. I appreciate that very much. Um, maybe just to focus on one particular area, um, uh, Matthew also noted a bit of a kind of shift and a change in how we define or think about economic infrastructure. And I would say that, that the care economy, and just to bring back and emphasize my points on the care economy, um, is a huge economic opportunity for us uh, as a country in terms of infrastructure development, but then also in terms of, of jobs and employment. Um, and so, but what we know is that in the care economy, those jobs are typically unsecure. Uh, they're typically or often done by a much higher pro proportion of racialized people, um, new immigrants, uh, so I do think um, this investment by the federal government or this commitment to really thinking through um, early learning and childcare. Um, I think we will, we all hope, or many of us hope that we will finally get our act together as a country around long-term care and what that means and what our commitment is to that. And, and I, I think thinking through not only um, the, the, the people that will benefit from that care, but the workers that will do that care and ensuring that those jobs are well paid that they are secure, uh, that they're well trained, um, is an area investment or change that could have a positive impact in terms of racial equity in this country. 
because of the nature um, of, of, of the pool of people that typically do that work. Um, so I, I would say that that is, is a really important point um, to make and, 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 and we will be watching closely to, to, to see um, how this childcare investment, but also how broader investments across the care sector as a critical piece of social and economic infrastructure for our country, um, what changes that, that brings. Can I raise yeah, another specific example? Uh, particular for Canada, extractive industries. It is contra uh, you know, counterfactual for most people, but the digital economy will re require more mining, not less, particularly around copper, nickel, cobalt, lithium. And for reasons of grade, that will reawaken underground mining in Canada, kind of mining Canada's been good at. But the boundaries of the firm are going to shift and when the boundaries of the term, term shift, that's a big deal in economics. They're now going to align with the watersheds of native, native communities. And ironically, those counterfactual, those uh, uh, mining companies uh, that have community benefit agreements with their, their host communities actually perform better on the enterprise value of, uh, of the mining corporation over time. So I think for Canada, dead on your issue, uh, a particular question about uh, the relationship between extractive industries, their corporations and, uh, and indigenous communities is a, a prime, should be a prime focal point. I'll, um, I'll, I'll thank, thank you. I, uh, I, I appreciate both those comments. Uh, I, I would just add briefly that and this mirrors some of the comments that were made earlier. Um, when you take an intersectional lens on uh, equality issues, a lot of the inequalities are overlapping. And um, so uh, that has to be uh, borne in mind. And when I talked about you know, uh, improved uh, community services and public transit and access to recreation and parks, when uh, or, or housing, uh, when I spoke about access to capital, um, these all, if done well, um, can be significant for racialized communities, for indigenous communities. And the indigenous uh, investment corporations that manage uh, capital that um, was uh, negotiated through comprehensive land claims. Um, many of these indigenous investment corporations are hugely important actors uh, for driving uh, economic wealth and community wealth in indigenous communities. And as we know, participate very actively in uh, commercial enterprises and the market. So um, uh, I do think the Paul, at least from my perspective, the, the policy tools that uh, I was talking about employee ownership, um, employment standards, as Kate pointed out. Uh, if, if we're dealing with the gig economy and non-standardized employment and better uh, employer-employee relationships where the real employer can't avoid uh, their rights and obligations because they're using a uh, contracting service, um, those heavily impact uh, immigrant uh, immigrant Canadians, uh, racialized Canadians. So uh, I think there are no doubt some particular policies such as, you know, Indigenous investment corporations, but I think if we get a lot of those policy uh, tools right, um, uh, they're going to have a positive impact through that intersectional lens. The, the comment about targeting specific industries and areas of business and sectors that uh, have an undue influence on uh, disadvantaged communities, I think, is a very apt point. Um, what I find so valuable about this discussion is it helps tee up the conversations we're all going to have when we leave today's session and we move into others. Um, so I've got a, a question that came to mind as I listened to everyone's comments. Um, there was a lot of discussion about reducing inequality within Canada and some conversations, particularly around income levels and, and racial disparities but also some comments about reducing inequality globally. Uh, and there were some comments about uh, from vaccine distribution to economic recovery. Uh, for our audience, how should we best frame up that discussion? As a country, as a civil society, how much energy should we be investing in reducing inequality within Canada? 
versus putting energy into reducing inequality between Canadians and other countries? How do we tee that conversation up? And to set the stage, I'm happy to call on panel members who'd like to chime in, but I'm hoping somebody here has a, an opinion they'd love to share with the group first. Well, Claire, you teed us up, so I'm gonna put you in the hot seat. I'd love to hear as you think about your foundation's investments and about these conversations, how you tee up that you know, potentially conflicting perspectives. Um, yeah, it's a tough one. I'm also, my, my dog is barking in the background. So I actually missed part of your question. <laughs> so maybe I'll let somebody else speak to it and I'll, I'll, I'll reflect a bit more after I get my dog to be I quiet. I see Dr. Mendelssohn coming in to help you out. So I'll let him run with it. I, I, I don't, I, this isn't my area of expertise and others would have other things to say that were probably more insightful. Uh, but, uh, it, um, uh, it becomes more difficult uh, to um, deal with uh, issues of global inequality uh, when inequality is growing in Canada. That's, I think, my observation. And so, uh, you know, my focus has usually been domestic policy um, and, uh, um, and, and dealing with them, um, uh, uh, you know, probably, uh, reinforces to to some extent um uh but I'd, I'd be interested in hearing others be interested in hearing kate oh matthew i thought you'd give me the inside scoop on how we can be better more effective advocates um i i look i at the risk of kind of being a bit pushing back a bit and 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 maybe saying thanks but no thanks joseph i don't think that it's really a fair question um, we don't say, should we invest in public health or public education? We don't say, should we build, um, you know, a, a bridge or a highway? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of trying to make these comparisons on the fly, but I, I think ultimately um, we can do both. Canada is a country that has done both. Um, and, and so, you know, I think we need to, we, we can take a kind of values perspective to kind of what sort of society do we want to be as Canada and what sort of contribution do we want to make globally um, at Oxfam Oxfam is is known really as an international development or humanitarian organization but but what many may not know is that we do a lot of advocacy work here in Canada and we're quite embedded we've pushed very hard to support for example advocates in the background on childcare um, because we see the universality of these issues um, and, and, and we kind of advocate and believe in a world where, where poverty and inequality is, is, is not there in Canada and globally. So I do think it's, it's possible um, to do both. Um, for those of us who, who, who are also working on the international front, clearly in the context of this pandemic, it's challenging to push governments to make broader investments um, globally. But the security imperative is pretty clear and the economic imperative is also pretty clear. Do we want to function as a global economy or not? And if we do, we're gonna to have to fix and work out how we vaccinate people globally. Um, that's a big issue that has a zillion different policy questions and policy levers. But um, I, I, yeah, so I, I think, you know, there's a moral imperative. There's also an economic imperative and a security imperative. Um, in the globalized world we live in to do both. Um, and so I think saying we have to do one over the other is not particularly fair. Um, we do need to do both and, and, the, and, and we need to find the best way to do that. I think that's a, a great, great answer to that. And Claire, we'd love to hear your, your take on it. Sure, yeah, I mean, I also don't see it as an either or. Um, and I think, you know, to the point, uh, speaking about vaccination, which is actually my area of expertise, um, you know, if you take a purely selfish perspective, we absolutely do need to vaccinate the world or we're in big trouble as new variants emerge, which may um, uh, resist uh, the, the immunity elicited by vaccination. So it's absolutely essential that we vaccinate the world as quickly as possible. Um, so I, I wholeheartedly support Oxfam's efforts in that, in that direction. Um, and I, I think for me, uh, you know, one of the points I think Miles made was about um, uh, luck. You know, I think that we are very lucky to be in Canada. Um, you know, I'm exceptionally lucky amongst those Canadians, but you know, if I had been born in another country in another situation, 
I wouldn't have a PhD. I wouldn't be doing the work that I'm doing. Um, and I think that all of us, you know, um, live our lives with a, a certain amount of built-in luck. And then we, we, we do have to do something with it, you know? Um, but um, I, I think that, you know, in that, with that sort of lens, you know, we need to be tackling inequality both at home and abroad. We do not live in an island. We live in a global economy. We live in a, um, you know, we, we have to recognize our place in, 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 um, in the world and also within the country where are there um, uh, inequities and actually align ourselves with the vision for a more fair and just system, um, as well as one that will, um, you know, allow the survival of our species in confronting climate change, which I think is a, a huge threat um, that we must address, um, and that also must, in my view, be one of the um, uh, the frameworks that we use to um, to to align with policy. Claire, thank you so much for for our whole panel. We are at the top of the hour, so we'll need to to wrap up, but. Peter, Matthew, Miles, Kate, Claire, thank you so much for your time, your insights. Uh, I've learned so much and, and had so many takeaways from uh, the way we leverage corporate tax rates and inclusion rates to more inclusive policies, the way we manage our workforces to our different sectors. This has been a true delight. Um, on behalf of the audience, thank you so much for sharing your, your wisdom and your time. Uh, and I'd love to wrap up this session uh, and hand it back to our facilitators so that we can continue closing things up. Thank you, everyone. Excellent. Um, well, thank you so much for uh, this wonderful opportunity to um, certainly um, learn a tremendous amount and, 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 and to really gain a remarkable insight into, um, as uh, you all mentioned and alluded to, uh, some of the most uh, pressing uh, contemporary issues. I'd like to thank our um, participants, uh, thank, your, thank our panelists, and of course, uh, thank our moderators, moderators as well, who uh, very skillfully guided the discussion. Uh, a great big thank you goes to the Savas Chamberlain Foundation as well, um, who um, um, ultimately which, uh, uh, allowed us to host um, this two day, uh, these two-day events. And of course, thank you, um, a great thank you goes to Pink's Media as well for their um, 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 hard work and, and tireless work to make sure that these events um, uh, are, 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 are ultimately organized uh, flawlessly. Um, uh, on behalf of the CIC and the Waterloo branch uh, in particular, I'd like to uh, thank you all. Uh, please note that the um, presentations uh, will be available on the YouTube channel, YouTube channel of the uh, national office of the CIC. Um, as you can see, uh, we are a part of uh, a network of 18 branches across um, across uh, um, the country and, and uh, we are offering uh, uh, you know, exceptional programming in, real, in regards to uh, Canadian foreign policy and foreign policy issues, global uh, uh, issues in particular. So please join us. Um, and once again, uh, thank you to all um, and wishing you all a wonderful evening.